second round of the presidential election today. How close? Our campaign coverage kicks off from 7 p.m. Paris time. We'll be crossing to campaign headquarters to our correspondents throughout France and around the world. First results from 8 p.m. Our election night coverage continues at 10 p.m. with the analysis, reporting, and reaction from both candidates and kingmakers. How will this election change France? What will be its impact on Europe and the wider world? Join us for our second and final round election coverage here on France 24 and France24.com. France 24 and RFI in partnership with France 2 and France Inter with Ipsos Soprasteria. The French are electing a president. Hi everyone, welcome to France Vengette's election night coverage. I'm François Pigard. And I'm Mark Perlman. Polls have just closed in villages and small towns. We'll take you across France in this final hour of voting. With correspondent Selena Sykes, who's at a polling station in Paris, Yenali in the French capital, Wassim Cornet in the suburb of Saint-Denis, Ellen Gainsford is in Marine Le Pen's stronghold of Enambement, Claire Pacalin is at Emmanuel Macron's headquarters, Florence Villemino is with Marine Le Pen, and last but not least, we have our roving reporters Delano de Souza and Alison Sargent in the thick of the crowd with the two finalists. Counting down with us to the top of the hour in our exclusive Ipsos estimate of the winner, France 24 business editor, Kate Moody. How are you? Hi, Francois. Welcome as well to Bruno Cotres of the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po's research wing, Sevipof. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. And we welcome uh, as well the host of the Popol Politics podcast. Uh, it is journalist and columnist Léa Chamboussel. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening. And to break down the numbers throughout this election night, Diptyka Lawrence is at the big board with estimates, results, exit polls, and analysis. Our coverage begins beneath the Eiffel Tower. Claire Pacalin covering the Macron campaign. Claire, uh, 59 minutes to go. Yeah, the stage is set here. Everything is in place. The cameras are in place. There are 1,300 members of the press have been accredited tonight. That's more than twice as many as there were two weeks ago for the first round of the elections. Emmanuel Macron's supporters have started to arrive here at the Champ de Mars, just next to the Eiffel Tower. The president himself, he will be hearing about the result at the Elysee Palace just across the river. And then he will come here to the Champ de Mars to address his supporters. We don't know exactly what time he'll be here. We know that that result, those first snapshot polls will come through in an hour's time. But Emmanuel Macron, we know that he likes to take his time writing his speeches, sometimes doing last minute changes. Back in 2017, we got the results at eight o'clock, but he didn't address the crowds until 10.30, two and a half hours later. But we know who will be coming here to the Champ de Mars tonight to speak to his supporters after we get that result. Claire Pacalin reporting live from the Eiffel Tower. And we can now cross to Florence Villemino, who is at the headquarters of uh, Marine Le Pen. Florence, this is the second time Marine Le Pen makes it to the second round. I'm assuming her supporters around you believe she can make it this time around. They believe she can make it, but it must be said uh, there's a lot of uh, high nerves here. People are very tense. Uh, Marine Le Pen is expected any minute now at this uh, campaign uh, party uh, uh, for, for the second round. Uh, and indeed, a little bit earlier, she cast her ballot in Inant Beaumont, which is her stronghold. But she decided to have her election party here in western Paris, in the Bois de Boulogne. Uh, so apparently when she comes, she's going to go behind closed doors, behind, outside, out of the camera's eye, and watch those results come in with a very close team. And then as those results come in at 8 o'clock, she'll come and give a speech right behind me. You can see it there. Uh, now, legally, we can't give you any of the exit polls, uh, but what we, everyone is looking at is the last election in 2017. Is that Front Républicain going to work again? Is that alliance between the left and the right to block 
the far right. Is it going to work? Last time, uh, Macron came in with a little over 66 percent of the vote. Marine Le Pen just under 34 percent of the vote. Abstention was high then. Perhaps it could be even higher this time. Her team says they're very serene about the results, but it's interesting because they've been asking us journalists as well if we have any uh, information to give them too. So a lot of nail biting here uh, going on at, at this uh, headquarters party. But uh, also uh, there's an open bar just like there was last time. People have started arriving, uh, are schmoozing, getting close to that podium to watch it come in. Now, Marine Le Pen has always positioned herself as a, a candidate for small towns, a rural, rural France. And so reportedly, if she wins the second round, there will be somewhat of a party here. Buses uh, that have been crisscrossing the country will bring her supporters across the capital, but then they'll go and celebrate in an undisclosed location outside of the capital. Florence Villeminot at the headquarters of uh, Marine Le Pen. All right, the final votes is, again, still being cast. Mark, we have our first number of the night. Yes, and it's an important number. It's the abstention uh, rate. It's an estimate from our partner, Ipsos Soprasteria. We're going to watch it. 28%. Uh, percent. It's the second highest on record, and it's much higher uh, than it was in 2017. Diptyque Laurent, how does 28% compare? Already in the first round of this presidential election, a very high abstention rate, about 26% or one in four voters. And as you just said there, Francois, 28% now uh, in the second round. So almost one in three voters who've decided to stay away from the polling stations this second round of the elections. The thing is, uh, French abstentionists have really been sending a strong signal to politicians for years because abstention rates have been on the rise, not just in local and European elections, but also presidential ones. Let's have a look. In 2002, the year that Jacques Chirac was re-elected president, he beat uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, the far-right leader, but abstention rates were at 20%. In 2007, the year that Nicolas Sarkozy was elected president, well, abstention rates dropped slightly to 16%, but since then, it's been on the rise. 2012, the year that Francois Hollande was elected president, uh, abstention rates were almost at 20%, and in the last round, of elections when Emmanuel Macron was elected president abstention rates were at 25 percent or about 12 million voters who decided they just didn't want to partake in that election uh, and now it, you just have a look at it on this uh, graph here you'll see uh, really a, a very uh, high progression uh, in this uh, abstention rate and it's something that uh, continues uh, to continue that has continued to uh, rise uh, up to 28 percent as we're seeing now Francois. Diptyque Laurent, many thanks. Bruno Cotres, I want to ask uh, you for your first reaction. It's the second highest uh, abstention estimate for now. On record, uh, if I'm correct, uh, the highest abstention rate for a second round was back in 1969, 31%. Uh, but clearly, uh, this is an important figure. It's, it's a very important figure. It's not only that it is going to be more abstention, but maybe we could also see much more blank votes and nil votes. And actually, if you accumulate all of that abstention plus blanc vote plus nil vote, it could represent quite a lot. Actually, the last time, five years ago, already we've got 12 million voters abstaining, 3 million voters actually blanc voting, and 1 million nil voting. So actually, it's quite a lot. On the five years ago, it was a third of the French electorate. So who knows if you recalculate. Uh, actually, the turnout just based on the express vote. Uh, so abstention, blank vote, and nil vote that you are taking away from express vote. So actually, it gives you 65 five years ago. So who knows? Maybe that it could be 60, 61, 62 this year of express voting, which actually is a bit problematic and which is actually underlying again the problem of turnout in France, the problem of the way that the French are looking to vote, vote it is still, it's still a civic duty for mu much of the, the French citizens. But particularly in the young generation, there is a lot of uh, actually detachment from the act of voting. Right. Uh, we can now actually cross to a polling station. Selena Sykes is in eastern uh, Paris. Uh, Selena, you just heard uh, the abstention uh, figure. Uh, you just spent a large part of your uh, Sunday in the 20th arrondissement. Uh, tell us if people did come to vote or decided to do something else. 
So, Mark, uh, right now we're seeing very few uh, last-minute voters here in the 20th arrondissement in uh, northeast Paris, but we have seen a steady stream of voters here from uh, this afternoon, a particular uh, surge in the afternoon uh, after uh, lunchtime. Uh, this polling station in the northeast, uh, in the in the northeast of the French capital, is a home to a very diverse community. Uh, it also uh, gave uh, most of its votes to uh, far-left candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon in the first round. Uh, this polling station also. Uh, had the highest turnout rates in uh, the area in the first round at uh, 77 percent, slightly above the national average. Uh, officials told us just before 7 p.m. that this uh, stood at 71 percent uh, just before uh, 7 p.m., so a drop here also as uh, things uh, stand. And obviously this is the big question in the second round, uh, the turnout rate and uh, how many people will not come to cast their ballots uh, today. And with uh, just an hour uh, to go, officials say that anybody who makes it here uh, by 8 p.m. will get uh, to cast their ballots. Selena Saik, thank you very much. Now, Jean Boncel, uh, at 8.01 p.m., does the abstention rate matter? I guess it does. It does for several reasons. And the first of all, I can tell it's a warning. It's a warning for our democracy. It means that uh, the way we express ourselves as citizens today doesn't really match with the expression of, uh, of a population of the people. Um, when you were talking, when you were talking about uh, young people, what I see, because I do work with a lot of young people, and I can't say that they're not interested in politics anymore. I cannot say they don't have a political behavior. They do have a political behavior, but it's way different from. Uh, from the, the, the generations before, and instead of just going to vote, which is for them a very insignificant way of acting, they will protest, they will, they will get involved into some organization, they will try to convince people to have a different behavior. I know lots of people that actually do not, do not go on flights anymore because they consider that it's really very bad for the environment and they have a very important political behavior. But the way our institution works today doesn't match their, their, their need, doesn't match their will. And I think this is a real warning for what do we want and how do we want people to be active citizens in our democracy today. So, but if they, you're talking about young people, if young people don't go out to vote because they don't identify with the candidates, does that mean they're putting Emmanuel Macron and the far right's Marine Le Pen on the same level? Well, I guess there is a, well, first of all, we need to see the results within every age category. And so far, it's a bit early, I guess, to pretend that it's young people that haven't been voting uh, today. We need to wait and see what, what are the real, the real um, results uh, and the trends. I think what you're right when you say that they do not identify, but far from not identifying and not being, not having the, um, the feeling of being represented, uh, in, in, in the Elysee, but also at the National Assembly, because it's a reality. We have this coming up election soon in June, and we need to have a very like close, uh, well, keep an eye on this too. It's going to be very interesting. I really believe that it's more in the exercise of voting, because a lot of people being expressed in themselves, like today, a lot of people, in fact, decided to cast a blank vote, and also a lot of people decided not to go to vote, and a lot of people have been voting Macron, you know, as a default vote. And it's not a choice, you know, it's not like they don't go very with a lot of enthusiasm. They're holding their nose as Yeah, they exactly. They, they've been voting and it's been like that, not just for young people, like for the lots of, a lot of uh, left-wing voters that have been voting against someone we're rather than for someone. We're watching live images from the uh, Eighth Arrondissement of Paris uh, where uh, there are citizens uh, in that last uh, 44 seven minutes casting their ballots, Mark. Right, Robert. and we're actually going to uh, go to a very uh, different uh, place. We just talked about the youth, about the left, and the swing constituency uh, for tonight is probably uh, this uh, young uh, public, maybe uh, vo who voted for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the far-left leader, garnered 22 percent of the votes nationally. He got 61 percent in the working-class suburb of Saint-Denis, and this is where our Wassim Cornet is uh, spending election night. Uh, Wassim, tell us where you are. 
Yeah, good evening, Mark. We are in Saint-Denis, the northern working-class suburb uh, just north of Paris. As you mentioned, we are spending the election night with uh, this organization called GetUp. It's an organization that tries to improve the image of these working-class suburbs, uh, not only among the general public, but also among the youth and the residents of those suburbs themselves. Um, they work with local officials to try to better respond to the needs of these residents of these working-class uh, neighborhoods around Paris. Uh, uh, here, I mean, it's no secret. Many people, me many members of the organization did vote for a left-wing candidate, many of them for Jean-Luc Mélenchon in the first round, and it's no secret, again, that uh, many of them are, you know, quite displeased about this final duel between Macron and Le Pen. But they haven't been just sitting there in a corner sulking, uh, you know, over the past couple of weeks. Um, they have organized a debate between the two rounds. They have also published several posts on social media to try to uh, explain to young voters the differences between Macron and Le Pen and the dangers that a far-right presidency would uh, would bring, would mean for, for, for France. And, uh, of course, um, you know, their main goal was to, to, to try to get out the vote, to try to make sure the turnout uh, goes up, because uh, you know, two weeks ago, on April 10th, after the first round, the turnout rate in uh, Seine-Saint-Denis here in this department was the lowest across all of mainland France. Wassim Cornet obviously will be watching this abstention rate in uh, Saint-Denis. Thank you very much. Uh, it's sort of a, what we're hearing there, a kind of a tale of two Paris areas in some places, uh, trying to get the vote out in other places. Uh, well, again, we were saying voting with their feet, Bruno Cotres. Yes, we need also to, 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 to be a bit more precise what we mean by young people. Actually, if you are looking to the voting behaviors, of the 18-24 is not exactly the same as over 25. Over 25 is going to be much more Marine Le Pen, actually. And you have different types of young people. The young poor workers, particularly, are supporting Marine Le Pen quite a lot. And this is from your what you saw with exit polls from the first yes, round? Yes, absolutely, yes. When another part of the youth is going to vote Jean-Luc Mélenchon, particularly in the big cities, in the metropole. And uh, so... There is not a unity of the young people, despite that they are looking to the world of politics exactly as it was said, which is that voting it is very important, but it's not going to solve the problems. They are interested a lot by politics, but not necessarily by the way of elections and voting in, ele in election, but it could be uh, demonstrating, boycotting, not having certain behaviors also, which is clearly a political act. And we see the political world, which has a lot of difficulties to incorporate that inside the system of political representation. Yeah, the, the far right Mark Perlman, which captured a lot uh, of the vote in the first round. Yes, absolutely. Uh, th those are record uh, figures. If you add the numbers from uh, Marine Le Pen, from Eric Zemmour, from Nicolas Dupont-Aignan, a third of the uh, voters uh, went uh, to the far uh, right. Uh, we can actually uh, go uh, to the headquarters of uh, Marine Le Pen. Alison Sargent is uh, with uh, some of her supporters, I believe. Alison? That's right, Mark. A very festive atmosphere here. A uh, champagne cork just popped behind me. They've started serving drinks. Uh, supporters are starting to come in. We're expecting uh, equal parts journalists and supporters tonight. About 500 supporters, 500 journalists. About half of the room is also taken up by cameras. So lots of supporters starting to celebrate with champagne glasses, uh, but also many journalists around uh, keeping track of them. Whatever happens tonight, whether or not Marine Le Pen wins, uh, this is expected to be a historic night uh, for her party. Uh, it's also a mixed crowd out here in terms of age. Uh, we spoke to some young voters, about 18 and 19, who were voting for the first time. I noticed a lot of the young voters are very well dressed, reminded me quite a bit of the crowd that I saw uh, at Eric Zemmour's headquarters uh, two weeks ago. Uh, but we've also been speaking to a lot of older members, uh, traditional members of Marine Le Pen's party uh, who voted for her, uh, who voted for her father. Uh, one of them, uh, we spoke to him, he came, he drove his motorcycle from the southern suburbs where he's from. Uh, he said that he felt like Marine Le Pen uh, did a very good campaign, sort of cast off her shell and really showed her true uh, gentle nature in his words. Uh, he also was wearing a pin uh, from the Republican Party of the United States. He told me he felt like he saw a lot of parallels between Marine Le Pen's party uh, and the Republican Party of Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan uh, in terms of patriotism, in terms of, his, his words, uh, looking out for the little guy. Uh, he told me that he is feeling quite anxious tonight, uh, as many supporters are, but they're also uh, very, very optimistic. Alison Sargent, thank you very much. 42 minutes to go before uh, the verdict is in. Uh, Léa Ch Chamboncel, uh, obviously uh, the far right is not an accident in, in France. When you watch the political trends, presidential, 
and also other elections, it's here to stay. Well, it, it's true for the presidential. It's not true for the other elections. Like when you come, when you see like uh, local elections, they don't really have a very good impl implementation. Implementation, sorry, um, but it's true enough because, well, basically, uh, the, the 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 national rally party today, which is uh, the ancestor, its ancestor is the national national party, national um, front. Front, front, sorry, front national party, um, has been doing a real grassroots campaign since the 70s, like when, when you have the historical of it. Uh, Le Pen's uh, father started, started in the 70s and then her, his daughter, sorry, took over in 2011. And since then, and since also the election of 2002, the, the, the far right movement got 30, 30 points more on the presidential election, which is huge. Well, when, if, if you accumulate everything. So, no, it's not an accident. It's actually, there again, I think, quite a warning, a warning to our political landscape. Also a warning to, I do believe, um, uh, left-wing parties as well that did not have this ability to, um, to be able to go on the, like, really, like, uh, sorry, on the ground to convince voters to be... Um, you know, like using um, enough uh, elements to, to make sure that they will be able to come up with like reforms in order to make their lives better. I mean, it's also a matter of uh, our political landscape and how more traditional parties didn't have the right answers to a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, Bruno Cotres, your, your reaction to it? If you look if you are just looking to the historical records of the Front National or the Rassemblement National to the presidential election, you could see that in 88, actually, Jean-Marie Le Pen is already at 14.5. Then in 95, it's 15. Then in 2002, he qualified for the second round. Then in 2012, Marine Le Pen is number three of the presidential election. Five years later, she qualified for the second round. And again, she qualified for the second round. You could see clearly that progressively the Front National and the Rassemblement National are actually like a stable, permanent element of French politics. It is not at all an accident. Bruno Cortes, thank you very much. All right, but Delano de Souza is uh, a, following the Macron campaign. Uh, 38 minutes and a little bit to go uh, before we know the winner of this campaign. Uh, you're in the oppo following the opposing camp. Uh, they're hoping it'll be a victory party where you are. Indeed, there has been a steady flow of uh, Macron supporters who have arrived uh, here just under the Eiffel Tower over the past 20 minutes or so. Security is very strict. They're not actually allowing us to talk to members of the public. Just to give you a sense of how many journalists are here, we're going to ask the cameraman to pan. We have uh, 1,300 journalists uh, who have gathered from all across the world, different languages. Uh, we. B the, from the people I have spoken to, there is a sense of optimism that Emmanuel Macron has got this in the bag. Some may even say a sense of overconfidence, uh, if you will. Now, if Emmanuel Macron does succeed and secures his second mandate, he will become the fourth president in the history of the French Republic to secure two terms in office. But of course, uh, we'll have the results in uh, within the hour at 8 p.m. Uh, local time. Back to you. All right, Delano de Souza, who uh, is uh, in the crowd there. Uh, at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, we're with Kate Moody from our business desk. Kate, um, you heard Léa Chambonsel talk, talk about, and, and, and Bruno Cotres talk about the rise uh, of the far right. Um, she ran a very good first round campaign, Marine Le Pen. Everybody knows what the Le Pen brand is about when it comes to identity politics. And so she instead focused on uh, what they call retail politics, talking about the cost of living and the such. Is that what's at stake again with this runoff? Look, the entire economy is at stake because there are such very different visions of what the French economy, Europe's second largest economy, should look like. Uh, we can go a little bit more into the details of those proposals only really later on once we know who the winner is going to be. Right, it's illegal, right, to talk about it. It is. We, it is because we've got people these are still rules. voting. People are still voting, so we can't go too much into that. 
less than an hour to go. We'll dive straight right. in, of course. Um, but look, whoever winds up in the Elysee is going to be t having to shepherd the French economy out of these dual crises, really, of the pandemic and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, we can take a look at the forecast from the Bank of France. It's currently projecting GDP growth this year. Somewhere between 2.8 and 3.4 percent GDP growth is what's being forecast by the Bank of France at the moment for this year. Uh, inflation is expected to be wind up being somewhere between 3 3.7 and 4.4 percent this year. Uh, the ideal, of course, being lower inflation and higher growth. Some factors like the outcome of the war are really beyond the president's control. Uh, whoever it is is also going to have to try to keep unemployment low. It's currently around 7.4 percent. That is the lowest in over a decade. You can see those Bank of France forecasts there with varying scenarios. Um, in terms of concrete proposals, we'll be looking for how he or she winds up tackling that cost of living crisis that you mentioned. Uh, with a mix of immediate relief measures that could be something like subsidies or tax breaks. Uh, the longer term challenge, of course, of making sure that workers are really earning enough to live comfortably. Uh, we're going to be hearing in the weeks to come about pension reform. Either way, whoever winds mm. up in the Elysee has said there will be a push for change in one direction or the other. And hanging over that, all of that is going to be this problem of French government debt currently standing at about because right now we're still coming out of we're still coming out of the pandemic and there's yeah. this m a mantra of whatever it takes whatever it costs I believe is the is the term used in, in French As, and again it's it's right now about uh, keeping an eye on this inflation we haven't seen the likes of in decades. Yeah, well, whatever it costs was that was the mantra during the pandemic, certainly, as the macro administration tried to protect uh, households and businesses. And like other governments around the world, billions of euros were spent trying to protect them, trying to keep people in their jobs, trying to make sure that they could stay in their homes through all of that. Um, but it did also wind up fueling the cost of living crisis, which has been the number one issue for French voters back two weeks ago in that first round and in polls very steadily ever since. Um, inflation is currently at 5.1 percent on the e EU scale. Uh, that is the highest in decades. It's less than we've seen in countries like Germany and Spain, uh, but as we know, still higher than it's been in years. Energy prices in particular, around 30 percent higher this March than they were a year earlier. Again, the candidates have very different approaches to this, which we will get to later in the program. But broadly, you can tackle this kind of crisis either by trying to control the price of things like food and energy uh, with a price cap or by dealing with the taxes on it, or by trying to boost an, uh, an individual's ability to buy all those things and pay their bills uh, with higher salaries and a lower tax burden. Because this is such a growing concern and source of stress for French businesses and households, it's certainly going to be something that we'll hear moves on in the very, very near term regarding regardless of who wins th this evening. France went for business editor. She's got her magnifying glass. She's waiting for 8.01 p.m. to look over it with a fine-tooth comb, Mark Perlman. Absolutely. <laughs> Until we get there, we have one figure uh, we can give you. It's from our partner Ipsos. It's uh, an update of the abstention uh, rate. It's now 28.2%. Uh, uh, it was 28 uh, just a few minutes ago. It's now higher. It's the second highest abstention on record for a second round, last time it was as high, was back in 1969. Uh, Léa Chamoncel, uh, Kate just mentioned uh, issues like the cost of living and purchasing power and the price of, of energy. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, people were thinking about COVID, were thinking about Ukraine, uh, immigration, Islam. This suddenly arrived at very late in the campaign, in, and in a way it helped Marine Le Pen. Um, yeah, I guess it helped her in a way, which is surprisingly enough, because she could have been quite in trouble um, considering her links uh, with uh, the Russian government and also the fact that uh, she's in debt with uh, Russian banks. And uh, I thought, as a political obser observer, that uh, this could have been like something very, very bad for her. But no one really cared and no one really came up with this uh, until last debate that was on a Tuesday evening and that was Emmanuel Macron that came up with uh, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday evening sorry that came up with it finally and uh, this uh, didn't like bother her much which is surprisingly enough and indeed she did her campaign like very grassroots again and she was campaigning on the coast of living she she she's quite intelligent in the way she did this strategy, of course, because she looked at who doesn't vote, 
who is not seduced by the, 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 the how to say, the speech of Emmanuel Macron of a startup nation, etc. Obviously, it's a poor people, poor workers. And she did go towards them because they've been abandoned by the left party and the, the Party Socialist, obviously, that tried to, to gather into a more social democrat so way of, uh, of uh, Im imagining a future and, uh, and, the, and the program of the party. And so, obviously, she, she, she really, like, concentrated her efforts on uh, this block of electors, and it worked, obviously. Well, we don't have the results, but it worked in the first round, for sure. Bruno Cotres, uh, inequality grew during uh, the last five years, particularly with the pandemic. There was the Yellow Vest movement. Do you get a sense at Sevipov from the studies you've done of what the voters want the next president to do? More justice. More justice. There is the feeling that French society is unfair and just, that the French meritocracy doesn't give the promise of Republican equality, which is so important in the eyes of the French, which is a permanent element of French political rhetorics. Uh, we talk constantly about uh, uh, Republican e equality, but actually most of the French have a feeling that it doesn't work. It, does, it is not delivered, actually. So there is a huge feeling of an unjust, unfair society, that the way that the society treats the individuals is badly first. We've got this explosion of the Yellow West crisis in France that no one outside France got. There is not another country in Europe where we have seen such a big social and democratic crisis. And I think that for the next president, whoever it is, for the next president, it's going to be issue number one that we are not getting back to the same times. Well, at the same times as before. If you're just joining us on France 24, we have an update once again on the abstention rate as we wait for the uh, results. Yes, uh, that's the only uh, result we have. It's an estimate again from our partner uh, Ipsos, 28.2%. Uh, 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 that's the second highest on uh, record. It's nearly three points more than it was in 2017. And interestingly, because it doesn't uh, happen very often, it's even higher uh, than uh, the first round. So that's uh, quite uh, surprising. It doesn't uh, pre-tell what the results are going to be at 8 p.m. in exactly half an hour, but it's an interesting education and maybe not such a good one for France democracy. All right, and in, they're still casting ballots for another 29 minutes across France before we know the name of the winner of the 2022 presidential election, the incumbent Emmanuel Macron voting around 1 p.m. local time in his home constituency in the North Sea resort of Le Touquet, his rival Marine Le Pen casting her ballot two hours earlier, late morning, also in the north of France, not very far away, her home constituency, Ena Beaumont. Yes, and in un bon an, uh, we just saw Marine Le Pen cast her ballot, and our Ellen Gainsford is actually in this small uh, northern town. Ellen, this is really home turf for Marine Le Pen. Well, exactly, Mark. Uh, I'm here in Enna Beaumont, which is really the electoral heartland uh, for Marine Le Pen and her national rally party. In the first round of the presidential election, she won more than 51% of the vote here. And um, to give you a bit of a context about the town, uh, it was a former mining town, and for many years it's actually been a bastion of the left here. But then in 2014, there was a bit of an electoral upset, and uh, Steve Briouat, the uh, national rally candidate, uh, won the mayoral race here. And that really paved the way for Marine Le Pen herself, who uh, became a lawmaker here in 2017. And um, well, we've been walking around the town today and visited uh, various polling stations and asking people about what issues are important to them uh, with the election. And they've told us that really the cost of living, that's one thing that's come up um, again and again, is that prices are going up and that's for things like vegetables and uh, petrol and um so that was an issue that's very important to voters here. And I can say for the people here in this room tonight uh, that there is a palpable sense of excitement. And uh, the official vote count is actually going uh, just beginning, uh, just behind me. I don't know if you can see that. And uh, so we'd, all that is left now is for us to wait for that official result. Ellen Gainsford in, uh, in un moment, uh, some 27 minutes to go before we get the result. We're now uh, going to uh, go to uh, central Paris, really the heart of uh, Paris. Uh, Yen Ali is uh, with us. Uh, Yen, uh, are, are people uh, watching this from home or are they gathering already in the streets? 
Well, it's a super warm, pretty mild spring day out here in Paris. It was very sunny earlier. There's a lot of people um, going out shopping. It is the school holidays here in Paris. Not a lot of people discussing the elections and not a lot of people crowding around television screens, eagerly waiting for those results at 8 p.m. Paris time. What I can tell you that is, though, is that there are student protests organized later on uh, this evening. Um, Anti-fascist groups, in fact, who say that no matter who wins, no matter which candidate wins, uh, they will take to the streets to protest against the slow privatization of universities. They demand more funding for higher education and they're protesting the lack of a concrete measures against climate change. So for now, uh, plenty of families and shoppers enjoying this spring weather in central Paris, enjoying beers on the terraces. But will the atmosphere change later on in the evening? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, Ali, uh, we'll have to wait and see a bit more. Yeah, 27 minutes to go before the top of the hour on France 24. We'll have the estimate telling you who's the winner of the 2022 French presidential election. This country, well, it's an outlier. In other European nations, power rests squarely with parliament. Here, the executive branch enjoys outsized powers. It's a very important election. Dipti Laurent explains why. France's current constitution dates back to 1958. It was in the middle of Algeria's war for independence, and France had become virtually ungovernable with a parliamentary stalemate and a weak executive power. It was at this time that General Charles de Gaulle decided to call a referendum to change the constitution. De tout mon cœur, au nom de la France, je vous demande de répondre oui. Well, the French people said yes, and the Fifth Republic was born, and Charles de Gaulle was its first president. They, he really wanted to transform the role of the president. He wanted the president to be above political parties with far-reaching powers. Some have even compared the role to that of a Republican monarch. Now, a French president serves a five-year term and can serve a maximum of two terms. Of course, the president has some important nominations to make. The president appoints his or her own prime minister, ambassadors, and top military officials. When it comes to the parliament, well, the president of France is not allowed to be physically present in the National Assembly, which is France's lower house parliament. Instead, the president can communicate via his or her ministers. If the president uh, wishes to... Uh, now, what's important, what's important to know is that the parliament cannot phys cannot vote the president out of office. However, the president is able to dissolve the lower house parliament and call new elections if necessary. When it comes to the army, well, the president is commander in chief of the armed forces. That means that the president can deploy uh, troops if necessary. The president alone is also allowed to uh, deploy nuclear force if necessary. However, if the president wishes to declare war, well, this can only be done with parliamentary consent. Now, it's important to know also that the president of France has some exceptional powers. In fact, it's written in the Constitution. Article 16 of the French Constitution allows a president to temporarily declare a state of emergency or expand police powers, essentially govern unilaterally in the event of a threat to France's territorial integrity, parliamentary institutions or national security. Essentially, if France was facing the same situation as Ukraine today, well, the president would be able to invoke this special power. However, it's only happened once in history, in 1961, when a French minister was taken hostage in Algeria, which at the time was part of France. Now, perhaps because of these parliamentary power, these uh, presidential powers rather, and these parliamentary privileges, some say that the president of France is one of the most powerful positions in the world, more powerful than the chancellor of Germany, more powerful than the prime minister of Britain, and even perhaps more powerful than the president of the United States. Dick Laurent explaining uh, the outsized powers of the French president. Bruno Cotres, uh, obviously this election, yes, it's about uh, the president, but immediately after that, people will be looking ahead. There are crucial uh, parliamentary uh, elections, and there might be some uh, tougher issues f for whoever wins. Oh, yes. On the 12th and 19th of June, we will have the two rounds of the legislative elections, and it is absolutely critical for Macron because what Macron needs is obviously a parliamentary majority. Uh, normally what we see, at least for the recent presidential election, normally what we see is that the legislative are actually like the third and the fourth round 
of the presidential election. Normally, the president gets an absolute majority. This year, we don't know if he will get or she will get absolute or relative majority. If it would be Macron, which is elected, uh, eventually, would Macron need a coalition with the Republicans, for instance, or another party? If it is Marine Le Pen who is going to win, it would be the first time the Front National would need a parliamentary majority, and it's not so obvious. You have seven members in yes, parliament. Yes, yes, yes. So it would be a huge effort for the Rassemblement National to get an absolute majority, but it is a majority system, and following the presidential election normally has big effect. Bruno Cotres, thank you. We can now uh, cross to Selena Sykes, who is in the 20th arrondissement of Paris in a uh, polling station in uh, round one in this, this arrondissement. Jean-Luc Mélenchon garnered some 47% uh, percent, uh, of the votes. Uh, so did uh, the people who voted for him come and vote or uh, did they do something else on this Sunday? Uh, a lot of uh, voters here keeping rather tight lips about uh, how they voted uh, here this uh, this afternoon. Uh, we spoke to a lot of voters who made it very clear to us that for them it was important to vote uh, and that they felt it was their uh, civic duty to do so. We're still seeing uh, a few last minute voters uh, uh, stream uh, through with uh, just under 20 minutes to go until the polling station here closes in uh, the north east of Paris. Uh, this polling station uh, for the first round had a, uh, a high particip participation rate at 77 percent in the first round, just above the national average. Uh, officials we spoke to just before 7 p.m. said uh, it stood at 71 percent uh, just before uh, seven, just before 7 p.m. There, sorry, uh, but this is obviously the big question now: uh, the turnout in uh, this second round. Uh, officials here we spoke to said for the first round there was a, a rather big surge at the last minute of voters coming just to arrive in time for 8 p.m. when polling stations here in Paris close. Uh, we're not seeing the same thing here. Uh, today, officials said that uh, two weeks ago there was actually a queue going out of the door and that they were still uh, uh, registering votes. Uh, people were taking voting until up to uh, 40 minutes after the polling station closed here because anyone who does arrive uh, by 8 p.m. can cast their ballots here this evening. Selena Sykes, less than 20 minutes uh, to vote and uh, before we get the first estimates of the results. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, from what she's saying, a portion of them either voting blank or voting with their feet in that in that particular polling station. Uh, Léa Chamboncel, if the left doesn't vote, what, what does that say? Well, it says that the left voters had enough of being what we call the beavers for the third election now. And what we call the beavers is basically the people that we asked to come to vote against someone. And it's the third election in a row that uh, the, the second, sorry, election in a row that they're actually left voters are, are voting against someone and not for someone, as we were saying. But isn't that, on. isn't that the nature of this Fifth Republic that the goal? Yeah, it, exactly, you, exactly. And what's you, inter you interesting? You vote for in the first round, you vote against in the second round. Yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting also is what we were saying early on, is that the third turn, the third round basically will be the legislative elections that will be in on, in, on the 12th and the 19th of June. And what's interesting is to see how the left parties are trying to organize themselves, which they failed at uh, during the presidential elections, but they're trying to make a coalition and to deal in order to have agreements for these three parties to get together and to have a majority at the assembly in front of uh, Emmanuel Macron. I doubt that this is going to happen exactly as they're saying, but it could be interesting to see how the things turn out within like a few weeks before these elections. All right, and I believe we're seeing live images, Mark Perlman, uh, from Marine Le Pen headquarters. Yes, and we can actually cross there. Alison Sargent is in the middle of uh, the crowd. Uh, less than 20 minutes to go before uh, the verdict is in. Uh, people must be quite anxious or excited around you, Alison. Uh, definitely both of those emotions, Mark. We can actually uh, check in with this group of supporters behind me. Uh, gentlemen, can I just ask you, are you feeling optimistic tonight? Yes, we do. Optimistic? Yeah, that's sorry. Okay, so we do have some smiles. You'll notice they're also all drinking uh, glasses of champagne already. Uh, the bar has been open for the last half hour. Uh, servers uh, popped special bottles of Marine Le Pen champagne. It says her name on the label, made specially uh, for her supporters this evening. Um, it's a relatively uh, mixed crowd in terms of age. As I was telling you earlier, I spoke to some older supporters uh, who've been voting for Marine Le Pen their entire lives, who also voted for her father. Uh, also spoken to some younger first-time voters.
years. And I just uh, a moment ago I was speaking to a man who's not your typical maybe a uh, national rally supporter. Uh, he is was born in Iraq in Baghdad. He told me he moved to France when he was just a baby with his parents who were refugees. Uh, he lives in Saint Saint Denis, uh, north of Paris, where a lot of people voted for Jean Luc Mélenchon. Uh, but he told me he's very proud to be part of Marine Le Pen's party. Uh, he feels that as as an immigrant, I asked him um, how he felt about her policies uh, regarding immigrants, which uh, would not allow many more people to come to France. And he told me that he feels uh, that it's that it's correct that he feels that immigrants need to assimilate uh, much as he feels that he did. They need to be French first. Uh, so according to him, uh, he thinks Marine Le Pen's immigration policies are not divisive. He thinks that they can bring people together under one uh, French nationality. So that was just one perspective of someone I've been talking to here. But it struck me because it's not not your typical. Uh, definitely, he was not your typical Marine Le Pen supporter. Definitely not, Alison. Thank you very much. 16 minutes to go before we get the first estimate of this presidential race. Well, let's go to the opposing camp at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. We join Delano D'Souza. Delano, were you able to sharpen your elbows and get past security there? <laughs> They keep pushing us back, uh, but uh, the crowd has been coming in steadily uh, since around 7 p.m. local time. I'm actually here with one of Emmanuel Macron's supporters, Simon. Where are you from? I'm from Paris. Uh, do you think Emmanuel Macron has done enough in the past two weeks to secure victory tonight? I think uh, what he has done uh, the past two weeks is far better than uh, um, the, the, the several weeks before that because the, the campaign uh, has been launched uh, maybe um, in the last weeks uh, before the, the first turn, so he uh, had not uh, enough time in, in order to explain all of his projects, all of his uh, proposals for, uh, to improve uh, what he has done in the uh, five previous years. So I think with the, the two weeks we, uh, we have seen, um, he, he has explained all of his proposals. Um, for example, in Marseille for ecology, um, he had he, uh, uh, the program is um, large. Is um, um, it brings a vision to uh, to push further all of the, his proposal uh, and uh, what he has done during uh, the five previous years. So I think that's far better and that's good uh, enough to uh, to uh, to bring um, some kind of new dynamic uh, into the campaign. Do you think he's done enough to convince? people who voted for the far left, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, to vote for him? For example, for ecology, I think the, the, um, the meeting in Marseille um, bring some proposals that uh, I, I think should convince, uh, add convince some people from Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, to vote for Emmanuel Macron and against Marine Le Pen. And because um, maybe there has been some point of view about the fact that Macron was uh, not uh, uh, for the ecology, but it's not right. So um, with uh, such kind of uh, um, meetings and uh, um, the fact that he uh, has explained um, much more his view for France, I think he has done enough in order to, uh, to convince all of uh, his uh, supporters of uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Thank you. There you have it, uh, one Emmanuel Macron supporter, pretty confident uh, that the president is going to be victorious and secure a uh, second term in office. We will be bringing you those results at about 8 p.m. local time. Back to you. In just 13 minutes' time, Delano D'Souza, many thanks for that live update from the Eiffel Tower. We know Cotres, we have three blocks now in French politics. That's new. We have uh, the far right, the center, the radical left. Is it just because this is the situation in this election, or do you think we're seeing something more structural? It's much more structural, obviously. Actually, these three blocks, we can see these three blocks since the mid of the 90s, the beginnings of the 2000s. At the time, it was the right, the left, and already the far right. Now it's going to be the far right, the center and center right, and the left with the extreme left, which is the dominant actor when previously it was the Parti Socialist, the dominant actor, but we could see uh, the effect of those two dimensions in French politics, a politics of actually two dimensions generate three blocks, actually the left and right, which is still there. When Emmanuel Macron just said the French, left and right is over, it's not over, it is still there. When actually you read the program, you could see that the left and right is still there, but also we have the second dimension, which is about the cultural change, tolerant society, or conservatism. And all of that generates three blocks. 
It's going to be a big deal for the next legislative election to see if the legislative election also reconstitute these three blocks and in which way. Particularly, we see that difficult negotiations are starting with La France Insoumise, the ecologists and the socialists to get unity for the legislative election. It's going to be super tough for those parties to get unity. Thanks for no contrast. We heard earlier Léa Chamboncel uh, wondering aloud uh, why uh, more wasn't made of uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, well, owing money to a Russian bank still today. Uh, we're joined by Douglas Herbert from our International Affairs Desk. We saw at the start of the war on February 24th in Ukraine, Emmanuel Macron get a noticeable bump in the opinion polls. Uh, the campaign took over. Right. That sort of was a little bit diluted. Um, let me ask you this, as a Russophile, mm. Uh, what are the Russians saying about this campaign? You might be surprised, but, you know, the Russians are so busy right now, Francois, basically hearing all about these stunning successes of their shining military in Ukraine, uh, being spoon-fed by the state-controlled press. Uh, other stories are getting little uh, breathing room you know, in there. Uh, what's going on tonight, today especially, it's also Orthodox Easter. So you have the leading headlines on the state news tonight were all about the Orthodox Easter celebrations, first time since the pandemic everyone can go out and go back to church again. Uh, and, and, and also, obviously, the successes I was talking about, in quotes, of the special military operation in Ukraine. The French elections did get a shout out. They were the 12th headline on the, the Pierre V. Canal, the first channel on the on the state news. Uh, and what were they saying? Well, basically, it was by the book. It was by the book because, look, Putin has been, you know, he's nothing of night. He's not stupid. He hasn't tipped his hand. He's not letting people know what he's thinking. If he's not tipping his hand, the state controlled media, which are under his thumb, aren't going to say anything. So basically, the state-controlled media uh, is a proxy for Putin. If, if Putin isn't saying anything, the media isn't saying anything. But I'll say one thing. There's a very interesting, and it's up on the screen for our viewers to see. Look at this headline here. It's, uh, it, it was uh, an opinion piece run by TASS, state-run news agency. And it was, the headline looks innocent enough. Why France's European neighbors are interfering in its election? What's that an allusion to? It's an allusion to a prominent opinion piece, a tribune that was published in Le Mans newspaper here in France this week by the, the, the leaders, the prime ministers of Germany uh, and Spain and Portugal, left-leaning leaders. And they were heavily weighing in with their preference on who voters should vote for in this election. But what this article is about, it's an opinion basically saying, I love it how no one's, there's no, uh, you know, uproar in Europe over interference in French elections when Europeans interfere in the elections. But when, you know, when Putin does it, supposedly does it, back in 2017, he was accused, everyone is, you know, out yeah. of their seats, jumping, climbing and, the walls in, in indignation. And then at that only candidate's debate, we heard Emmanuel Macron is, remind everyone of that, that back in 2017, the Russians uh, did try to interfere against him in the elections. In that same debate, we heard Marine Le Pen uh, take shots at the EU, but take shots more specifically yeah. at Germany, and how are Germans watching this election? Well, how are they watching it? They're wondering if the Franco-German motor, which has, you know, the, the, the hub, the core of, of European, you know, locomotion in the past few years, it has just recently gotten a revival, right? France and Europe worked together on the COVID, on the big, you know, debt funds and, and, and all of that. And then the Ukraine war happened, as you pointed out, and that obviously gave a big boost to the solidarity, which had been sort of sputtering of late. So just when it's back, the Germans are wondering whether or not what the consequences would be of a Macron or a Le Pen, because they fear that this Franco-German engine, just when it's getting up and running again, the rum, 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 it might break down in the middle of the road. So plenty of coverage. So there's plenty of coverage. I'll just say one thing. Uh, uh, the Tagesspiegel basically running a headline asking if one of the candidates, uh, Marine Le Pen, might she actually win? And another one saying, regardless of who wins, Europe will never be the same again. Yeah. So you could see there are dramatic stakes in this election. So not to go into the details of what they're saying specifically about each candidate and their platform yet, uh, you can see that in Germany, they are extremely closely watching this election. The, the term that comes up again and again in the German press and elsewhere is a sigh of relief. Will we be breathing a sigh of relief after 8 p.m. France time today? And if they're watching uh, right now, well, you've come to the right place. Eight minutes to go, Mark Perlman. Eight minutes to go. So let's now cross to Florence Villemino at the headquarters of Marine Le Pen. Florence, it's getting really, really close to the top of the hour. What's the mood around you? 
Well, Mark, you can definitely feel that countdown that's about to start. Emotions are high here at the uh, Rassemblement National's uh, uh, party to watch these uh, election results uh, come on in. Uh, now, a certain amount of uh, stress, a certain amount of excitement. Uh, the supporters that we've been talking to are cautiously uh, confident. They say that Marine Le Pen has done a wonderful campaign, so there's no reason that that should pay off, essentially. Now, Marine Le Pen is here. She's out of the camera eye. Uh, she's apparently watching these results uh, come in, these uh, exit polls coming in from across the country that we can't give you quite yet. We'll get them to you in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and then you can see right behind me there is a podium, and that is where she'll come and give a speech. Apparently she has two speeches prepared, one a uh, victory speech and one uh, a concession speech. And uh, what's interesting is to see the crowd here. There are about 500 journalists, about 500 supporters that we've actually been crisscrossing uh, throughout this campaign. We saw them at the first round two weeks ago, and uh, I've seen several familiar faces that I saw at m many of Marine Le Pen's rallies throughout uh, recent days. People have come uh, with their kids uh, to watch uh, Marine Le Pen give this speech. Now, whatever happens, whether she wins or loses, she certainly uh, will have uh, brought the party from the fringe to the mainstream, and we're expected to hear something to that extent in that speech tonight. Florence Villemulot, thank you very much. Just six minutes to go. And we cross to Claire Pacalin, who's at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, waiting for the top of the hour, and Macron supporters waiting along with her. Well, Emmanuel Macron's supporters have all arrived now just outside the Eiffel Tower. They're practicing their chants, and one and two and five years more, that's been the main chant of this campaign. They've also been practicing their flag waving, and of course, everyone's waiting for the next few minutes to go by and that result to come through at eight o'clock very, very, very shortly. I have just been into the crowd and I was speaking to a Belgian couple as well as an English woman. They were all on holiday in Paris, and they said they simply came tonight because they just want to see Emmanuel Macron and they want to show that they are against extremes, against the far-right candidate. I also spoke to a young couple of French people, a 23-year-old and a 21-year-old. The 21-year-old told me that he works in a hospital. He's a hospital porter and he worked during the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, he was pretty pleased with how the president handled that pandemic. He said he saw a 200 euro monthly pay rise. Every month he gets 200 euros more than he got two years ago. So that's why he was happy to vote for Emmanuel Macron. His partner, though, she actually voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon in the first round. But today she said she wants to block the far-right candidate coming to power and that she voted for Emmanuel Macron today. Claire Pacalan will be crossing to you. We're inside five minutes to go before we know the name of the winner of the 2022 French presidential election. Uh, Léa Chamboncel, uh, you, you heard about the, you heard those those uh, foreigners in Paris who uh, decided to show up at the Macron rally. It harks back to what Douglas was talking about, that headline in Tagesspiel: spiel, uh, France votes Europe frets. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you came up with the uh, foreign policy, uh, well, um, um, issues, because, well, we need to to remind also that France is uh, at, the, at the head of the uh, EU right now. He's having uh, leading uh, EU with the French presidency of the European Union. So there is still three months to go. So it can be like uh, quite, uh, quite an issue. And to see well, whatever Macron or Marine Le Pen will decide to do, it will be interesting to have a, a close look at this. And also, it's important to remind that uh, France is the only European country that has a seat at the Security Council. And this uh, has an impact on uh, the security, the international security, not just in Europe, but internationally. And also, I've seen a lot of uh, American um, uh, headlines in the, in the American press and also saying how Washington, D.C. is quite worried about the outcome of these elections and uh, how it could like really change um, the world, basically, and uh, the equilibrium. So it's, uh, it, it's meta, and um, I think the, um, the world will be different after within five minutes. Do you agree, uh, Bruno? Quickly, just uh, yes, last French. words before. What, you will be, what will you be watching for, especially? French elections are talking more and more and more about European Union. Actually, European Union is at the same time very invisible. In most of the French elections, we are not really talking about Europe. We talk a little bit about Europe at the time of the Ukraine war, obviously, but it was not really a central part of that election. But actually, the French elections are talking secretly, idly about European Union and what EU, what globalization, broadly speaking, is doing to French politics, which perturbates so much 
French politics, when Emmanuel Macron in the last row of the campaign was saying it's a referendum about, about Europe, it was maybe an exaggeration, but it was really something that talking about Europe last, the last election also, it was clearly talking about Europe. We should always remember that France has ratified the Maastricht Treaty so long time ago by a super narrow majority. We have rejected also the constitutional treaty. And so the public opinion in France has mixed feelings with Europe. We are very proud to have a French president, which is a, a big star of the European Union. But at the same time, we have so many question marks and so many fears toward European Union also. Bruno Cotteres, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Europe is the background music. Uh, Bruno Cotteres of Sevipov, thanks for being with us here on election night on France 24. We're inside of two minutes to go. Uh, Mark, as we count down, uh, obviously there's two scenarios that are obvious. One wins, the other loses. But it's actually also about the margin of victory. Well, let, yeah. let's begin by uh, looking at those uh, two scenarios. The first one, Emmanuel Macron, uh, if he is reelected, would be the first president in the Fifth Republic to be reelected with a majority in the lower house of uh, parliament. This has never happened before. If Marine Le Pen wins, she would be the first woman and the first far-right leader elected uh, president. And uh, so this would be obviously a major earthquake. Uh, there's a third scenario. We've never had it in France, but it happened elsewhere. It could be too close uh, to call. So that's, uh, those are the three scenarios we're looking at. All right, and uh, we're now into the final minute. Uh, the name of the winner will be appearing on your screen in under 60 seconds. Mark, what's coming up in the next hour? In the next hour, you'll have a victory speech by the winner, a concession speech by the losers, and we'll probably also hear from the leaders of the big 10 parties that were pushed as aside from this uh, round two in a very unusual uh, way. And because we know that this is a key election, but there's a crucial election, parliamentary election in the next two months. That's right. We're, we'll be at the halfway point uh, of voting uh, when the clock strikes 8 p.m. here in Paris, which is uh, just in a few seconds time. You're watching France 24. Emmanuel Macron re-elected president of France. Emmanuel Macron, 58.2%, Marine Le Pen, 41.8%. Emmanuel Macron made history in 2017 by becoming the youngest president ever elected. He makes history again tonight by being the first president re-elected with a sitting majority in parliament. Uh, the margin is smaller uh, than five years ago when he won two thirds of the vote versus one third for uh, Marine Le Pen. But this is uh, still a major victory uh, for uh, the president. Obviously, as we've discussed before, his presidency will now hinge on whether he can obtain a majority in the legislative elections scheduled in June. This is what he did in 2017. It will be really Really, really key for him uh, to be able to do that again this year, but a clear victory for Emmanuel Macron tonight. A clear victory for Emmanuel Macron tonight, and you're watching live scenes from the foot of the Eiffel Tower, as Mark was saying. Uh, uh, Macron, uh, the first president to be re-elected in two decades, uh, France 24's Delano de Souza is in the crowd. Delano. A lot of cheering, very happy people here, clearly, that Emmanuel Macron has secured a second a term in office. He has become the fourth a president in the history of the Fifth Republic to secure that second term in office. I'm here with uh, one of Emmanuel Macron's supporters, uh, Fabrice. Yeah, hello. How are you feeling? Uh, very happy. Today we won. Uh, you know, we have a good president for more five more years. 
So I guess it's a good chance for France. Do you think Emmanuel Macron will will succeed in convincing people who voted for the extreme right and the extreme left in the first round that he is going to be the president for all of France. That's going to be a challenge for him. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, he cannot be elected anymore. So he has five years to convince and to, uh, you know, like a team, to work with everybody. Because now he won't think anymore for a re-election. So he has five years to do what he wants to do, really, now. But he has to think about the future of his party. Sorry? He has to think about the future of La République en Marche. Yes, but uh, step by step, you know. <laughs> step by step, yeah. And are you going to wait till the president speaks yes, later tonight? Yes, uh, maybe he's come in one hour, maybe. He'll be coming in one hour and uh, it's going to be uh, a, a big feast, you know. Uh, everybody's happy now, today, tonight. Okay, uh, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. There you hear it. So another one of Emmanuel Macron's supporters, the, the crowd here is going to stay late into the night. I assume it's going to be pretty festive uh, as the night continues and when we will be expected to hear from Emmanuel Macron who will be speaking here just under the Eiffel Tower in about an hour or so. 58.2 percent is our initial uh, Ipsos estimate, uh, Delano de Souza, uh, at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, where Emmanuel Macron will speak when he leaves uh, the Elysee Palace to make his way from the right bank to the left bank of the Seine for what will be, Mark Perlman, a victory speech. Yes, a victory speech, uh, a concession speech will be given, however, by Marine Le Pen. And we can now cross to Florence Villemino, who is at uh, Marine Le Pen's headquarters in Western Paris. Florence, uh, the mood, I imagine, a bit sad around you. Absolutely. Uh, lots of long faces at uh, the Rassemblement National, the party here. You could see uh, behind me the screens. Uh, a big crowd of supporters had uh, gotten uh, there right as that countdown happened. They counted down 10, 9, 8, and then when the result came in that Emmanuel Macron had won, big gasp in the crowd, and then boos uh, when that final result came on up. But then I just spoke to some of the supporters behind me. They said, look, you know, it's progress compared to 2017. Marine Le Pen did better in the second round. So they say there's, you know, this is progress for Marine Le Pen. And now, of course, uh, we're going to be waiting for Marine Le Pen to come down and give her concession speech. And there are going to be many uh, questions that uh, are up for, you know, we need to know what's next for Marine Le Pen. She said this was going to be her last run for president. What's going to be next for her uh, in her political career? What's going to be next for the party, of course? Uh, because the next big elections are going to be the parliamentary elections in June. Everyone has their eyes set on that because currently the Rassemblement National has just a handful of MPs within the 577 MPs in the French uh, lower, uh, lower House of Parliament. And a lot of people here say it's high time that there was better representation for the party in Parliament. So everyone's eyes are now turned once they lick their wounds, of course, all eyes will be turned to the next uh, step, which is going to be those parliamentary elections. Will there be some sort of an alliance with Eric Zemmour, the other far-right candidate? If you look at the results of the first round, the far right between the Rassemblement National and uh, Eric Zemmour represents 30 percent of the vote. That's huge. Uh, and so that's really those are the questions that are going to be next for the Rassemblement National. And Marine Le Pen as well. What is her plan for the party? She managed to bring it from the fringe into the mainstream. Is she going to have some sort of a, a supportive ro role for the party? Will she run again, even though she said she hasn't? All these questions are things that we're going to be uh, looking out for when Marine Le Pen gives her concession seats. But right now, lots of long faces here at the Rassemblement National. There is an open bar, so I imagine some people will be drowning their sorrows uh, in that open bar while we wait for Marine Le Pen to come and speak. Florence Villemino, thank you very much. Uh, Marine Le Pen uh, scoring 41.8 percent of the votes, according to our estimates. That's seven points more than five years ago, but still not enough to win the presidency, Francois. All right. And uh, with us uh, f in this hour after that result, uh, Léa Chambonsen, host of the Popo Politics podcast. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we also want to welcome back, uh, you were with us at, for the first round, Member of Parliament uh, Jean-Noël Barrault of Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche uh, party, and uh, uh, Martina Gabalica, representative of the youth wing of the National Rally in the uh, eastern and southeastern suburbs of Paris. Thanks for being with us. Uh, the young, who a lot of young voters went for your candidate. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's go around the room for a quick reaction. Jean-Louis Barrault, 58.2%. Is that a mandate? Well, first, it's a, it's a very clear victory. It's also, uh, 
historical because uh, none of the previous uh, presidents under the Fifth Republic had been uh, re-elected after uh, being in, in charge. And so it, it's, it's very meaningful that uh, Emmanuel Macron would, uh, would have... Sorry. No. No, under uh, no. sharing government. He didn't okay, have the majority parliament. in parliament. The no, it's, yeah. it's the first time it ever happened. With a sitting majority, it's the first yeah, time. The exactly. Majority, and yeah. uh, of course, yeah. And, and that's, that's uh, historical. And the second thing is that uh, we are grateful, obviously, to the people that have voted for Emmanuel Macron. But uh, we also want to say uh, tonight to all of those that uh, have not voted for Emmanuel Macron that they've been uh, heard and that they will be called to participate because Emmanuel Macron has said that he wants to change the way he governs and, 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 uh, and call every citizen that is willing to participate in public policy making uh, to do so. And the last thing is that uh, abstention is a bit higher than it was last time, which calls for major democratic reform, which, which is what we intend to do in the next five years. Uh, Ma Martini, uh, before we turn to Martina Gabalica, uh, four in ten voters choosing the far right, that's also historic. Yes, it's a, it's a very high score. It, it is meaningful as well. And it means that we need to provide uh, concrete answers to what uh, they are longing for. And that will be what we'll be working on in the next coming uh, months. Uh, Martina Gabalica, well, what's your take? I mean, this is a, a disappointment uh, for Marine Le Pen. She hoped really to win, or do you say it's much better than last time? So, Well, of course, it's much better than last time. It's much better than in 2017. We show through the results that people are coming to us more and more because there are more and more people disappointed of the politics, actually. Uh, well, they choose. They chose Emmanuel Macron. Uh, I'm personally disappointed, and I think that everyone... You thought my... Marine Le Pen could really win? Yes, we thought. We thought because um, Emmanuel Macron just fought us for five years. He just beat us for five years. He destructed the country for five years. So people want to keep going that. There's no problem. I'm just listening my colleague on the other side of the table, and I hope that you're right and that he's really going to change because... It's really crazy that in a country nowadays, when people go out in the streets and say that things are going not well, that the only answer of that president is to fight us, to say us, send us the cops with weapons. I hope that he's going to take, he's going to change on that, and that's not going to happen again. Well, apparently, what uh, what Marine Le Pen was uh, was proposing was not enough to convince them that it was worth the change. And I really believe that some of, of the proposals that Emmanuel Macron have, has made during this campaign uh, sort of met uh, some of the expectations of the French people and that, on the other hand, the extreme right uh, was not uh, wanted by a majority of the French citizens. And so it doesn't mean that, uh, that, that you know, that. As, a, as an elected or newly uh, re-elected president, you don't take into account what, uh, what, the, what the voters have had to say. But uh, uh, I don't think that, uh, and we don't think that the, the proposals that Marine Le Pen were making were good enough to meet a majority of, uh, of French people and, uh, and their Le, Léa Chambon said 58.2%. Again, that's the number we're watching here. Ten minutes ago, we had the result. <laughs> Is it good or bad for, Mar for, for the incumbent? Is it good or bad for Marine Le Pen? It's uh, not as good as 2017, obviously, for Emmanuel Macron. And it's better for Marine Le Pen. But I think what we should look up is the potential consequences of these results. On the fact, for, on the one hand, that Marine Le Pen loses for the first time the presidential elections. And th this could definitely like trigger some changes in the national rally uh, political party and perhaps they will try to think about a new leader or you know like see how they can get closer to Eric Zemmour and her niece that left her party as well. As for Emmanuel Macron I think the consequences is also a warning. It's a warning to say well obviously what you have been doing did did actually um, meet some agreements and uh, some voters voted for him and fully convinced of uh, the fact that they wanted him to be president again. But we need to remember also that a lot of voters have been, again, voting against someone and not for him. So I hope um, when we will be listening to I'm his I'm going to interrupt you because right we're going to listen yeah. to uh, sure. the uh, a loser, Marine Le Pen, who is about set to make her a concession speech. 
and uh, you can hear the applause from her supporters. This is in the west of Paris as she gets ready to address her supporters. Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, un grand vent de liberté aurait pu se lever sur le pays. We could have seen a great wind of freedom sweeping across this country, but the people of France decided it to be otherwise. We have seen unfair, violent practices, the sorts of practices that the French citizens are subjected to day in, day out. We've seen those. We've seen that throughout France, and when we look at the results of tonight's election, we can see that we have nevertheless been victorious. Millions of our fellow citizens chose to vote for our party. I would like to show my deepest recognition to all of those people. Those are people who voted for us in the first round and the millions who voted for us in the second. My deep gratitude goes to all of those men, women, from the rural regions, from the overseas territories as well. Those people who voted for me so overwhelmingly for this second round. I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for that show of support. Because that is the side of France that is so far too often forgotten, but we will never forget it. We will continue to defend the citizens of France now more than ever before. And I have no feeling of, of shame or regret because I would like to say to all those who wanted to see our party disappear, I would just like to say that I see a new form of hope, because the results that we have, it shows that in France and in Europe, that, that the leaders in France and Europe are going to have to face a sense of great mistrust from the people. There are great winds of change afoot. What we show is that we can stand up as a power to counterbalance that shown by Emmanuel Macron and his party. We will be there to protect men and women in France, to ensure that they have purchasing power, to ensure that we have strong social security systems, strong public institutions. We will be able to stand up against the retirement reform that Ma Macron wants to bring in. Tonight, what I fear is that the coming five years will be one with the same sort of disregard that we have seen over the past five years. That Macron will further create division within our country as opposed to closing down those gaps. Because instead of having the power in the hands of few, I will fight to bring power to the hands of the French people. I will do so with steadfast determination that you have seen me put into motion these past few years. Following this campaign, following this camp, we see that the great political stage that we have been operating on is undergoing great change. With the self-proclaimed elite of Macron's political parties, they are now going to have to face up against true opposition, because in a few weeks' time, we will face the legislative elections, and we will be there. Again, with the legislative process, the legislative election process, we only know that the powers are going to be are going to maintain that power. So what we want is we, we want to find change to the system because all we can see in Macron's campaign is that he will destroy France, he will break down France, he will break down its institutions. So these are people, there are people who voted Macron in a second time. And yet, we, we are a party that will take your interests at heart and we will defend your interests. So therefore, we will see you for the next battle, the next electoral battle for the ele legislative elections.
And this is a battle that I will fight with Jordan Bardella. All those who were so brave enough to stand up against Macron in the second round, with all those men and women who believe in our nation, we will strive to unite all those people from whatever their background, those people who wish to rally together to stand up against Macron. Those people who wish to have candidates in their local communities, be they in France, be they across over the seas, in our overseas territories, wherever they may be, we will be there. And I call on you all to vote for them, vote for the national rally. Because remember, when we look at the polls, when we look at the at the figures, nothing is written in stone. We can change the future because our party is ready and we are going to win numerous seats in the parliament. And we will serve you because we serve a great ambition, the only true ambition. That is that France is our true ambition. So tonight, I will say it once again, I will never leave the French people to the wayside. Long live the French Republic, long live France. We just heard the concession speech from uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, who came up short uh, once again in this presidential election. She said, however, that it was a great victory uh, for the national uh, rally, that she would continue uh, to carry the torch for the party. And she immediately said that the next objective was to win many seats in the upcoming legislative elections. She said we cannot allow Emmanuel Macron free reign uh, for the next uh, five years. So clearly, uh, Marine Le Pen showing that she is not ready to leave the stage. She didn't speak about her future, but uh, clearly she wants the national rally uh, to continue and to score major victories in the near future. We can now cross to Florent Villemineau, who is at the Marine Le Pen headquarters and just listened uh, to this concession speech. Florence. That's right, uh, Mark. You can, might be able to see right behind me. Marine Le Pen is just leaving the stage after that concession speech that qu came very shortly after those results came in, that very uh, defiant speech uh, from Marine Le Pen saying there could have been a wind of freedom over France. It wasn't for them tonight. She respects uh, the, uh, vo the results tonight. She spent, said a special thank you to all the people in uh, rural France and in overseas territories who overwhelmingly showed her their support in this second round of the election. She said, and you just said it there, that the result tonight is a great victory, even if it wasn't enough to win the second round tonight. Uh, she said there are no regrets, no bad feelings. Uh, and she said she was very defiant uh, with respect to uh, Emmanuel Macron. And the next step, she said, are those parliamentary elections in June. Uh, now, she lashed out against the, the current system in France. It's, it's a, it's a two-round system for those parliamentary elections, which has often meant that the far right, the national, uh, doesn't really ma manage to get that many MPs. But that's going to be her next fight. And she also said her fight isn't over for the Rassemblement, Rassemblement National. What does that mean? It's not clear, but sorry, she's we're still going to in have the to fight. Interrupt you, Florence, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, the man who came in third in the first round of the election, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, is speaking right now. Let's listen in. Ladies and gentlemen, after the second round of elections between Madame 
Le Pen and Mr. Macron, barely one-third of the people on the list voted. But the decision has been made, and once again, Mrs. Le Pen has been beaten. France clearly refused to allow its future be controlled by her, and that is excellent news for the unity of our people. Now, we have Mr. Macron, who received the least popular support in the history of the Fifth Republic. His presidency has survived as a decision by default and through forced hands. He is treading water in an ocean of abstention voting and protest voting. My thoughts go to the future victims of this situation, people on financial support who are going to have to work for free for 20 hours a week, people who will be able to retire three years later than they thought. People who are struggling to make ends meet and who will not see price control implemented. People who know just how damaging and how criminal ecological inaction can and has been. And the people who look on sadly as the country is stripped for parts and sold. To each and every one of you, I tell you, do not give up. On the contrary. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to act together, strongly. Democracy can once again give us the means to change our destiny. The third round of the election starts tonight. On the 12th and 19th of June, we will have the legislative elections in France. Here, you can defeat Mr. Macron and choose another, another path. On the 12th and the 19th, a new world is still possible to achieve if you elect a majority, and mark my words, a majority of MPs from the new popular union which is set to grow. The popular political bloc, as we call it, based around my own presidential run, is in this country right now the third party, the kingmaker, that can change everything if we come together and grow. On the 12th and the 19th of June, calling on you to elect me as Prime Minister, basically what I'm asking you to do is to open up a new, bright future for our people. Be strong, act, be determined, throw off the yoke of destiny, never give up. Long live France, long live the Republic. Thank you. The leader of uh, the uh, third place finisher in the first round, uh, 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 Jean-Luc Mélenchon of the left, uh, uh, giving a, a speech there eff effectively at uh, 8.25 p.m., 25 minutes after the result, kicking off uh, his uh, campaign for the legislative elections, calling on voters to be his prime minister. Lots to unpack. And I want to uh, begin, if uh, if I may, uh, Martina Gabalica, with uh, one line we heard in uh, uh, Marine Le Pen's concession speech, she said, um, there are people who helped to re-elect Macron. And who is she talking about there? Well, I think that she's actually talking about every person who let him came back on the lead of the France, every person who gave him, like, the opportunity to do it. I'm looking just at what Jean-Luc Mélenchon said, and, like, it makes me a little click, because... He spent all of his campaign being against Emmanuel Macron, saying that he was the destructor of our country, which is actually true. But now he wants to work with him. He wants to be his prime minister. I think that he's one of those, actually. He's one of those who just forgot that we are fighting not for a position, not for just some seat in the parliament, but actually for the friends. And I hope, I hope really that there will still be something to save in 2027. Do you think uh, Marine Le Pen gave the impression that she was not quitting 
uh, politics. She said, I want to lead to the legislative elections. It's a little bit like Jean-Luc Mélenchon. They both said this would be our last campaign. It seems she's not well, about to... Uh, our fight has always been to protect French people and to save France from the hands of people like Emmanuel Macron. So this is a win, actually, for us. This right, but the question is Marine Le Pen. Is she the one to lead the party now for the next five years? I don't know. I'm not her. But I know from the word of every person like me who is working with the Rassemblement National that we're not going to give up. We're not going to let go. We're going to keep fighting and we're going to be there to watch what Emmanuel Macron does, because he said so many things during this campaign, and we'll see if he's going to keep his word or not. Jean-Noël Jean Barrault, uh, the campaign is on now. You're, you're running for re-election. So, maybe just a word about Jean-Luc Mélenchon. If uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and, and obviously some of his uh, voters in the first round decided to go for uh, Emmanuel Macron, even though they were opponents to uh, the politics that we've uh, undertaken over the past five years, rather than going for Marine Le Pen, it's simply because they, they think that uh, Marine Le Pen would be much worse than Emmanuel Macron. And that's the reason why. Or is it because he's courting socialists no. and Green Party voters who decided to vote for him in the first round. But the, 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 the socialist candidate, the green candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the communist candidate, the right-wing candidate, they all said that even though they were opponents to Emmanuel Macron, that they would clearly vote for Emmanuel Macron because Marine Le Pen, what Marine Le Pen is proposing was much worse. And then, let me just say, because I hear uh, among you know, some of the uh, observations uh, tonight that, that this might be not s such a, a victory. Again, I said you, you need to take these this results with some humility and hear what the people have said when they voted. But again, Gis uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, Nicolas Sarkozy, François Hollande, even though he was not a candidate, they failed to, uh, to, to be re-elected. So it's, it's really meaningful that Emmanuel Macron was re-elected. It means that somehow, even though he did not solve every problem in France, that it somehow provided uh, a number of answers to what people were waiting for. for but does he get a majority now? Because last time it flowed, you know, there was the energy of the momentum of the presidential victory. Now things are very, very different. And you heard Marine Le Pen, you heard Jean-Luc Mélenchon. They're out to get him, and so it means it's going to be much more difficult. Of course, so we are uh, step by step, as one of the person on the uh, Eiffel Tower was saying uh, earlier. Yeah, but but we are going to work hard to to give Emmanuel Macron a majority so that he can basically uh, govern. Uh, so it's going to be a, a battle, uh, but we are ready. Uh, we are ready for it, and I think that the French people will be will care about the idea that now that they've elected a French president re-elected Emmanuel Macron, that they also need to be consistent and to provide the majority for him. Léa Chambancel, uh, again, uh, we, we heard Jean-Luc Mélenchon mention that this was the worst elected president, which is not true, in fact, uh, because, uh, well, we've had much tighter races in the past. Mitterrand was elected at uh, 55. Closest is 1974. It was mm. less than two points the margin. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, first of all, the speech by Marine Le Pen, were you surprised by her tone was there what struck you no not much uh, what struck me is that she believes that they can have more seats at the parliament and i doubt it honestly it's i doubt that, it for it's not that difficult they have seven so yeah exactly it's uh, they don't have a group a parliamentary group right. so they don't have much powers to have a group you need 15 mps which uh, they don't um, and i doubt i doubt that they can do better than they did in 2017 but let's let's have a look closely in june that is at what's going to happen uh, for, for two reasons. First of all, because the presidential election is dramatically different from the legislative election. We saw that the abstention on this, this year for this, uh, this second round is quite, it's higher than 2017. Just as a reminder, for the legislative elections on the second round in 2017, it was over 56 percent. So. If we believe that there is more abstention in the second round, in the first and second round of legislative elections, maybe that won't be... Well, they don't have the opportunity, well, the ability of galvanizing the voters as they do for the presidential election. Right, so I doubt that they will have more, more seats. It's also the, it's the same situation for Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's, he's, this is his strategy since the, second, the first round, say, saying, oh, there is a third round and you need to elect me prime minister, which is quite shocking 
to elect me prime minister because the prime minister is appointed by the president for us the results of the of, of course the, if he had a majority of votes of the majority of vote obviously but yeah. it's interesting the, the language the vocabulary that is used is actually interesting and the thing is that we we don't know if they're going to do better than they do they did in 2017 because people i i, I doubt that people will be very galvanized by these elections upcoming you, elections you're watching france 24 it is election night emmanuel macron re-elected with 58 0.2% according to our exclusive Ipsos estimate. And uh, as the night uh, grows old, that estimate will become a firm result as uh, we continue uh, to watch uh, the, uh, as the, the uh, results come in. Uh, from uh, polling stations across the country. Yes, and we're heading back to Marine Le Pen's headquarters in the middle of the crowd. Alison Sargent is uh, with uh, militants. They must be uh, pretty disappointed or maybe uh, they think it was an honorable result. Uh, well, we can ask them, Mark. Uh, we've moved out to the terrace to get a little bit of air. I'm in here with two of Marine Le Pen's supporters, uh, Dominique and Rami. And um, how, are, how are the two of you feeling about these results? I'm uh, feeling bad, of course, because uh, we, we lost. But we are so um, motivated to coming. And the next uh, view is, of course, the legislative uh, race. And we are happy um, to uh, fighting again and again for the national um, feel, uh, national ideas, uh, we continue to fight, and we thankfully all the French citizens we vote to 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 him uh, in this day. And Dominique, what about you? How are we feeling about the results? Still serene, as I was before. Um, you were expecting this. Expecting. No, I, I was not expecting a defeat. Of course not. No, uh, but uh, well. The, the, that would be um, hard if we hadn't fought, but uh, we fought, we, we did our best, uh, and um, Marin, Marin gave everything, I think. She, 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 she spoke well, of course. Well, I already told you, she, she speaks well, I would like her to now to act. Well, she cannot. Um, and that's, Dominique, the, that's you, the major, majority. You, so I, I don't have problems. I, I think the, the problem would be if we hadn't, uh, if we ha hadn't done our best to, uh, to to offer this option. Well, it's a change in society, and well, the majority did, did not. Wanted to stay the same. And we were talking earlier, Dominique, about how you're feeling uh, about Macron's presidency. Can you both tell me how you're feeling about the next five years? Uh, well, we we can still. We can still do something, uh, well, the RN people, um, well, well uh, now he's, all, well, he should, he would be around 57%, so it's not the 66 of uh, 2017. So you have hope for the legislative? So, yes, now we can, um, we can work on some influence, uh, yes, in, in Parliament, yes. How do you feel about Emmanuel Macron as a president? Uh, what I feel, I accept, of course, um, the, um, the choice of the French citizens, okay? I thank fully all the French citizens to vote today. Uh, of course, I uh, scare about the five years we, we will go in, uh, because uh, if the last five years is very difficult for the French citizens, and I, uh, I hope, of course, the best for the all French citizens, but uh, I scare in my opinions uh, for the futures, because it's very difficult, and we live at difficult times. So there we have it, I guess. I, say exactly, uh, I said exactly the same about a difficult time, you know. We, we didn't, didn't know one another, Remy and I. And yes, we, we already lived difficult times. And uh, with, with the same persons, we'll have the same hard time. Yeah, fighting into the legislative. So there we have it. A little bit of disappointment, but resigned and uh, looking, looking ahead, proud of how they fought and ready for those legislative elections. Alison Sargent on the terrace of the Pavillon d'Armenonville uh, with uh, some militants of the National Rally, some of them having a drink, uh, maybe because they're sad or maybe because they think they have a future. Lots of talk about the bar at the, at the, at the Le Pen headquarters this evening. I've noticed that's been a thread throughout 
throughout the evening. Uh, it's time to cross to uh, Deep Tika Laurent. Uh, who has been uh, is at the board crunching the numbers uh, for us uh, throughout the night. Uh, we heard the leader of the left on France 24 a short while ago, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, say, make me your prime minister now. And as you heard those supporters of Marine Le Pen say, they're looking ahead to parliamentary elections. What, what do exit polls tell us? Well, Francois, we really have seen how these French presidential elections have redrawn the political landscape in France. Have a look at this. Gone are the traditional right-wing and left-wing parties, at least for the moment. These are the three major parties in France. You have Emmanuel Macron's uh, centrist party, you have Marine Le Pen's far-right party, and you have Jean-Luc Mélenchon's far-left party. Now, what's clear is that M Emmanuel Macron now, with his 58% uh, also, uh, a majority will find it very hard to govern without a majority in Parliament, something that we've been talking about a lot this evening. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is where this man comes in, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He came third in the French presidential elections, and he's already looking ahead to those parliamentary elections in June. And when you look at the kind of people who are voting for him, well, that's where it gets really interesting. Have a look at this. Jean-Luc Mélenchon's voters are very varied. Sure, he's very popular among young people, but he's also got quite a bit of support in the 50 to 70 age bracket. When it comes to education, 43% of people who support uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon are college graduates, but it's pretty spread across the three brackets. And finally, when it comes to income, bearing in mind that 2,000 euros as a monthly income is roughly considered the median uh, income here in France, well, that's pretty widespread. He's very popular with the low to mid income earners, but he's also got almost 40% support in mid to top level income earners as well. And this is really interesting now because we're looking ahead to those uh, parliamentary elections. And one, one thing that's really interesting is that the polling, our polling partners, Ipsos, have been asking Mélenchon voters the reason they voted for Emmanuel Macron. And look at this figure here. 91% said they voted principally to prevent Marine Le Pen from winning in this second round. This was not a vote of conviction, clearly. And this is why Emmanuel Macron senses, uh, this is why Jean-Luc Mélenchon rather senses this opportunity ahead of the parliamentary elections. He's already, um, he, he's already uh, calling on his voters to help elect him prime minister in those parliamentary elections because he, because what could happen is Emmanuel Macron could find himself without a parliamentary majority having to, being forced really to share power with a prime minister from another party. And indeed, this seems something that Mélenchon's voters certainly want. Around 56% of French voters say they want Emmanuel Macron's party to lose the parliamentary elections and be forced into this power-sharing agreement with, um, with another party. Of this 56%, 84% were Mélenchon voters. So you really do see where Jean-Luc Mélenchon's voters are going and what they want ahead of these parliamentary elections, François. Diptyque Laurent, many thanks. We can now cross to uh, Saint-Denis. Wassim Cornet uh, is spending uh, the night with sympathizers of Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Wassim, I believe you have a guest. Yeah, good evening, Mark. Uh, we are with uh, a lot of people, a lot of young voters who uh, are part of that uh, organization, an organization called Get Up. And just like the most residents of this uh, wider Saint Saint Denis department, a lot of them voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon. We did hear an audible sigh of relief when the face of Emmanuel Macron showed up on on uh, on screen at eight o'clock, showing the results. Uh, some people telling us that they did not expect to see the far right at that, that, that getting that many votes, and some people saying they were expecting the result to be a lot closer. I'm with a young voter. Uh, note to our viewers, I'll be carrying out the, uh, the, the conversation in French and our, I'll let our translators back in the newsroom do work their magic in English. Um, Good Celia. evening, Celia. Uh, so Emmanuel you Macron. voted for Emmanuel Macron? Macron a été réélu, donc. Macron won the second round. The far right won't be in the uh, presidential palace for the next five years. Is that a mission accomplished? Well, mission accomplished? I really wouldn't say that because I didn't vote for Macron. I voted against Le Pen. Because I don't believe in President Macron's program or platform 100%. So it's a, a victory for want of a better word. But really, I am still quite concerned uh, with Marine Le Pen because she won 10 points compared to last election. So it is, it is uh, yeah, some, somewhat of a victory, but really it's a... 
quand on, on a reçu it's les chiffres de l'Ipsos, quand on additionne so when we look at the figures from Ipsos with the abstention votes, roughly 35% of people didn't turn out. So what does that mean? Well, it's pretty much the same as what we saw five years ago, and I really think it represents the fact that people don't believe in the system, there's a lack of trust, and people in France, they don't believe in the presidential candidates anymore. And I think that's a way of showing that we disagree with the system, simply because the candidates don't really represent us, and they don't really protect our interests. So there you have it, a general impression of, again, a sigh of relief, but obviously people here are not thrilled with that final result, the re-election of, of Emmanuel Macron. Wassim Cornet in uh, Saint-Denis, thank you very much. All right, uh, well, let's cross uh, now over to uh, Delano de Souza, who is uh, at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. On the winning side, uh, uh, with the supporters of Emmanuel Macron, uh, we uh, have no news yet, Delano, of uh, the, the incumbent uh, leaving the Edizé Palace to make his way where you are uh, for uh, his uh, victory uh, speech. Now, there's a lot of talk on this set here about legislative elections. We're still in the presidential election where you are. A presidential election is a popularity contest, and uh, where you're with people who support the, uh, the incumbent. It is a popularity contest that Emmanuel Macron has won today. He secured his second term in office, but we have to look forward to those legislative elections because not everyone who voted for Emmanuel Macron today will necessarily support him uh, in uh, those legislative, those parliamentary elections here in France uh, because. Jean-Luc Mélenchon fared so well during the first round uh, of the vote. We could see uh, a lot of people vote uh, towards the left, so if, if Emmanuel Macron won't have uh, his, uh, won't have a free hand, uh, so to speak. I'm here with some supporters, an elderly couple who've actually come out uh, to, to in support of Emmanuel Macron. Good evening. Yes. How Thank are you, you feeling today? I'm very happy for You're me. Very happy? Yes, very, very happy with my wife we are to the, tonight, and they support. Uh, Macron. Macron is a, a, a man for peace and he has for Europe, Union of Europe, and uh, also he has not for extreme down, not for extreme down, and uh, the, uh, not for discrimination. Me, I am support. Do you think? Do you think Emmanuel Macron can can unite the country now? Do you think Emmanuel Macron can unite the country? I don't understand. Do you think Emmanuel Macron can unite the country? Do you not this country? Unite the country. Yes, he can. Yes, it's very very. For me, it's to uh, for union for all for for two people who live in Paris and France and uh, all to. All the country. Thank you very much. So, Thank so. you. This is my, uh, my wife also. We think, uh, think the same. My wife also and me. We support Macron for us. For us. Thank you. Thank you very much. The the. The atmosphere here is extremely festive. They have a DJ playing. I can barely hear you with these, these special headphones on, but um, we'll be bringing you Emmanuel Macron's speech. He's on his way here, so he will be speaking within the hour, hopefully. Delano de Souza at uh, the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, yeah, there's uh, that's the winning side, Jean-Noël Barraud. Uh, of course, uh, there is this stigma that uh, Emmanuel Macron carries around with him, uh, This uh, that's stuck. Uh, president of the rich. So how, can he reinvent himself in his second mandate? No, so well, the president of the rich is what uh, some of our opponents have been willing to say. But mm -hmm. we, uh, and we, we, what we, what we've done has benefited a lot of the uh, of the poor uh, categories of the population of the French people, and uh, we are going to keep uh, doing that for more justice in in France. So I think if he's reelected, it's also that there is a sense across the country, even though there are opponents, there are different projects that have been uh, proposed. There is a sense that uh, he is working for more justice for more unity as uh, as this man on the, at the floor the, at the at the foot of the Eiffel Tower was saying so uh, of course it's uh, t tonight it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 
there is a little bit of joy uh, among the proponents of Emmanuel Macron because there has been a lot of people working hard uh, for this campaign to, to happen and there has been a, a lot of support throughout the country and, uh, and uh, until uh, the very end it was not clear that uh, th this would be a win and so right. Sorry to interrupt you, we're just going to cross very quickly to Florence Villemino at Marine Le Pen's headquarters, Florence Florence, can you hear us? You're in the middle of the crowd. We're with you. Oh, yeah, I can, I can hear you. I'm in the middle. Basically, uh, Marie Le Pen is right behind me. Uh, you might see there's this huge crowd of journalists right here. I just, got, I just got pushed out of the way. I'm trying to see what's happening behind me. She, uh, she came down probably about five minutes ago to go do, I guess, kind of a lap of the room. Uh, she got close to that bar we were telling you about, uh, and now she's... She went a little bit to the other side of the room near the podium. Big crowd of journalists, big crowd of supporters. Uh, I can't see exactly what's happening because there's so, so many cameras, it must be said. Uh, but she was taking some uh, photos, chit-chatting with supporters, and now she's uh, going out of the room. This, of course, she just she came down, gave her speech, and then left uh, that concession speech uh, where she vowed to continue fighting uh, for the French uh, and where she said that the next battle is going to be the parliamentary uh, elections. Just what is the future for Marine Le Pen in politics? That's unclear for now, but she's certainly soaking up uh, the attention uh, tonight, and uh, lots of journalists from around the world have come to report about the second round here uh, for the Rassemblement National. It seems like she might actually be coming back in this direction uh, as well. We'll, uh, we'll keep following you. Uh, we'll keep following her for you, of course. Uh, if she comes back into the room, we'll let you know. Well, so we know stay safe in the middle of uh, the crowd. Uh, Martina, I, I, I want to ask you uh, something that Marine Le Pen has said in her speech, uh, the problem with the electoral system for the parliamentary election. That's uh, something that Jean-Luc Mélenchon has always complained about. Emmanuel Macron said he would try to reform it uh, because there is a problem. You have, uh, you know... Emmanuel Macron also said that he would appoint a commission to look at the issue. No, he said he couldn't make it happen. But there's a problem. There's a democratic problem in France because yes. you have uh, three blocs. We talked about it. And you have only one heavily represented in parliament. Do you think that he will listen to your... Well, I can say anything about Emmanuel. He disappointed us so much that everything he says now... Everyone has a second chance. No? Well... We're waiting for it, because everything he says just seems like a lie, so now you saw the polls, you heard the people, we're not listening to him, we're waiting to see what he's going to do. And that's where it's going to be hard for him, because he's good to talk but not to act. Now, I hope especially that he's not going to have the majority, and that things are going to change, because we saw these five years, last five years, that when he's alone, under, without any control, he does... Well, crazy things. People go to, to on the streets, they protest, and he just fights them. So it will be good that he has some a little a little bit of some control to first not do things so badly as he did, but also that French people have finally the feeling that they are totally represented, whether it's from my side or from the side of Jean-Luc Mélenchon or even from the side of the other candidates who are real less represented. Can you, do you want to respond? Because this is the second no, time no, she, no. she mentions violence. I mean, it's not that uh, disagreements over policy, it's about violence. No, no, so I, 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 I fully agree. In fact, we've tried to push uh, proportional voting through uh, Congress, but the, the Senate has opposed the, the bill when it came. But I, I truly believe, and François Bayrou, the president of the Modem Party, of the Democratic Movement, uh, to which I belong, has said that for a long time. If we want to have a parliament that is fully representative of all uh, sensibilities, all views across the, the, the French nation, we need to have more proportional voting. And... Uh, Emmanuel Macron has said that he is in favor of that, but that he wants to build consensus across political parties to achieve uh, this reform. So we'll, we'll work on that, and I really hope that we, we can do that. And the best, the best sort of uh, uh, proof that we are in favor of that is that we've pushed uh, when, when there was a risk that Marine Le Pen would not get the signatures, the, the, 
uh, that she needed the 500, 500 signatures, signatures to yes. be on the ballot. We've pushed so that uh, even people that were not agreeing with Marine Le Pen could actually provide uh, the, their, their, their signature, their, their endorsement to Marine Le Pen so that she could run. And this is really needed. We need to have a parliament that is, uh, we need to have elections where everyone can run and we need to have a parliament that is very representative of the diversity of the French people. And we heard uh, Léa Chamboncel, uh, uh, a term used in his speech by uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Again, we're starting to anticipate because the, the two, two rounds of elections are over and two are coming up in June with the legislative elections. He talked about being the representative of the third estates. That's language borrowed from the French Revolution. Uh, the idea that uh, he, he, the left represents working class people. Of course, we've seen in large parts of France where it's the national front now that gets the votes of the working classes. Yeah, we were talking about it on the first part of the of the of the show. As I was saying early on, I have the impression that uh, the main political parties of the left wing did not have the right answers to poor workers and poor people in France, and they were they had the feeling that they were sort of abandoned to a more, let's say, um, social democratic. Uh, view of the polit of the uh, Socialist Party, and it's true that uh, for a while these these electoral block blocks, sorry, didn't vote for it. The, Just going to interrupt you wing. because we have images of uh, the uh, French president, the incumbent, making his way from the Elysee Palace on the right bank. He's about to cross the uh, Alexander the Third Bridge across from the Invalides, making his way to uh, the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and these are live images of Emmanuel Macron making, uh, after a uh, winning victory some 53 minutes ago, Léa Chamboncel. What are the words that uh, Emmanuel Macron will have to use in his speech uh, to, uh, was the question we put earlier to uh, Martina, to, to, uh, to unify, to unite the, the country? I think it's going to be rather complicated for him because what we see is that he didn't talk to the left um, voters for five years, almost, um, pretending that he was uh, neither left, neither right. But what we see is that he was rather right, I would say. Also, because like the former president, Nicolas Sarkozy, is supporting him. And I guess this is uh, not, a, not a, a simple detail. I mean, it's, it's pub, public oh, no, policy. Right. Excuse me. Let, let me finish, please. His public policy is rather right win, we can tell, also because, you know, in his government, as soon as he got into office, he got um, Bruno Le Maire, that is a uh, right wing, he got uh, Gérald Darmanin, that is also right wing, he got, uh, he got um, Edouard Philippe, that is also right wing, he got a lot of right wing people in his government, so it's, uh, it's a signal that is rather doing a right wing pu public policy, I would say. So I think it's going to be very hard for him to keep the left voters that voted for him, but by default again for most of them. So I think if he wants and needs to change something is to try to work on these very progressist ideas that he, he came up with in 2017 and that seduced part of the left, left voters and don't seduce them anymore. We're watching images of uh, Emmanuel Macron's motorcade uh, making its way uh, through the left bank and uh, he's making a stop, Mark Perlman, before heading uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Eiffel Tower where uh, that victory party is taking place. Looks like um, he's at the Prime Minister's office. It looks like, uh, yes, it's, yes, I think it's Matignon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I recognize the, uh, uh, yes, the entrance of Matignon, which is where the Prime Minister is. Uh, Jean Castex is his Prime Minister. Whether he will continue is uh, a question mark. Is the Prime Minister going to resign tonight? How does it work? It depends. They can decide. Uh, there have been rumors that he would resign immediately. Emmanuel Macron recently said that he might continue for a, uh, a few days. Uh, but obviously, there are the legislative elections coming in uh, two months. There will be a change of Prime Minister definitely at uh, that time. But we'll have uh, to see. In the meantime, I'm just going to mention that uh, congratulations uh, for Emmanuel Macron have come all across uh, Europe. Uh, the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the EU Council, Charles Michel, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, the Dutch Prime Minister and the Italian uh, Prime uh, Ministers are congratulating uh, Emmanuel Macron for his win, saying it's a win for France. It's also a win for uh, Europe. I imagine uh, you are smiling. 
Of course. <laughs> Why? Uh, because I don't think that's such a win. He spent so much time with Europe, uh, bashing out French people's rights. He's spent his whole campaign not talking to French people, not talking to us. He hid from us, actually. He didn't make a real campaign. And he was only talking about Europe and what he's going to do for Europe. But we, no matter what he's going to do for France. And he's reelected tonight, but we still don't know what he's going to do for us. We only know what he's going to do for himself and for Europe. So, well, now it is what it is. But we're counting on him to really act for once. He did not in the first five years. Now he has five years to finally do something. 58.2% of the French citizens uh, voting for Emmanuel Macron in the second round. We saw live images there a moment ago of uh, his finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, on the podium waiting for uh, the incumbent to come for his uh, victory speech. One final question uh, for you, uh, uh, Jean-Noël Barreau. Uh, again, what's, what are the next six weeks about now? What's going to be the issue? Well, the, the issue is going to start uh, uh, the second term. And uh, this, this calls for pre pre preparation of the uh, Are, parliamentary yeah. elections, formation of the government, and, uh, st you know, working. But what do the French and, want? And what do the French want from well, their leaders? The French, the French want peace. And so it means that Emmanuel Macron is going to have uh, to keep working to try and bring peace to Ukraine, what he's been doing. And in, fa in fact, I believe that the French people have understood that Europe could be a protection for them with the vaccine, with the, um, uh, the recovery plan and with the sanctions against Ukraine that indeed the national rally has not uh, voted in favor of. But the French people know that he has a lot to do in Europe because we have war uh, at uh, uh, very, very close uh, to France. And then they also are expecting that he acts uh, strongly to protect their purchasing power. Uh, because the increase, the inflation and increase in the energy prices call for uh, action right now. And so he'll be working on that in the next coming weeks. Jean-Noël Barreau, and uh, you'll be hitting the campaign trail. I want to thank you for, for being with us. I want to thank as well Martina Gabalica, uh, Léa Chambosel, host of the Popol Politics podcast as well, for, for being with us here on election night uh, on France 24 as we count down to the 9 p.m. hour. And we saw Mark Perlman, uh, the French president, make his way uh, to, toward, for that victory speech, a re-election speech. We haven't seen one in two decades. Yes, and uh, we haven't heard one in two decades, and it's the first time, once again, uh, that a president with a sitting majority in Parliament is uh, re-elected. It ha happened uh, for Jacques Chirac, for François Mitterrand, but in Parliament, the opposition was in power. So you had this French-style cohabitation uh, at the time, which probably helped their re-election. Emmanuel Macron becomes the first one not uh, to need uh, that to be uh, re-elected. Uh, the polls were uh, correct, let's put it this way. Uh, they predicted such a, a victory. Uh, we'll just uh, go back and look at those uh, figures uh, from our partner uh, Ipsos. Emmanuel Macron scoring 58.2% uh, uh, of the votes, according to our estimates, versus 41.2% uh, uh, for uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, let's just remember that in 2017, Emmanuel Macron uh, earned 66% of the votes versus 34% uh, of the votes. It's 9 p.m. in Paris. It's election night. You're watching France 24. It was exactly one hour ago when the polls closed.
As we were watching uh, very rare images of uh, some of uh, the ministers of Emmanuel Macron uh, singing, uh, we'll look at the results. 58.2% for Emmanuel Macron, 41.8% for Marine Le Pen compared to five years ago. Uh, this is a smaller victory, 66 versus uh, 34 uh, in 2017. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a clear uh, victory uh, for Emmanuel Macron, and this is probably why you had the likes of uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, uh, who is the foreign minister, who is not someone who usually uh, claps his hand and sings. Cl uh, Clément Bonne, the Europe minister, the justice minister, Eric uh, dupont moretti waiting impatiently as Emmanuel Macron makes his way to uh, the foot of the Eiffel Tower. You're we're seeing live images of uh, his car and uh, obviously the gendarme around him. Yeah, mo the motorcade making its way down Avenue Bosquet directly towards where France 24's Claire Pacalin is. There's a motorcade coming your way, Claire. It's got the winner of the uh, 2022 French presidential election in it. That's right. I'm sure you can see behind me, Francois, the Eiffel Tower is sparkling as it does at 9 p.m. tonight. The crowd behind me are getting warmer and warmer. They're ready for Emmanuel Macron to arrive and speak to them. We are expecting him, though, to take a humble, not too victorious tone. He has won tonight, but the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen did better than she did in 2017. And even then, when he made his victory speech, it was at the Louvre five years ago, he tried to strike a humble tone. He told the people there that he would do his best over the next five years to make sure that French people never had a reason to vote for extreme candidates again. Well, five years later, he's not been able to keep that promise. So he is arriving very, very shortly here at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. He'll be making his victory speech, but he'll be trying to sound not too victorious. Claire Pacalin will be crossing to you, or rather break in when you see him arrive. We'll be crossing uh, right back to you. Uh, I want to welcome for this uh, 9 o'clock hour, one hour after the polls have closed uh, here in France, uh, member of the European Parliament, Véronique Trier-Lenoir of uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, Renew Europe bloc, it's called in the European Parliament. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks as well to uh, Claire Lejeune. One campaign ends, another begins. You're on the campaign trail now. A national spokesperson for Jean-Luc Mélenchon's uh, uh, La uh, France Unbowed, uh, exactly. La France Thank Insoumise. You. Thank you for, for being with us. Artus Gallier, you're also on the Even. campaign trail. I am indeed. He's a candidate to represent the French abroad uh, in northern uh, Europe of the conservative Les Républicains Party. Uh, thanks, thanks for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Véronique Trier-Lenoir, um, Emmanuel Macron uh, becomes the first French president re-elected with a sitting majority, makes history in that sense, but four out of ten voters, more than four out of ten voters, chose the far right. What's your feeling? Well, my feeling is uh, relief because it is a clear victory, if not a large one. Relief for my country. Uh, who is escaping the far-right danger. Relief for Europe. As a member of the European Parliament, I can see that most European countries are happy with us, most of them. And because Europe has been one of the main objectives of Emmanuel Macron. And of course, a relief not very far away from the European, the, the, the European Union, but Ukraine, where the war has been also a challenge for Emmanuel Macron and would have been, of course, a disaster in the hands of Marine Le Pen. Right. Mark Ma Ma Perlman, we're getting an update on the estimate, by the way, of the, yes. of the margin. Yes, the margin is getting uh, a bit larger, uh, 58 Point five uh, percent for Emmanuel Macron versus uh, forty-one point uh, five percent. This is according to our partner Ipsos, a seventeen-point uh, lead, uh, which is even larger uh, than what the polls had uh, predicted. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Europe. We saw a number of European leaders congratulate uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, the last one is the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, who. Uh, said that he is looking forward uh, to continue uh, cooperation uh, with France. Uh, so have said 
uh, the Italian Prime Minister, even the British Prime Minister, uh, the head of the EU Commission, the head of the EU uh, Council, um, there was, in the, the where you work, obviously, uh, there was concern over a Marine Le Pen win. Yes, absolute concern, because even if she has changed the wording, not saying anymore that she wanted to leave uh, the European Union, the fact is that all her program says that it would be a Frexit very soon. So there was a lot of concern in the European Parliament, not only in my political group, but also in other pro-European pro groups. And we have seen, not only do we see today congratulations, but we have seen vocal alerts from some main uh, European leaders asking French people not to have the far right coming uh, at the government. So I think that, again, it was something like a referendum pro or against Europe. And French people have said yes, and I'm very proud of it. Claire Lejeune, um, let me ask you, uh, today, do you, do you want to tell us who you cast your ballot for? Um, no, I won't, but um, today... <laughs> or did you cast a ballot? I cast a ballot, yes. Huh? That's one indication. Um, but the, the line that um, La France Insoumise uh, had is not one vote for Marine Le Pen. And tonight it is huge relief to see that once again we have managed to keep the far right out of power. Because indeed, even though um, Marine Le Pen had toned down and kind of sanitized her image these past years, the far right is still a danger for our democracy, for our republic, and so, yes, there is relief that she's not in power tonight. But having that said, during these five years, the far right has gained momentum, and I believe because we had not only Marine Le Pen in this election, we also had Éric Zemmour, who was kind of a even further far right version um, of, uh, of Marine Le Pen's platform. Um, and I, I believe that the, the policies that um, Emmanuel Macron has led in this country during these five years bear a part of responsibility in, in this phenomenon. So we, it's really well, how so? Because, how do, why is that? Because it's been a policy that has been destructive socially. And so he that, that not, makes people vote far right? Um, social distress in a country, and he has not actively um, fought against the ideas that the far right um, has, has been uh, casting in the country. So, yes, there, there's, we can have a reflection on the fact that today uh, is very different to the scenario that we had five years ago, and the margins so much closer. So, it's, um, it's not, uh, um, we do not rejoice tonight and we believe also that this election is far from over because uh, after the first round what emerged is a new political scenery in France completely. There are three blocs today. There's the neoliberal bloc with Emmanuel Macron, there's the far right bloc with uh, Marine Le Pen and Éric Zemmour and there's the popular left-wing vote um, with the Union Populaire and Jean-Luc Mélenchon and we believe that in the next ele election we can um, send a maximum of representatives in the National Assembly and potentially even uh, make uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon Prime Minister in this country. All right, and as we see those images of uh, people parting at the foot of the Eiffel Tower waiting for uh, the victorious candidate to speak, uh, Mark Perman, you were mentioning it uh, a moment ago with Véronique Trier-Lenoir, the rest of Europe's been watching this election. Yes, and we're actually going to cross to a country where uh, there's probably no music playing. Sadly, uh, the war in Ukraine has cast a shadow over uh, this presidential campaign, prompting Emmanuel Macron to accuse Marine Le Pen of being in the pocket of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. We can now cross uh, to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, with our correspondent, Gulliver Krag. Uh, Gulliver, because of her pro-Russian leanings, Marine Le Pen is barred uh, from entering Ukraine. Uh, and uh, Vladimir Zelensky said in an interview just before the election that he would be happy to continue uh, his relationship with Emmanuel Macron. So I assume there is a sigh of relief in Kiev, seeing the results of the French election. 
Absolutely, yes. A huge sigh of relief in Kyiv this evening. This French election was pretty closely watched in Ukraine, really, especially considering everything that's going on in this country, because people really felt that if Marine Le Pen were to be elected, it could be very, very bad news for Ukraine in terms of the support that Ukraine is getting from Western allies. And in some very concrete ways, you know, Marine Le Pen recognized the pseudo-referendum that Russia held in Crimea in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea from um, Ukraine, a referendum that was widely regarded and internationally as absolutely illegal, held at gunpoint and with the results pretty much fabricated. Marine Le Pen said that she didn't see any reason to doubt the legitimacy of the result. And this is at a time when Russia is apparently proposing to organize very soon, actually, referendums in areas of southern Ukraine that its forces currently control. There would be a fear that if Marine Le Pen had been president of France, she might have wanted to recognize them as well, and also, of course, that she would have wanted to um, perhaps not immediately cancel the sanctions against Russia, but certainly not agree to applying any new ones, and that she might well have not wanted to continue supplying arms uh, to Ukraine. Uh, now the Kiev uh, authorities are going to be wanting to put pressure on France to keep up the supply of arms and to keep up the sanctions on Russia, and in particular to move towards an embargo on oil and perhaps even gas imports, something that uh, Ukrainian uh, leaders um, said that they understood that Emmanuel Macron, under the electoral pressure facing Marine Le Pen, campaigning, of course, on, uh, on the cost of living in France and the cost of um, fuel is, of course, an important part of that, uh, that he could not really advocate for something like that during this election campaign, but that maybe now that this is over or perhaps would wait until the uh, parliamentary elections in France are over, but that then France might be persuaded to go ahead uh, with these uh, embargoes on uh, Russian imports, of, uh, on, on, on imports from Russia of oil and gas. Gulliver Krag uh, reporting uh, from Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Uh, Arthur Gallier, you're a member of uh, the Conservative uh, Party. There's been obviously a lot of talk that uh, the war in Ukraine was essentially uh, a problem hijacking uh, the uh, campaign. Uh, do you uh, understand that Emmanuel Macron spent a lot of time on this issue, or uh, do you think that this was indeed a problem that ended up hurting your candidate. Mm -hmm. I think we, we can't really we, we can't regret it. I mean, given the scale of atrocities uh, and the war that has been happening in Ukraine, and I would like to extend our warmest thoughts to all our Ukrainian friends. Uh, I mean, this came within the context of the presidential election, and all the candidates had to deal with it. So it was one important part uh, of it, uh, but I don't think it massively changed the results of the presidential election. Right, but your candidate at some point, Valérie Pécresse, who ended up with a historical catastrophe, let's put it this way, 4.7%. She said the election was going to be stolen again, like in 2017. Why, why did she say that? So, I mean, she, she was referring to the uh, judicial accusations that took place in 2017 uh, against uh, François Fillon at the time. Uh, but here she was more referring to the overall context. And my fear in this overall presidential election was that between uh, the COVID crisis, which only really ended towards the end of January, and indeed the Ukrainian crisis, we didn't talk about all the very important issues for the future of our country in an open and democratic way as, as we should have. We didn't talk in, uh, in, in extended or in, in details about education, about the environment, about all the social factors in, in our country, which is unfortunate. But now we have the parliamentary elections upcoming. Uh, I'll be defending our values uh, for Northern Europe, uh, pr promoting interesting proposals and projects for French people living in Northern Europe and as will all uh, candidates for La Republica everywhere in France. The debate can now continue in a very uh, reasonable way and uh, we'll see what the French decide in, uh, in a month's time. Do you think uh, that there should be a coalition between you two at the legislative election? The former uh, President Nicolas Sarkozy is apparently negotiating with Emmanuel Macron exactly that. I see oh, you're smiling. Well, I have no precise information. So what I know is that uh, they are common feelings, common wordings, but I would not, you know, I would not bet on anything. I, I, I would like to come back to what you said. Of course, we had a sanitary crisis, which made us all think about health, which is a very important topic. Afterwards, we had this terrible crisis and war in Ukraine, which made us think about peace and about the role of Europe in the world. So I disagree on the fact that 
many uh, very strong topics were not addressed. They were, they overcame some others, but they were really on the table. And this was part of the campaign. Understand, except in my view, by the President Macron and to his campaign only about three weeks before the first round uh, is really a way to justify uh, the lack of implication maybe in the overall debate. And once he was against Marie Le Pen, I mean, uh, given the absurdity, in my view, of Marie Le Pen's project, it was, in my view, too easy for him in a way. And when you look at the uh, debate between the two candidates uh, on Wednesday evening, it was very clear. And Marie Le Pen didn't manage to talk about all the uh, the, the immense fractures that uh, exist today in France. Uh, I mean, we've spent five years uh, really struggling against all this with the biggest social movement since May, uh, May 1968, with the Gilets Jaunes movement. And uh, we didn't go enough into detail, so I think the parliamentary elections will be the right moment to do so. All right, and uh, we're uh, going to cross. Uh, we've been to Kiev. We'll cross as well to Brussels. France 24's correspondent is uh, Dave Keating. Um, Dave, uh, I'm reading a tweet uh, from the German Chancellor gushing. Uh, your constituents sent a strong commitment to Europe uh, today. Uh, how awkward would it have been if the sitting rotating president of the European Council had been voted out of office this Sunday evening? Yes, it would have been awkward, particularly considering who he would have been replaced with. I mean, people were very anxious about this here in Brussels. So you could see the congratulations come in very quick. Uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, head of this uh, institution behind me, uh, tweeted out a congratulatory message almost immediately. We also saw notes of congratulations from Olaf Scholz, as you mentioned, who actually intervened ahead of the election to co-write an op-ed with the prime ministers of Portugal and Spain, urging the French people not to to vote for the far right in the presidential election. We've had uh, Mario Draghi, the prime minister of Italy, congratulate Macron. It's not just been friends, it's also been foes. Uh, British prime minister Boris Johnson also congratulated uh, Macron. Now, I was watching the results at a bar just around the corner from here, the European Commission headquarters. It's the same spot where I watched the election result in 2017. The mood is really different this time. Uh, that time, people were incredibly nervous. You could see it on their faces. Uh, they had just lived through the surprise results of Brexit and Trump in 2016. And when that result came in in 2017, people were crying here. They were that relieved. This time, a much more muted reaction. Uh, people are obviously quite relieved, and they're relieved to see in particular the large uh, 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 gap between Macron and Le Pen, much larger than polls, uh, some of the, the worst polls were suggesting. But it is a kind of muted response. It's, it's you know, relief. And now they're kind of going back to their, their lives, I think. Shred, it's, a, it's a good night for uh, the pro-EU camp, what with uh, Slovenia's general election uh, taking place as well this Sunday and uh, going against right-wing populists. Um, Claire Lejeune, uh, thanks Dave Keating in Brussels uh, for that. Uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, has his view of Europe evolved? When you look at the pandemic and when you look at the climate emergency and the fact that European nations pooling together, uh, especially when it comes to having to wean themselves in a hurry off Russian oil and gas? I think it's a mistake to describe the debate as being um, only a question of pro-European Union or anti-European uh, Union. Um, what our stance is on, on this issue is to say the European Union that we have built these last decades is essentially a, a market and we lack a political uh, European Union, which means that um, there are many things that happen in France, like the liberalization of train rails and things like that, that have been destructive. Right, but the pooling and of purchases on vaccines, the fact that they're concerting together on what to do about Ukraine, is that a good thing or there not? There are many ways of making countries work together. Um, having this European Union is not the, the best way to go about it. What we are saying is we want to transform um, in depth the European Union we have currently and take it out of its liberal um, axis because when you look at the, the European treaties it's essentially um, putting together a huge market and today we know that the social crisis, that the environmental crisis, that the climate crisis are linked to these um, liberal mechanisms to, to the fact that more and more uh, it's market mechanisms that are controlling our lives. Veronique Trier-Lenoir, you heard Dave Keating, our Brussels correspondent, say 
in 2017. There were tears of joy in, in Brussels after uh, the trauma for the people there of uh, Brexit and Donald Trump. This time around, not the case. Uh, he, Emmanuel Macron back then was the 39 or 40 year old fresh faced new thing. He's not new anymore. Uh, is it going to be harder this time around? Of course it is, but something has so much changed in the European Union. We have uh, voted and we are implementing the Green Deal, the environmental policy at the European Union level. As you very well said, we have been able to be in enough solidarity to buy and purchase vaccines all together and to have the resilience plan uh, with a mutual debt taken by all 27 countries. And furthermore, we are now working all together against the Ukraine war by sanctions, by humanitarian and medical and financial help. So what is it if it is not the European Union becoming much more than a market? Right. Uh, Claire Lejeune, I, I want to go back because you mm -hmm. said Emmanuel Macron had favor of the far right during his mandate. Mm -hmm. When I read the results of the first round, it strikes mm -hmm. me that he has also favored your party. Um, I think um, what this, these five years have taught us is that this idea that um, you can have a neither left nor right political platform is actually false. Um, his platform has been a right wing neoliberal platform and um, during the first uh, first moments of his uh, of his uh, time in power there's been this very strong social movement for yellow vests and that was all around the cost of living it was around very and there's a lot of social anger that has come about during these five years so what Emmanuel Macron has spurred by his policies is a lot of social distress and this social distress in in uh, in this election has has uh, taken the forms of voting for Jean-Luc Mélenchon and you can see the turnout for young people the, the turnout for work, the working class has been very strong for Jean-Luc Mélenchon and in the second round it has transformed into a stronger vote for the far right and we have a comment from uh, the uh, first round loser Eric Zemmour who got 7% of the far right's vote saying nationalist movements Mark Perlman must join forces yes and we can now cross to the headquarters of uh, Marine Le uh, I believe we are with uh, one of Marine Le Pen's uh, key lieutenants, Thierry Mariani, who is standing by. I hope you can hear us. I try to hurt it. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, what's your comment on the result? Are you disappointed or do you think it was an honorable result for Marine Le Pen? Both. Honestly, of course, we are disappointing because uh, we wasn't uh, on this election just to run. We was on this election to win because uh, we are thinking that for my country, it will be uh, absolutely necessary to change. But uh, the score of Marine Le Pen uh, is uh, better than five years ago, nearly 10 points more. But honestly, uh, it's not enough, of course, to win. And we are very we were very surprised by the last two weeks of campaign because these last two weeks on uh, all the system, the press, the association, all the institution explain that if we Marine Le Pen win, uh, it will be disaster. For example, you, you, she, you saw this house will be uh, go down and uh, it was uh, elected uh, on the fear for Mr. Macron, not by enthusiasm. Right. Uh, one uh, criticism that uh, Emmanuel Macron put at uh, Marine Le Pen was that she was in the pocket of Vladimir uh, Putin. Uh, you have often advocated uh, closer ties to Russia. Do you believe it cost her partially the election? Honestly, I think uh, there is absolutely no impact on this election. Uh, you know, during two months, I saw all the time French each day. Some people ask me questions about Russia very rare. And look the situation. Who was the first guest of Mr. Macron when he was elected as a president? Mr. Putin. Who was the last guest of Mr. Macron when he was on his eastern residence in the Côte d'Azur? Mr. Putin. You know why we want another politics about, uh, with Russia? Uh, Marine Le Pen, in fact, is in the line of General de Gaulle. Uh, 
I'm sorry to, to tell it, but we are now, after British uh, take, did Brexit, we are the last country in Europe to be present on the permanent uh, Council, uh, Security Council in the United Nations. We are the only one to have uh, nuclear power, and the tradition of my country is to have uh, equal politics between uh, United States and Russia. Of course, United States is our best friend, our best friend. But you know, we don't change geography. Russia is a part of Europe. And uh, in this moment, I dream about president who give the fuel to the peace and not give the fuel to the war. And unfortunately, I think with Mr. Macron is that. Thank you, Thierry Mariani, for being with us live on France 24 on election night. Thierry Mariani of Marine Le Pen's national uh, rally, member of the European uh, Parliament. We're seeing live images of Emmanuel Macron. It's a bit of a false start earlier, Mark Perlman, because I think the, the motorcade we saw earlier was perhaps the one going to pick up the prime minister, not the president. That is definitely the president, as we can see. Yeah, we, can, we, we saw images <laughs> of uh, Jean Castex arrive, and we realized why the motorcade stopped in front uh, of Matignon. But, Wrong uh, motorcade. Okay, here yeah. we got the right one. And it is uh, uh, on the left bank now, making its way into that park that's uh, beneath the Eiffel Tower. Emmanuel Macron coming from the presidential palace, which is across the River Seine. Uh, just a very brief reaction, Véronique uh, Trier-Lenoir, uh, to what you heard from your fellow member of the European Parliament on Ukraine. What I heard from a fellow member who uh, belongs to a group uh, which definitely voted against all the sanctions or helps or humanitarian uh, actions uh, towards Ukraine, who uh, participated to a specific mission to Russia uh, some years ago to make sure that the ally Putin was here. So it's really unbelievable to hear that Emmanuel Macron is the friend of Putin. Emmanuel Macron is doing his work of the French president, having relationships with other leaders. But the group Thierry Mariani belongs to is a group which really is working hand right. in hand with Putin. And, and before I turn to you, Arthur Gaillet, let's uh, l pr priority goes to the live images. Uh, there you see Emmanuel Macron arriving at the, his victory party at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. France 24's Delano de Souza is there in the crowd. Delano. That's right, Emmanuel Macron will be uh, speaking any moment now. We've had members of his cabinet who have arrived, uh, including uh, the Prime Minister Jean Castex, the Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire, as well as the government spokesperson Gabriel Attal. They've taken their seats. The DJ has actually lowered uh, the music uh, so the president can, can come on stage. It'll be interesting to see what Emmanuel Macron has to say. Even though he secured 58.8% of the vote, uh, he still needs to reach out to people who wouldn't necessarily have voted for him as their first choice, most notably people who voted for the for the socialists or the far left. Uh, and we will need to see how what he says tonight, whether he's going to really unite the country uh, with his speech in a few moments time. Delano de Souza, before I, I turn to uh, Arthur Gallier, we have a new estimate of uh, the result. Again, as the night wears on, Mark Perlman, these estimates become firm results as we count the ballots. Yes, we're still uh, with estimates. Uh, later tonight, in the middle of the night, there'll be the official uh, results, but generally they're very, very close to the estimates. Here's the latest estimates from our partner Ipsos. It gives uh, Emmanuel Macron 58.8 uh, percent versus 41.2 percent against Marine Le Pen. We started at 58.2, so it's uh, the lead is growing. It's 17.6 uh, percent exactly, so a clear lead. And and the, the the major cities, their polls closed at 8 p.m. Mark, whereas small towns at 7 p.m. The fact that the numbers evolving means that the big cities voted more for Macron than Le Pen? Uh, probably, or at least that they didn't vote for Le Pen. Maybe they abstained, maybe they voted blank. Actually, the estimates that we have are showing uh, that if you add the invalid votes, the blank votes, and the abstention, you're reaching over 34% of uh, the votes. So that's a lot. That's near the record, which was established in 1969, yes, where uh, if you add those three different categories, you had 35.5%. And those were the days, of course, after Gallier, where you had two candidates from the 
moderate right running against one another. Those days are long gone. Absolutely. I, was, I wasn't even born, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, just a quick question, because uh, just to finish on, on, on foreign policy here, I know your party was split over uh, Thierry Mahen. He's formerly from your party. It was split over this question of Russia. Uh, is the argument over now that it's invaded Ukraine? Well, the, the argument is definitely over, and that <clears throat> many people within the party used to be in favor of um, redeveloping relations with Russia, recognizing its stance within Europe. But what the Russian government has done is simply unacceptable, uh, triggering uh, a war like this, like this one. And the many civilian casualties are simply unacceptable. So there is no question here. But if I, if I can continue here, I mean, obviously, uh, as a Republican, I extend my warmest congratulations to Emmanuel Macron for his victory. Uh, but we can't just have a sigh of relief and say, oh, we have at least another five years before potential victory of the far right. The far right yet again broke its record in number of votes. There were 10 million votes difference between Macron and Le Pen five years ago. And now we'll see what the final results are. But we're down to about 5 million votes uh, difference. So we need to really open our eyes on all the concrete social issues that are happening in France and really act about them. We can't just simply push back the next time the, the National Front may uh, reach power. We need to deal with these issues as soon as possible, and that will be one of the big debates in the parliamentary elections. Well, we can now uh, cross uh, the channel and go to our London correspondent, uh, Benedict Pavio. Uh, Emmanuel Macron and Boris Johnson do not always get along, but tonight we heard some words of congratulations from the British Prime Minister. Well, I think uh, the first thing to say is that people are absolutely overjoyed. I'm at the HQ of En Marche and Macron. I'm in very good company because I have with me Alexandre Holroyd, uh, who is uh, the MP in the French Parliament, uh, a very interesting concept that is a reality in France for Northern Europe. And I think let's ask him the question. Boris Johnson has congratulated uh, Mr. Macron uh, about his win, but of course the French and the British, in a sense, sometimes don't get on so well. There are things they have in common and they are things that they get uh, really sort of a lot of cooperation on. How, how do you think this next five years now are going to develop between the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the French President Emmanuel Macron with another five-year term? I think the French and the British have a thousand years of history and there are ups and downs but the truth is that history binds those two countries together for the future. And the truth is that if we look forward, we've got shared challenges, and those shared challenges have to bring shared solutions. So the President has always been very clear that he wants to work with Boris Johnson, he wants to work with the British Parliament to find solutions, concrete solutions to those problems, and that's what he'll do in the next five years. So, as we await the uh, President and, and, and his speech, what would you say is this going to be now? We're going to get over the problems with Brexit now. It's going to be some sort of uh, new relationship between Paris and London, a renewed vigour from the French President so, to try and you know, work even more closely with the British? I think the President has always had this desire. I was by his side in Sandhurst when we signed the Sandhurst Agreement with Theresa May. There's always been a very clear goal. The British are key partners of France. They will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. And the President has been very and abundantly clear that he wants that to remain a reality. Handing back over to you in Paris. Thank you, uh, Benedict. As we watch images of the President holding hands with his wife, Brigitte, and uh, some children uh, just at the foot of the uh, Eiffel Tower. Let, let, let's cross straight to Claire Pacalin, who is there. Claire. Is Emmanuel Macron is walking with his wife Brigitte at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. He's walking towards his supporters now. The music you can hear is Ode to Joy, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. That, of course, is the European Union's anthem. It's the same music that he walked towards the stage to in 2017 when he made his victory speech. You can hear now. The crowd behind me is getting really excited because he's just about to arrive at the crowd. We can take a listen in now.
You've got a vantage point. Can you see the president from where you are? I can just about see the president from where I am because I'm lucky I'm standing up on a raised platform with all the other cameras. So we actually have a pretty good view. He's just arrived at the crowd. We expect him to now start shaking hands. That's something he's been doing a lot of in the last couple of weeks, shaking hands, thanking his supporters for being here tonight as he slowly makes his way up to the stage. The stage is actually in the middle of the crowd of supporters. So the stage is surrounded by people. Of course, when he gets to that stage, he will make his victory speech. Herman, uh, the, uh, the uh, Ode to Joy, just like in 2017 when he was first elected and he made that victory speech at the move. Yes, absolutely. A very symbolic gesture, also a celebration of youth. You saw him arrive uh, with those uh, young people. You also saw him uh, kiss his minister of uh, Europe there on those images, Clément Beaune, the faithful, who he put in that very strategic position. So Emmanuel Macron clearly uh, campaigned on Europe, which can be risky business uh, if the past uh, tells you something uh, in French politics, but uh, he won that bet. Uh, we heard uh, uh, Benedict Pagou in London speaking to your rival for those legislative elections, since you'll be running against Alexander Holgoy in, uh, for, for the legislative elections. Uh, is Macron too going to be good for Franco-British relations? Well, I know I'm candidate. I don't know whether he's actually candidate. He didn't declare himself yet. Ah. So the only thing I hope, it's, it's good to be elected. It's better to actually run a campaign and set out your proposals to be re-elected. That's elected or re-elected. So I started my campaign a few months ago and with everything I want to propose. I mean, my key proposal is really bringing a new railway company in the Channel Tunnel because I think Eurostar's monopoly has lasted for long enough and that will be part of the campaign that I'll be running. So I'm keen to run against all candidates. And, I hope and who will, will be better? Himself. Who will be better for Franco? Will it be better for Franco-British relations than it's been the last few months? Or does that depend more on Boris Johnson than, than Macron? Well, obviously, the uh, MP for Northern Europe, which includes the UK, can play a key role. I'm not British, but I've spent so much time in the UK. I deeply love this country and I feel uh, related to it. So in a way, I feel more British than he is, uh, given the criticism that he addressed to Boris Johnson and the overall British people for the Brexit vote. And coming back to the European issue, I agree with Claire that um, it's, it's a mistake to pitch pro-Europeans against anti-Europeans because what matters really is which kind of Europe do we want. We can't just say, uh, oh, we're pro-European, if you're not with us, you're anti-European. This is binding anti-European people together. And we saw what it gave in the UK with, with the Brexit vote. For example, I'm, I'm profoundly pro-European, but I'm deeply against policies such as the farm to fork policy, which will re reduce uh, agricole, agricole, I mean, uh, production of uh, feed in Europe by 15% and even 20% for cereals, which is, which is ridiculous. And I wouldn't want to support that kind of policy just for the sake of being pro-European. Right. There are more nuances. Let's cross back now to Claire Pacanin. You said it would be a long walk to the podium with, uh, and it's true that we're seeing uh, on our live images uh, the winner of the 2022 French presidential election, Emmanuel Macron, uh, shaking hands uh, with supporters, with ministers, uh, kissing some on the cheek. Uh, as he makes his way towards the podium. How, how close are we to that podium? About halfway there, I'd say. Emmanuel Macron still has a sea of people to get through. Lots and lots of French flags being waved, lots and lots of European flags being waved. He'll soon be meeting up. He's getting closer and closer to the big wigs in the party, the politicians who've supported him over the years. Uh, it's gone silent. What does that mean? The European anthem is no longer playing. What does that mean? I've lost sight of him. He's somewhere in the crowd. Ah, he's right next to the podium now. There's a technician. He's gone onto the stage to check the microphone. So I think very, very shortly we can expect to see Emmanuel Macron getting onto the stage and giving his victory speech. Uh, Claire Lejeune, are you surprised to hear Ode to Joy like five years ago? Is it a good idea to play uh, the European anthem it's not if you're a French president giving a victory speech? It's not surprising. I mean, he's trying to uh, replay the victory um, scenario that, that was uh, five years ago. But I think um, seeing all these pictures, we have to keep in mind that today so many French electors went to vote for Emmanuel Macron not wanting his political platform and being strongly, very strongly opposed to we're his gonna, policies. We're going to go cross over now. And to and, and see as the French president makes his way onto the podium 
uh, to the chance of and one and two and five more years. Thank you, dear friends, fellow citizens, here tonight in Paris and everyone, everywhere in France, in our overseas territories and abroad. Before anything else, let me say thank you. After five years of difficult but happy transformation and exceptional challenges, this day, the 24th of April 2022, a majority amongst us chose to trust me to pilot the Republic for the next five years. I want to thank all of the activists, all of the workers, all of the people along with us for the ride and all of the elected, elected officials who supported me and who made this election possible. I know that you have given so much of your energy, your effort to this endeavor. The truth comes from my heart. Thank you. Thank you. I know what I owe you. Thank you. I want to thank all of the French people, men and women, who at the first and the second round of these presidential elections placed their trust in me so together we can undertake our project to make France more independent, Europe stronger, and through investments and changes continue to implement change that is relevant for everyone by freeing creativity and innovation in our country and making France a great green nation. I also know full well that many people tonight voted for me not to support my ideals, but to block the far right. And I want to thank them tonight. I want to tell them that I understand the duty that comes with that vote for the coming years. I have been entrusted with their sense of duty, their feelings for the Republic and for the differences that have been expressed over the last weeks. I also spare a thought for all of our fellow citizens who did not vote. Their silence means they refuse to choose, and we also need to answer them. And finally, my thoughts go to those who voted for Mrs. Le Pen. I understand her disappointment this evening. No, no booing. From the very beginning, I've said that I don't want to see that. Because 
From now on, I am no longer a candidate for a party, but I am everyone's president. I know that for many of our fellow citizens, people who decided to vote for the far right tonight, I understand their disagreement and the anger that led them to vote for that project, and we need to answer them as well. That will be my responsibility and the responsibility of those around me. Because the votes that were cast today require that we take into account all difficulties in everyone's lives and that we bring effective answers to the anger that was expressed. Fellow citizens, dear friends, today you chose a project that is a humanist one, an ambitious one for the future of our country, for the future of Europe, a Republican project in its values, a social project, a green project, a project based in work and creation, a project that will free our cultural forces, our schools, our entrepreneurs. This project This project is something that I want to bear with strength for the coming years. I am a warden also of the divisions that were expressed and the differences between us. Every day I shall make sure that I respect everyone and will continue to work towards a society that is fairer between everyone and men and women. To achieve this, we're going to need to be ambitious. We're going to be demanding with ourselves because we have so much left to do. And the war in Ukraine is there to remind us that we are going through tragic times. Times in which France must be heard. France must clearly make its choices. And France must anchor its strength in all fields. And we will do just that. And, dear friends, we also need to be careful and respectful because our country is full of division and doubt. Therefore, we must be strong and no one will be left by the wayside. Together, we must work towards that unity, which is the only way through which we can live happier in France and overcome the challenges that will come in the coming years. The coming years will not be easy, for sure, but they will be historic ones, and together we will write that story for the coming generations. My fellow citizens, my fellow citizens, I say this with benevolence and ambition for our country, for all of us. I wish to say that alongside you, looking at the coming five years, we must know that the coming five years will not just be a continuity of what has been in the past, but a new method for five years that will be better for our country, for our youth. Each and every one of us will need to be responsible. 
Each and every one of us will need to be committed because each and every one of us is worth more than the individual. This is what makes the French people such an amazing source of strength that I love so deeply, so intensely. And I am so proud to serve once again. Long live the Republic and long live France. French President Emmanuel Macron with a victory speech uh, after being re-elected his margin of the far right's Marine Le Pen uh, of 58.8% according to our latest Ipsos estimate. Marseillaise uh, at the end, ode to joy at the beginning, Emmanuel Macron's victory speech on election night 2022 here in France. Uh, uh, we heard in that speech Mark Perlman uh, when we pointed and alluded to that 58.8% uh, margin, I believe we have as the latest estimate. Emmanuel Macron saying, a lot of you voted to support my, I not to support my ideas, but to block the far right. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, to those I am beholden. Right, and we saw Emmanuel Macron very close to tears, uh, very emotional in his uh, speech at the end. Uh, it's not very often that you see him uh, that way. He was clearly uh, relieved, uh, probably, uh, and he did address those who did not vote and those who voted for Marine Le Pen, stopping the crowd from booing, saying, I'm indebted to all the French, including them. And he used the word, Emmanuel Macron, you hear him talk about ambition, transformation, I want to make the planet greener, but he also used the word benevolence. And this is something he's been accused of not having enough. So he said the five All right, years. Choosing, choosing his language carefully, let's cross to uh, Claire Pacalin uh, on the tail end of that speech, uh, where, yeah, we saw a very emotional Emmanuel Macron, as Mark was saying. Certainly, and he was closing his eyes as the Marseillaise, the French national anthem, was sung just then by that opera singer. The crowds now are already beginning to disperse. This is not going to be a late one, I don't think, the Champ de Mars. Macron and his wife, Brigitte, have left the stage already just behind me. That speech was certainly poignant for some people in the crowd because I did speak to people earlier who told me, yes, this was a victory, but it was a bitter one because the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen 
did better than she did five years ago. She got closer to winning the presidency here in France. So certainly Emmanuel Macron has a lot of bridges to build over the next five years, and not least over the next five years, but over the next couple of months as we look ahead to those parliamentary elections in June. Claire Pacalin reporting uh, from the Champ de Mars at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. She was on the platform overseeing the crowd. Inside the crowd is Delano de Souza. Uh, Delano, how did people react to Emmanuel Macron's short and emotional speech? It was an incredibly short speech for Emmanuel Macron, but one where he sort of reached out uh, to everyone, uh, even those people who didn't vote for him, those who voted for the far left, those who voted for the far right. And he said tonight he's no longer a candidate, but he's a president for all of France. Uh, he spoke about the environment uh, once or twice uh, during the speech, clearly reaching out uh, to the younger population who feel that is that is an important issue. Um, when the crowd started, uh, when he mentioned Marine Le Pen and spoke about uh, Marine Le Pen. The crowd started to boo. He immediately stopped them and said that that was not called for. So Emmanuel Macron really trying to reach out to everyone tonight to unite the country because he said it, 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 the country has been divided. We saw how the far left and the far right did uh, during the first round. So there you heard from the president. And we have legislative elections ahead. Delano D'Souza reporting from the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Our coverage continues. I want to thank uh, uh, as well uh, Claire Lejeune, Véronique Trier-Lenoir, and uh, Artus Gallier for being uh, with us. Mark Permalin, François Picard with you. Our election coverage continues with Jeannie Gaudula and Angela Diffley here on France 24. Emmanuel Macron arrives at the Elysee Palace in 2017 at just 39 years old, France's youngest president. His rise to the top of national politics was meteoric. A graduate of France's elite École Nationale d'Administration for top civil servants, he spent several years at the Rothschild Investment Bank. In 2012, he joined the government of François Hollande, becoming one of the socialist president's closest advisors. Two years later, Macron was appointed finance minister. In 2016, with Hollande's approval rating and freefall, Macron launched his own political movement. The new party's name, En Marche, reflecting his own initials. Emmanuel Macron sought to synthesize progressive and conservative viewpoints as he navigated a middle road. Moi, je suis de gauche, c'est mon histoire. Mais la gauche aujourd'hui ne me satisfait pas. A critic of many French labor policies, including the 35-hour work week, he called for more flexibility for employers to hire and fire as a means of reducing high unemployment. In 2017, he beat far-right candidate Marine Le Pen to win the presidency. The historic election saw the country's traditional left and right-wing parties shut out from the second round of voting for the first time in nearly 60 years. Macron's term has been marked by a succession of crises, from the Yellow Vest movement to pension reform protests to the coronavirus pandemic to the war in Ukraine. Along the way, the young president has faced plenty of criticism. His neoliberal economic policies, leading many to call him the president of the rich, while a perceived condescending tone earned him the nickname Jupiter. The pandemic saw Macron's government commit vast sums of public money to shore up the French economy, whatever the cost, while pushing hard for full vaccination in what had been one of Europe's most vaccine-hesitant countries. Non seulement ils mettent en danger de la vie des autres, mais ils restreignent la liberté des autres. Et ça, je ne peux pas l'accepter. Macron has now achieved something his two predecessors couldn't, a second term in office. 24 and RFI in partnership with France 2 and France Inter with Ipsos Sopra Stereo.
Cheers at the Eiffel Tower as Emmanuel Macron wins a second term in office. France's youngest ever president making history by becoming the first to be re-elected with a majority in parliament. Welcome everyone. I'm Jeannie Gaudula in Paris on this election night 2022. Emmanuel Macron now the first French president to be re-elected in 20 years. You can take a look at these early results that are now showing Macron getting 58 0.8% of the vote, beating far-right candidate Marine Le Pen, who brought in 41.2% of the vote. Well, for the next two hours, we'll be taking apart just why the French voted the way they did today at the end of a very divisive campaign. We'll also be focusing on President Macron's challenges for the future. Joining me on the set, France 24's elections commentator, Angela Diffley. Hello, Hi, Angela. Jenny. Also with us, Mathieu Doiret from you. France 24's uh, polling partner, Ipsos. Welcome to you. France 24's business editor, Kate Moody, is with us as well. Also with us tonight, Dipti Calon will be taking a closer look at the numbers and the issues that mark this campaign. Our correspondents and reporters are also standing by in France and around the world here in Paris. We'll be bringing you the joy and the disappointment from the two party HQs. Well, Emmanuel Macron's victory party tonight just at the foot of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Here's a bit more of what he had to say just moments ago. Je sais aussi Many people tonight voted for me not to support my ideals, but to block the far right. And I want to thank them tonight. I want to tell them that I understand the duty that comes with that vote for the coming years. I have been entrusted with their sense of duty their feelings for the Republic and for the differences that have been expressed over the last week. France 24's Claire Pacalin has been following Emmanuel Macron's campaign throughout it for the past several weeks. She is there at the Eiffel Tower right now. Claire, lots of very happy people that are there today at the Eiffel Tower. A lot of happy and relieved people at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Emmanuel Macron is still here himself. He's just at the foot of the stage, actually, having a few photos taken, the odd selfie or two, shaking hands with people. As he arrived here at the Eiffel Tower, he was with his wife, Brigitte, and a group of young people. They walked towards the crowd and the stage to the tune of Ode to Joy, of course, the European anthem. That was the same setup as in 2017, but back then he actually made that walk on his own through the Louvre. Today, of course, we're at the Eiffel Tower, so it was a bit different. And his speech tonight was short. You just heard in that soundbite, he was really trying to be conciliatory. He said he had a thought for those who had voted for his opponent, Marine Le Pen. He wanted the, them to give him a chance over the next five years. He said he also had a thought for people who hadn't voted at all because neither candidate felt right to them. And he said he also thanked those who had voted for them, but not with their heart, because, of course, some of the people who voted for him today didn't vote for him in the first round, and they only voted him for him to keep out the far-right candidate, Marine Le Pen. Claire, we also heard uh, Emmanuel Macron there talking about how the next five years are going to be different. What exactly does he mean by that? Well, he's going to have to unify even more than he did, even more than he said he would five years ago in 2017. He's really going to have to unify, and he's got a big challenge over the next couple of months because that parliament, that lower house of parliament, the Assemblée Nationale, Five years ago, he scored a massive majority. He got over 300 seats, having come from nothing. He didn't even have a party. He had a movement. He didn't have any members of parliament. He managed to get an absolute majority. This time round, it's looking a lot trickier. We know the left, various different left-wing parties are negotiating together, perhaps behind Jean-Luc Mélenchon, so that he could lead a left-wing union. The right is trying to regroup. Marine Le Pen, of course, she wants more seats in parliament. She has at the moment, so 
It's going to be a, a tough times ahead for Emmanuel Macron as he looks ahead to those parliamentary elections in June and then beyond to try and really heal some of the divisions here that we have in France. Claire, thanks for that. Claire Pacalan there reporting there. It is certainly going to be a complicated next couple of weeks for the French president. But in the meantime, tonight is all about celebration, about his victory. Our Delano D'Souza is actually in the crowd of that party there at the Champ de Mars in front of the Eiffel Tower. Delano. That's right. We heard uh, from Emmanuel Macron a short while ago, the president uh, clearly trying to reach out to everyone uh, here in France, people who voted for him, people that didn't vote for him, people that voted for him just to block uh, Marine Le Pen from uh, taking the presidency. One of the people who listened to the speech is Agnès. Good evening. Good evening. How are you feeling tonight? I feel very glad. I'm very relieved of the success of Emmanuel Macron. Did you think he did enough in his speech to reach out to people who didn't vote for him and unite the country? Yes, I think. It was a very good speech. Um, he spoke about uh, the necessity to, to, to be together and, to, and um, he tried to, to, to speak uh, for all the people, not only for the, those uh, who vote uh, for him. One of the things that is interesting this time around, for the first round of the election, we saw people vote for the far right, we saw people vote for the far left. In Macron's first, pre first term as president, he sort of alienated people on the far left. Do you think that this time around he, won't, he will try and have more left-wing policies? Yes, I think. Yes, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there you hear, heard it from one of uh, the P Emmanuel Macron supporters who came out uh, to listen uh, to the French president tonight. They said it was important uh, that they came uh, to, to hear him speak and, and to hear what he had to say to unite the country uh, in his tone. Uh, uh, while he was talking, in fact, uh, some of the people started booing when he mentioned Marine Le Pen's name. He quickly put a stop to that. So uh, that's, um, that's a wrap uh, for now from uh, the Chant de Mars uh, here in Paris. Thanks for that, Delana D'Souza. They are reporting for us. Emmanuel Macron earlier saying that he is the president of all, saying that the country was full of division and doubt. A lot of that division and doubt had been expressed by his challenger, Marine Le Pen. This was her third run for the presidency. Let's take a listen. <laughs> Upset crowds there at Marine Le Pen's headquarters earlier. The 53-year-old leader of the far right was hoping to become France's first woman president, but she did lose again to Macron after their first face-to-face -face in 2017. Speaking earlier tonight, Marine Le Pen said her score was still a victory for the national rally and that her focus now is on the upcoming parliamentary election in June. We could have seen a great wind of freedom sweeping across this country, but the people of France decided it to be otherwise. Despite two weeks of brutal, unfair and violent methods, the ideas that we represent are reaching new heights tonight on the second round of the presidential election. With more than 43 percent of the votes, when we look at tonight's results, we can see that we have nevertheless been victorious. Marine Le Pen speaking earlier just after 8 p.m. French time when those results dropped. Our Florence Villeneau is at the headquarters there for Marine Le Pen in the Bois de Boulogne, just west of Paris. Flo, what's the feeling like there now, now that the reality of Marine Le Pen's loss has sunk in? Well, i got to say, Judy, there are a lot of long faces here uh, at the Bois de Boulogne when that uh, countdown happened. I think a lot of people did have their hopes that there could be a surprise victory for Marine Le Pen. But when the result came in, there was a big gasp. And then when they saw that uh, em the Emmanuel Macron had been re-elected, lots of boos. But Marine Le Pen was very defiant in her concession speech, which came very quickly after that result came in, just about 10 minutes after the result. She was down here giving her concession speech. Quite a short speech, it must be said, but she was very, very defiant. She said it was a, a great victory. And indeed, a lot of the supporters here say, look, this is a lot better than she did in the 2017 presidential election. It's progress, and that progress is still 
going to keep happening. The, uh, the Rassemblement National is here to stay as a mainstream party. It's no longer a fringe party. It's a mainstream party. They're more de determined than ever. And Marine Le Pen said that her next sites are on the legislative elections, the parliamentary elections. She said the battle for that starts now. And she is determined to get her party several more seats. Currently, the party only has a handful of seats in the lower house of parliament. Keep in mind, there are 577 MPs, and the Rassemblement National has fewer than 10 seats, which is incredible when you realize that uh, the percentage of the vote that she gets in the presidential election. And that's something that Marine Le Pen has been saying for years, is that France needs to change its electoral system in the parliamentary election to make sure that there's more representation for the parties in, uh, in that election. So she said that the next battle is going to be uh, the parliamentary election. And People here as well, the supporters we've been uh, talking to, say that really is their next quest. There are a lot of questions, though. How are they going to try and get perhaps a, a, an alliance in the parliament, perhaps with Éric Zemmour? Because if you look at the first round of the election between uh, Éric Zemmour's party and Marine Le Pen's party, they came up with 30 percent of the vote, which is incredible. I mean, keep in mind that in 2002, when Marine Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, made it to the second round of the presidential election, it was a huge shock in French politics. And now it just seems normal that Marine Le Pen and her, and her far-right party make it to the second round of the presidential election. So that's one big question, is what is the future of the party in those parliamentary elections? Another big question is what is the future for Marine Le Pen? Now, going into this election, she said that this third run for the presidency was going to be her final run. Uh, but uh, tonight, she said, she said uh, I'm staying in politics. I'm going to keep fighting for the French. What does that mean? Does that mean she's going to run again for president, or is she just going to focus on uh, getting more seats in parliament for her, for her party? We spoke early to one of her aides who said, look, People who are burying Marine Le Pen's future in politics, thinking that she's just going to take care of her cats, are completely wrong. She's here to stay. And as I said, one thing that's certain is this result is really incredible because it shows how much Marine Le Pen has managed to transform her party, the Rassemblement National. She's really managed to transform it into a mainstream party that's going to be here to stay in French politics for some time. Well, thanks for that. And Marine Le Pen certainly has done that. Uh, just to remind everyone, in 2017, she brought in something like 33 percent of the vote. Tonight, she's up to over 41 percent. That's quite a big jump in five years. Well, Alison Sargent is at the Le Pen headquarters as well. In the crowd, Alison, you've been talking to people. What have they had to say? Gina, I'm actually here uh, with one of Marine Le Pen's supporters. This is Raphael. He's 24. Uh, and I want to start, Raphael, just by asking you how you're feeling about how she did tonight. I'm a bit disappointed, but... I'm still happy. Like we did a great score, uh, 24. I'm still, I, it's, it seems to me uh, the, the better score in Europe for the Patriot movement. And uh, I hope uh, this will uh, go on to this legislative uh, election. Uh, of course, I'm a bit disappointed because we didn't win the presidential, but that, uh, that's, uh, that's still a great score. And because um, it is the second score, though, that Marine Le Pen has gotten that was not high enough. This is the second time that she's lost in the second round. Do you think that there's a limit to how well she can do? I don't think so. Uh, the French people discover our social program that we didn't talk about uh, in the recent election. And that's, that's gather, that the, social, the social program gather more people to, uh, to our movement, uh, to our program, and uh, to, to the voters. So... I think now, because they just discovered, it's just the beginning to a new, uh, to gather a new type of, uh, of uh, French people. Raphael, thank you very much. Uh, Jeannie, I did talk to other people uh, who were quite disappointed and frustrated also uh, at all of the voters that they say chose Emmanuel Macron despite their anger at him, despite really not wanting to vote for him. People were quite frustrated that after all these years, after this last campaign of Marine Le Pen, uh, that they're still feeling afraid uh, of the Rassemblement, Rassemblement National Party, uh, that they still see them as far right, when if you ask supporters here, uh, none of themselves see themselves uh, as a far right party. So there was a lot of frustration. Uh, about that tonight. Um, 
And then people also keep citing, as you said, that her score, uh, it wasn't enough to beat Emmanuel Macron tonight. It wasn't enough in 2017, but it has been going up each time. And people have said, you know, she's consistent. She's a leader who has constant progress. Uh, one of them told me, you know, she's a horse that you can bet on. So they do not see this uh, as the end for Marine Le Pen in any means. They see it as just, you know, she's, she's going to keep working away at it. And many people told me that they think that she'll be back five years from now and that that's when she's going to win it. All right, Allison, thanks for your reporting. We'll check back in with you a little bit later tonight from Marine Le Pen's headquarters. The other big news of this election day, the high abstention rate again today. More and more French people stayed away from the polls. There you can see the projected abstention rate from the second round is now over 28 percent. That is the highest seen in France in the second round since 1969. Well, Dipti Calderon has been keeping an eye on that rising abstention rate, a trend that has been growing for years. Dipti. Well, that's right, Jeannie. We've actually seen a very high abstention rate already in the first round of this presidential election, something like 26% uh, or one in four voters. Well, that number, as you said, has gone up to 28%. So we're edging closer to one in three French voters who decided to stay away from these elections. Now, what's interesting is that it's often a painful but necessary choice for many abstentionists to stay away. Uh, France 24's Kaina Chabot actually spoke to a few people who explained why they were abstaining in 2022. Abstaining is not an easy choice for me. I absolutely won't vote for Marine Le Pen because I think she's much more dangerous than Emmanuel Macron. What I would like is for Emmanuel Macron to be re-elected with a high abstention rate. This will send a strong message that the current democratic system is not working. I'm fed up with voting strategically. I would rather abstain than be forced to vote for someone just to block the far right. So there you go. I mean, the thing is, French abstentionists have been sending a really strong signal to French politicians for years because abstention rates have been on the rise for at least 15, if not 20 years, not just at local and European elections, but also in presidential ones. Have a look at this. In 2002, the year that uh, Jacques Chirac uh, was re-elected president, abstention rates were at 20 percent. It dropped slightly to 16 percent when Nicolas Sarkozy was elected in 2007. But since then, it's been on the rise. In 2012, the year that François Hollande became president, abstention rates were at nearly 20%. In 2017, when Mac Emmanuel Macron was first elected, abstention rates were at 25% or 12 million voters. And as we've seen tonight, that has gone up to 20 8%. Now, what's interesting is abstaining, of course, is one way of showing your political dissatisfaction. There are other ways as well, notably through what the French call the vote blanc or the blank ballot. In this case, an elect uh, a voter will head to the polling stations, but will cast an empty envelope, will basically choose neither candidate. There's also the invalid vote. In this case, a voter might deliberately or not incorrectly choose a candidate or deface their ballot paper in some way, thus rendering that vote invalid. Now, the vo the blank ballot vote is often seen as a protest vote, as we've seen in this election, against candidates, against their, their electoral campaigns, but also against the political system or the electoral system in general. In fact, our polling partners, Ipsos, were looking at the reasons behind these blank ballots uh, in this election. And have a look at this. Nearly uh, 49 or nearly 50 percent of people interviewed said they were casting a blank ballot because they refused to choose between what they say were two bad candidates, Jeannie. Dipti, thanks so much for that. Let's get a bit more about the high abstention rate from Mathieu Douare uh, from France 24's polling partner, Ipsos. Uh, Mathieu, do you think that those are the two main reasons what Dipti was mentioning before, why people abstain? Either they're fed up or they just think the system's not working? Yeah, I would like to nuance a little bit uh, the idea that uh, abstention is very high. Because first, if you compare with the UK or the US, the latest elections there, 2019-2020, it's still higher. Second, uh, as uh, was mentioned uh, tonight by several people, uh, it's not the record. And we had a previous record which shows that same causes, same effects. In 1969, just after the 68 riots, etc., uh, we had a, a, a runoff with two candidates uh, who were seen to be too similar to each other. It's, On the it was, yeah, it was different from uh, tonight's configuration, but still a very large number of uh, even uh, first-round voters abstained on the, uh, at the runoff. And uh, 
the scores of the second and third candidates were exactly the same as the scores of the second and third candidates this year. And the president elected uh, garnered exactly the same score as Emmanuel Macron did tonight. So same causes, same effects. And the third man, at that time the communist candidate, said, uh, is the, 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 the worst president in terms of uh, uh, his uh, score, his uh, representativity, because he garnered only one third of the electorate, not a majority. And he joked about Monsieur Thiers, uh, which at that time was a reference that people could understand because it was uh, the first uh, rightist president of the Republic in the 19th century. And I expected Jean-Luc Mélenchon to make almost the same joke, and he did. He challenged the legitimacy of Emmanuel Macron based on this. So, in a way, nothing new. And uh, it turned out that the following election was a record high participation in 1974 because this time people had a clear choice between a united left and a united right. So I would not be too definitive about how uh, uh, damaged our democracy or how weakened our democracy is. Okay, a sign of optimism from you, Mathieu Dwayne. Thank you for that. Well. <laughs> We're going to go now to the heart of Paris with France 24's Yenna Lee. Yenna, you're in Chatelet, really right in the heart of Paris, uh, where people had been turning out on the streets. We had heard of, of some uh, minor violence there earlier. What's the feeling like where you are now? Minor indeed. We did witness uh, police chasing a few dozen protesters. Some tear gas was used, but the whole incident lasted around uh, 10 minutes and then calm returned to uh, Chatley as many of those protesters uh, ran away to other spots in the city. This is one of several places that uh, student demonstrators, anti fascist groups, had designated as a, a protest site. Uh, but security forces clamped down uh, very quickly. There was massive uh, police presence in full riot gear who emptied the entire uh, area. One one bar manager actually told us that, was in, that it was incredibly bad for business. As you can see behind me, the, the terraces emptied out uh, very quickly. Now, uh, anti-fascist groups say that they are against both Emmanuel Macron's liberal agenda and Marine Le Pen's far-right ideology. We spoke to one protester who uh, said that he was taking part to demand more means for higher education and more drastic measures against climate change. He did actually tell us that he went to vote this morning for Emmanuel Macron. With a heavy heart, he wanted it to be known that he voted uh, uh, as he had no other choice, but not because he uh, approved of Emmanuel Macron's policy. So a uh, very small gathering here in Chatelet. Others ongoing uh, elsewhere around France. Small clashes with police, but by all means, uh, a very marginal event. A, uh, a key date and perhaps a more organized and more widely followed uh, left movement uh, was set to be on May the 1st, which is uh, Labor Day. Yana, thanks for that. France 24 is Yana Lee. Angela, let me, let me bring you in here. When we heard Emmanuel Macron speak earlier, he vowed a response to what he called the anger of far-right voters. We've kept, we've been talking about this since the beginning of the campaign, how divided the country feels, how people are really lining up behind not just Marine Le Pen, but other far-right candidates like we saw in the first round. What is President Macron going to do now to reach out across the divide? Well, I think just to uh, allude back to what Mathieu said, it is a really blunt instrument, this, this Republican bloc. Uh, and it is eating away at French democracy in a way, because those people who vote far right and who vote for Marine Le Pen, their numbers are increasing year after year. And year after year, they see themselves, in their view, cheated of a vote. Their grievances are never addressed, because each time they are thwarted by a bigger majority on, on the other side. Emmanuel Macron is fully aware of that. We've seen also there is some demonstrations in the streets from the far left. France is extremely divided on very many different axes at the moment. There's an urban-rural divide. There are people on the far left who feel that they were left between a rock and a hard place here with this choice that they were given, either a far-right candidate or, in their view, a liberal economic centre-right, even right-wing candidate in uh, Emmanuel Macron. There are the Gilets jaunes who still are out there angry uh, who feel there are forgotten France, uh, who are priced out of urban city centres, live on the outskirts of towns and feel that uh, their needs are not addressed, that they're lectured by bobos, by, by urban bobos, intellectuals. bohemian bourgeois, just exactly, to explain to our international who, viewers. lecture them on using uh, bicycles and not using their cars and <laughs> they are forced to use them. They live 
in rural areas or outside city centres and get about, they need their cars. So there's a lot of disgruntled people. Emmanuel Macron is fully aware of this. In terms of reaching out, because they're all such different groups, that's going to be quite difficult. Uh, it will also depend enormously on what happens, and I know we're going to talk about this later, in the legislative elections, in the parliamentary elections here in France, whether he gets a majority or not, and how the other groups are represented as to how far he will try to enact some of his tough of policies. At the moment, uh, in the Fifth Republic, he has made history, though, as being the only mm. president to be re-elected with a majority, and that's something we'll talk about in a minute. Catherine Nicholson, welcome. Hello, Hello. Catherine. <laughs> we all know you as our Europe editor. Five years ago, you followed the Le Pen campaign. I did. Yeah. How would you say things have changed between 2017 and 2022? Well, I think there's definitely been a very uh, obvious effort at uh, softening down the image of this party. I think we've talked about it quite a lot uh, during this campaign. Um, and Marine Le Pen has, has been pretty open about this. Uh, she, uh, in 2017, for example, in the debate, came across as being aggressive and not very well prepared, not across her brief. Um, and she tidied all of that up for the 2022 TV debate with Emmanuel Macron, although perhaps not quite as sure of her detail as, as he was of his. Um, in terms of uh, other aspects of her campaigning image as well, she's perhaps played up a bit more the fact that she's a woman. In the first round, her campaign poster, it said, Femme d'État, stateswoman. Uh, of course, France has never had a female president and, uh, you know, making this overt point, you know, you could elect your first female president if you vote for me. Uh, she says that she has a feminist agenda, although single her detractors mother. disagree with that. Yes, yes she's talked about mom. being exactly yeah. a single mother um, and saying about how this um, means that she understands the needs of her people choosing her who are also single parents themselves, that sort of thing. So, yeah, she's... Um, uh, you know, I, I think made quite a, a clearly calculated, planned effort to to change her image. And it's something that we've, Angela will agree, we've seen going on for quite a few years since she took over at the helm of the party as well. This de demonization of the National Front, as was changing the name to National Rally as well in the last few years. And just picking up on that, it is very ironic that in that debate this time, where she came across with much more empathy, much closer to the people, it is ironic that she is the one who is supposed to be the one that France should be scared of, and yet she came across as the more empathetic and the one who was closer to the people. He came across as someone on occasions who could be accused of looking a bit arrogant with, with his, his long-standing reputation as the Absolutely. president of the rich as well. Uh, you were saying, Kat, before, Marine Le Pen definitely was trying to speak to the people uh, in their pocketbook to say to them, I understand your pain. The economy, of course, was really a hot topic for French voters. Uh, Anton, wrap all of that. Let's bring in our business editor, Kate Moody. Kate, what's really at stake for the French economy now? Well, Jeannie, Macron is really going to be trying to build on the successes of the last five years. And there are quite a few of them uh, when you look at the economy. But he's also, as we've mentioned, there, going to be dealing with the inequality, uh, the anger and the disappointment of those five years as well. Now, concretely, he's going to have have to continue shepherding uh, the Eurozone's second largest economy through these dual crises that it's been facing. Uh, we can take a look actually at the uh, Bank of France projections for this year. Uh, the Bank of France currently projecting GDP growth somewhere between 2.8 and 3.4 percent and inflation uh, between 3.7 and 4.4 percent. Uh, the ideal, of course, being lower inflation and higher growth. Uh, but there are factors, of course, like how the Ukraine war is going to turn out that are really beyond the president's control. Those dual crises being that war in Ukraine and the coronavirus pandemic. Um, he's also going to be trying to keep unemployment low. It is currently at around 7.4 percent. That's the lowest in over a decade. Uh, unemployment for the youth as well, m lower than it's been in several decades. Um, so that's sort of the broad strokes of what he's going to be trying to do. Concretely, uh, we know that he's going to have to deal with this cost of living crisis. It's something that he came on to a little bit late in the campaign. You know, he jumped into his campaign much later than Marine Le Pen did. She had really established herself as the candidate who cared about the cost of living crisis, even though in the last few months as president, he has taken a lot of action to try to address the concerns of voters, of businesses, of households. Um, he's going to be building on that. We know there are going to be some more immediate relief measures in store, uh, including the extension of this freeze uh, on electricity and gas bills. We know there could be more direct subsidies for people who need it the most, as well as the longer term challenge of trying to build up salaries, make people feel like they can deal with these crises more. Um, 
Pension reform is definitely going to be back on his agenda. It's something he really failed at over the last five years. He has said that it will be coming back. He is certainly going to try to be addressing that because the state pension program is really running out of money. Um, hanging over all of this is the question of France's government debt. It currently stands at around 113 percent of GDP. Much of that was from pandemic spending. Um, and it's something that he knows that as it as a, you know, he's someone who he, he was an economist by training. He knows that this is something that he's going to have to address uh, at some point, at least in the next five years. He certainly is Emmanuel Macron, who won that second term in office in those results that dropped tonight at about 8 p.m. of French time. The election today, of course, a repeat of that Macron Le Pen duel of 2017 with the liberal centrists facing the far right nationalists. But as their two parties have come to the forefront of French politics, the once all-powerful Socialist Party has fallen to historic lows. Now, just 10 years ago, the Socialist Francois Hollande won the presidency, but in the first round of the election this time, Socialist candidate and Paris mayor Anne Hidalgo couldn't even get 2% <coughs> of the vote. And it was, as we've been saying, far-left candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon who won big, taking over 20%. Mélenchon missed his spot in today's runoff by just a little over one point. Yenali takes a closer look now at what's next for France's left. Veteran leftist Jean-Luc Mélenchon has emerged as the face of France's progressive politics. The hard-left politician narrowly missed out on a place in the final round of the 2022 presidential election. He was one of six left-leaning candidates, including the Greens, the Communists and the once all-powerful Socialists. In total, less than a third of the French voted for a progressive. After the results, Mélenchon's followers blamed the other parties for taking precious votes away from their candidate. Despite the outcome, he insists the fight is far from over. Je demande aux Français I'm asking the French people to elect me as their prime minister by voting for a majority of MPs from the France Unbowed Party and our popular union group. There is a third round to come, not only a second round, but also a third. The third round Mélenchon is referring to is the parliamentary elections in June. His France Unbowed party has called on politicians to join a left-wing coalition. That way, he hopes to win enough seats in the National Assembly to force a power-sharing cohabitation government. France's last cohabitation government dates back to 1997. Centre-right President Jacques Chirac had to work with socialist premier Lionel Jospin. Jean-Luc Mélenchon himself was a junior minister in that government, representing the left wing of the Socialist Party. But in 2008, he quit his political family to create a more radical movement that's been growing ever since. Despite uh, socialist François Hollande's election in 2012, the party remained split between proponents of a leftist agenda and those in favor of pro-business labor reforms. The brand has been damaged. And, you know, it's not just the popular voter that they don't attract. They don't attract anybody anymore. The man Hollande picked to help him with some of the most uh, controversial reforms was Emmanuel Macron. The young minister would later create his own centrist party. In 2017, he successfully ran for office, sweeping up much of the social democratic vote. Since then, the socialists have been edged out by Macron on the right and Mélenchon on the left, reaching a historic low of less than 2% on April 10th. The coming weeks will show if the fractured parties of the left can put aside their differences and unite. Angela, what do you think that the legislative elections could bring if the left gets it together and unites? Could we be looking at a power sharing government, perhaps a, a left prime minister with President Macron? It, it's absolutely unlikely. I think that Jean-Luc Mélenchon would be <laughs> prime minister. There is a hashtag, hashtag Jean-Luc Mélenchon premier ministre. It's really unlikely. This guy is along the lines of Bernie Sand uh, Sanders yeah. in the US or Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. And that would absolutely not really represent or reflect the, the vote that the French have uh, 
the, the opinions they've expressed in this presidential vote. You know, Jean-Luc Mélenchon got 22 percent of the vote. That was all the left uh, voters behind him. That would not in any way reflect uh, how people have voted in this election. So, no, he will not be the next prime minister. As to whether he manages to unite all the other parties behind him, well, you know, as always, there are a lot of egos involved in, in any kind of election. It involves making deals with people at local level so that people will stand aside, so that another left-wing candidate can take their place. And, of course, in a parliamentary election, it's very much about your local implantation and the, rep the uh, reputation that any MP has in the local area. It's not just about the national colour you represent. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. We're just going to go now to Ellen Gainsford, who is in uh, the fiefdom, if we can call it that, of Marine Le Pen in Enambulmont. Uh, Ellen, what's the feeling like there? That's where Marine Le Pen voted earlier today. I bet a lot of long faces around there. Well, that's right, Jeannie. I have to say that uh, the result uh, wasn't what was uh, waiting, for, what people were waiting for here in uh, Enam Beaumont. Um, it's really the electoral heartland of uh, Marine Le Pen here. And uh, when we heard the, uh, the figures announced, uh, there was actually a collective uh, size of anger and of disbelief. And uh, we spoke to some people after the result was announced. And uh, one nurse, she told me that uh, she was worried that she would now have to work more to earn less and uh, that potentially her retirement could, she put, could be pushed back as uh, she has quite a physical job. And that's, of course, referring to uh, Macron's plan to potentially reform the pension system. Well, another lady told me that uh, she had voted for Marine Le Pen because uh, she felt like Marine Le Pen was closer to the people. And... Um, well, while uh, Marine Le Pen's uh, concession speech was playing here, there was uh, much applause, and especially at the period where uh, she was speaking about um, a forgotten France. And uh, as we said, that uh, although uh, Marine Le Pen might not be heading to the presidential palace tonight, in, uh, in one way she uh, really has uh, won a battle here in that um, she has succeeded in uh, normalizing her party in many ways. And uh, many of the voters that we spoke to were impressed by her, um, her policies on uh, the um, purchasing power. And rather than voting for her, as a, as a protest vote, as we may have seen in previous years, that uh, they're voting for her because uh, they support her program. And that, in one way, is a, is a win for Marine Le Pen. Thanks for that, Ellen. And Mathieu Doiré, let me bring you back in here. You are the polling partner from Ipso. So looking at 41% of the vote for Marine Le Pen, how will that translate, or will that translate, into the legislative well, election? We have a few cues, because we have asked voters uh, which parties they would like to uh, get reinforced or weakened by the next parliamentary elections. And it turned out that, predictably enough, uh, France Insoumise and Dante, France? Mm -hmm. yeah. Unbowed. France Unbowed. <laughs> France Unbowed. <laughs> unbowed. It's a tricky France translation. Unbowed. Yeah, <laughs> France Unbowed and National Rally. Yeah, you would National say? Rally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like would, a quiz. Uh, <laughs> would be the ones that uh, the voters would uh, mo um, uh, prefer to, 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 to see gain additional seats. Not the, it's not explicit whether they, they want them to counterbalance, check and balance Macron or really uh, constitute a, an alternative majority. And to be honest, this is very unlikely. And particularly a combined uh, extreme left, extreme uh, right majority. Uh, the other parties fare far uh, worse, and this is quite revealing. For example, uh, the Republicans, uh, uh, almost a majority of voters would like them to be weakened. Mm. It's important because they are the second largest party in Parliament, and this is very bad omen for them. And uh, al almost half uh, their uh, uh, faction is already uh, considering how they could save their seats by allying uh, with uh, uh, Macron's party. And just as a reminder, their presidential candidate got under 5% of the vote. Yeah, the and, uh, and basically uh, a lot of people who still consider themselves as Republicans voted for Macron in the first round. So I would say uh, what is certain is that uh, Le Pen actually, she's uh, uh, elected in a... I would say a constituency that is more or less Sunderland, you know, Tyneside. So she kind of not, she didn't bro break the red wall, she erected a blue wall. Mm -hmm. And you can see this blue wall in all the most uh, deserted uh, counties of France. And uh, alternatively, uh, for Mélenchon, it's a bit trickier to identify where you could really uh, win additional seats. Probably where the socialists uh, incumbents are, but there are very few of them. 
So it's not very clear what margin it still has. Matthew, thanks for that. We'll be keeping an eye on that in the coming weeks as that election is coming up in June. Uh, for now, though, it's the presidential election that's being watched around the world, particularly in Europe. The Franco-German couple, of course, has been called the motor of Europe. Traditionally, Berlin is the newly elected French president's first stop. And to get more reaction from Germany now, let's bring in France 24's Nick Spicer in Berlin. Uh, Nick, I imagine Germany's leaders and politicians are viewing this election with a big sigh of relief. Absolutely. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz tweeted shortly after we got the numbers that he uh, was looking forward to good cooperation with Emmanuel Macron, and he thanked his constituents for voting for the French president. And it needs to be said that Scholz did something pretty unusual between the two rounds. He actually got somewhat involved in the French electoral process, signing an editorial uh, with the leaders of Portugal in Spain, basically calling on people to vote for Macron without saying his name, saying that French voters, this was published in a French newspaper, had a choice between democracy or choosing uh, a candidate who represented uh, ties with authoritarian <laughs> regimes and would threaten democracy. So essentially, uh, Marine Le Pen. This is something that German leaders don't typically do. They stand back and don't try to get involved. So the Germans felt that democracy was really at stake. And because of this country's past, when there's a far right candidate involved, uh, it's something that leaders feel they need to do uh, to speak out against uh, the, the threat against democracy. So that was quite an exceptional uh, intervention and which explains the sigh of relief you were referring to. And I think that goes pretty much across the entire political spectrum, with the exception of the far-right alternative for Germany here. Thanks for that, Nick. Nick Spicer there reporting from Berlin. Uh, Catherine Nicholson, our Europe editor, let me bring you in now. Lots of reaction already from across Europe, not just from Germany. Absolutely. Very quick to get involved with a Twitter reaction was... President of the European Commission, another German, Ursula von der Leyen. We know that she and Emmanuel Macron are very close uh, political allies. She was saying that uh, together they will move France and Europe forward over the next five years. Uh, we also had Charles Michel. He's a former Belgian prime minister. He's currently the president of the European Council, another important institution. He offered warm congratulations and talked about this being a tormented time for Europe. He said we need a solid Europe, France, that's totally engaged for an EU that is more sovereign, more strategic. Uh, and as we heard from Nick Spicer there, various national leaders of the various EU member states have been giving their congratulations as well. I think something um, also important to flag up, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, no longer an EU member state, but geographically still very much part of Europe, uh, hasn't floated away into the Atlantic just yet. He was also quite quick to tweet some congratulations as well. He tweeted in English and he tweeted in French, and he said that France is one of the closest and most important allies for the UK. He looks forward to continuing to work together on some very important issues. Now, these two men have not had great relations, that is to say the least, um, but Boris Johnson is quite right there. They're very important issues to work on, not least uh, irregular migration across the English Channel, but also issues of uh, trade stemming from the Brexit deal. Uh, France, you know, the Calais to Dover route is one of the major routes by which goods enter the United Kingdom from the continent of Europe. And Emmanuel Macron has made threats in the past about making that passage of goods a bit more difficult uh, when the UK has been making threats on their side as well. So it's been a testy relationship and it's got couple more years, years in it, like, yes. Catherine, thank you for that. We're actually going to go now to the UK with France 24's Benedict Pavio, uh, who is at Emmanuel Macron's campaign headquarters in London. Benedict, well, what's the feeling like there tonight? Well, there is joy. There is happiness here in London. <laughs> I can barely stop them and contain them. There is, of course, also relief. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon press very much... 
Talking about talking up the Marine Le Pen win, which did not happen, we have a historic Macron uh, re-election, uh, and of course there is a lot of coverage here in the United Kingdom on British channels because uh, the Franco-British relationship, because defence cooperation, uh, and although the British Prime Minister has got many troubles of his own, uh, it is noted here very carefully uh, that Mr Macron is going to have a different start now, launching into his five years, and of course the British Prime Minister congratulating his French counterpart, well, not quite counterpart, because, of course, Mr. Macron is a head of state. He's a president. So Boris Johnson saying that he looks forward to working together on the issues which matter most to our two countries and to the world. Benedict, has there been any other reaction from the UK so far? <laughs> I can barely hear you. I'm afraid you're going to have to repeat that question. The joy is just too much here for these people. <laughs> Benedict, apart from Boris Johnson, what else have we heard from the UK? I know it's, it's very early. This just dropped a, a few hours ago. Has there been any reaction in the press? Uh, well, there is huge coverage, not just on channels. They've been having lots of coverage. Uh, fascinating to see how many foreign correspondents were at Mr. Macron's uh, speech this evening. Um, and it will be, I think, wall-to-wall -wall coverage as far as uh, France. And I think they'll be analysing what five more years for the French president is going to look like. I might say in passing, as a, an Anglo-French journalist reporting on these matters for a number of years, that we haven't had an Anglo-French summit uh, since Theresa May was Prime Minister, so it will be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, and we will see when uh, Mr. Macron meets Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson who, as we know, has got a few domestic problems of his own with his own party and, should I say, party gate. All right, Benedict, thank you for that. And thanks to your supporters, the supporters of Emmanuel Macron, who are with you there at those Macron headquarters in the London. Tonight, <laughs> I believe they are going to be dancing tonight, Benedict. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. And EU and French flags, I'll have you know. Sure. Of course, Emmanuel Macron, such a pro EU president. Emmanuel Macron even walked into his victory speech tonight on the national. It, him, a uh, hymn him national, how do we say that? The anthem, yeah. the the anthem thank you, the <laughs> anthem for the European Union, for Ode to Joy, Emmanuel Macron walking in to make that victory speech after he defeated Marine Le Pen with 58% of the vote, uh, uh, more exactly 58.8% Marine Le Pen coming in with 41.2% of the vote. Uh, speaking in front of the Eiffel Tower just uh, after that victory uh, was announced, uh, Emmanuel Macron said that he was the president of all French people. Let's listen to what he had to say. I want to thank all of the French people, men and women, who at the first and the second round of these presidential elections placed their trust in me so together we can undertake our project to make France more independent, Europe stronger, and through investments and changes continue to implement change that is relevant for everyone by freeing creativity and innovation in our country and making France a great green nation. France 24's Delano D'Souza is in the crowd there at the Champ de Mars. Delano, are there still a lot of people who've turned out for this victory party or is it starting to dissipate already? It is starting to dissipate the minute uh, Emmanuel Macron and his government ministers left. We have a bunch of young people who have taken uh, to the stage and taking selfies in front of the Eiffel Tower. There you can see them. Emmanuel Macron spoke um, uh, a little earlier and he really had uh, a speech which, which was trying to unite uh, all of France. He said he's no longer a candidate, but he's the president. Uh, once again, Emmanuel Macron reaching out to, to people who voted for the far right, people who voted for the far left uh, in the first round of the election. If uh, you recall, Jean-Luc Mélenchon did surprisingly well uh, in the first round of the vote. And now Emmanuel Macron has succeeded in tonight's battle, in today's battle. But now he's going to shift his focus to June, to the parliamentary elections, where we expect uh, the, the, the left uh, to band together uh, to, so, to, to keep Emmanuel Macron in check, uh, so to speak. So that's his next battle uh, looking forward. Delano, we've often heard that uh, the typical Macron voter, if we're going to describe that person, is older. But it seemed like the crowd tonight, from what I could see, was actually quite young. 
There, there was a mix of everything, actually. A lot of young people did come out to vote. We know that uh, Emmanuel, uh, that Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the far-left uh, candidate, uh, did surprisingly well uh, when it came to college-educated urban voters. But tonight, uh, what we saw here was a mix of everything. A lot of people said uh, they, they're confident that Emmanuel Macron's policies will tilt more to the left this time around because he's, this is his second mandate. He cannot run for, le uh, run for re-election in five years' time. So he's not going to be looking over his shoulder at Marine Le Pen, uh, looking for the next election, so to speak. Delana, thanks so much for that. Delana D'Souza, enjoy the rest of your evening there reporting from the Champ de Mars. Mathieu Doiré, you were saying that you have some more precise data about who is the Macron voter. Yeah, there, there, there are things that are very obvious. That, that his first is the uh, highest uh, scores are, uh, with uh, both the youngest and the uh, elderly voters. Mm, so uh, and two extremes. Yeah, the two extremes. And not surprisingly, the only edge rack where he fares uh, worse than Le Pen is the ones between 50 and 59, that is just so close to retirement age mm. that they fear they should have to work longer. And not very surprisingly, is also indeed faring far better with graduates. This is not new. Uh, Actually, the sociology is quite reminiscent of what we had on the Brexit referendum or the uh, U.S. 2020 election. Uh, what is different, maybe, is that he also is the conservative candidate. Uh, I, I mean, his coalition is both progressive and conservative, not extremely progressive, not extremely conservative. So he's a real centrist. And that is reflected by the sociology, by the age breaks, also by the homogeneity of uh, his scores across the territory. He's not faring particularly well in the larger cities where Mélenchon was very strong. In the first round, he's faring very well in the runoff for logical reasons. And he was not faring particularly uh, weak in the rural areas because the conservative voters still supported him there. Uh, the younger voters voting for Le Pen and the elderly for him. So it's a very large coalition. The big issue when it comes to the issues in the campaign, of course, was the rising cost of living. Kate, you've been taking a closer look about that. Uh, what exactly is Macron going to do to fix that? I mean, that was really Marine Le Pen's terrain during this campaign. It was, but he does have a lot of proposals. And because he's been in office already, he's actually been taking action. So we know that he's going to be building uh, on some of the measures that his government has already taken in the last few months. Again, even though Le Pen and some of her supporters accused him of ignoring their distress, he has enacted some policy. Let's take a look at some of the bullet points of what he's proposing to do going ahead now. Um, we know he's already frozen uh, the increases in gas and electricity bills. Uh, he's vowed to extend that still further. Uh, that's something it's worth pointing out that Marine Le Pen, as a member of parliament, actually voted against earlier on. Um, he could also extend an 18-cent rebate per liter of petrol. It's currently in effect through the end of July. Or he could choose to apply it just for low-income households and truck drivers, for example. Um, low-income households have already received a so-called energy check. It's a hundred euro subsidy for their energy bills. That could be repeated or perhaps even extended uh, to food subsidies. Macron has also said he'd want to increase uh, the level, the amount of a tax-free bonus that employers can pay out, uh, putting more money in workers' pockets. And his medium to longer term plan is really to get more people into the labor force, more people working with better salaries and a lower tax burden. He says that's really the best way for people to deal with this kind of crisis, with this surge in the cost of living. Um, I do want to point out that Marine Le Pen's headline proposal that she was going around France campaigning on was to lower sales tax, right? She wanted to lower it on energy from 20 to 5.5% and get rid of it altogether uh, on about 100 essential products. Most economists and Macron himself, actually, especially during that headline, during that TV debate, um, they'd been arguing that this was not an effective solution because it really wasn't targeted to the people who needed it the most. Um, one estimate from an economic think tank actually said that that proposal of lowering VAT would result in only a net gain of around 13 euros per household mm. per year. So just to draw the, the comparison between those two policies, but there's no question that this is going to be one of the top priorities for him because it is such a big issue for French households and businesses. Just one thing, they were criticized for being a little bit too pork and barrel and very big tent, actually. So the differences between both platforms were not as salient as we were used to.
One thing where there was a difference, of course, was when it came to pension reform. Emmanuel Macron really wanting to push through that, pushing the retirement age back a few years. Uh, how did that play out, Kate? Well, it's another issue that took center stage in some ways during that televised debate. Um, and it's one of the big failures, really, of Ma Emmanuel Macron's first term. His reform ground to a halt. Uh, he officially says it's because of the pandemic. But really, there were those huge, remember, there was those huge public protests against it, uh, including France's longest public transport strike in years. Um, he hasn't abandoned all of those plans, although he's suggested that he might change them up a little bit. We can look at the outlines of his proposals. He does say that the retirement age still needs to be uh, higher than its current 62, but he's showed some signs of softening from his initial goal of 65. Uh, in the past two weeks since that first round election, he said perhaps it could be 64, not 65. So we'll wait to see uh, what he set What's number. He, what number? Well, what number he settles on. He also says, you know, it's going to be progressively each Step each once. year. There'll be a few more months added on to it. So it's not going to be an overnight change. Um, he has proposed a monthly minimum of 1,100 euros. Uh, the current state pension minimum is less than 1,000. Um, and he said that the payments could be linked to the to the rate of inflation. So that's a clear nod to this cost of living crisis. Um, he says he will still try to get rid of these 42 sector specific programs that France has. Uh, 42 programs, you know, depending on what kind of a job you do, you might get different benefits or different a different time that you can retire all that sort of thing. Um, that is something that is likely to spark opposition from the likes of the SNCF, France's railway system. Um, but just to explain some of the rationale behind this, France's pension, pension system is running out of money. There's a shortfall of around 18 billion euros. And Macron says uh, that people simply need to work longer if they're going uh, to maintain the standard that the pension system is used to having. And if I could just give a little European perspective with some comparable economies. Uh, in Germany, the pension age is 65. In the UK, it's 66 currently, but projected to plan to go up. And in Italy, it's 67 years of age. Right. So France, France is far ahead of the given its comparable its size and economic and, might. And, and actually, Le, even Le Pen had to uh, change her uh, platform slightly from uh, 2017 because she, uh, she was aware that nobody would really believe in 64 everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And really, the, and I think that the money also spoke to that platform because really there was just no way that she could afford to pay for the proposals. What, what, what they wanted to was me. just that uh, uh, blue collar workers could uh, uh, leave earlier than white collar. Hmm. Well, thanks to all of you. Uh, we are, it's France 24. We're going to take uh, just a little pause to take a look back at how this campaign has evolved over the past weeks. Of course, it started with 12 candidates. It went down to two for the final round to finally one the winner, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who was re-elected. But after one of the most divided campaigns in French history, he was able to, again, for the second time in 20 years only, be re-elected. Our Shirley Sitbon takes a look back at the highs and lows of the campaign. One started her campaign very early on, the other just before the deadline. After her massive loss in 2017, Marine Le Pen tried to talk to as many people as possible. Six months later, Emmanuel Macron launched his own campaign with a mini-series. Donc, euh, appelez-moi monsieur le candidat, il n'y a aucun problème. The war in Ukraine was one reason Macron jumped into the race so late. As president of the Council of the EU, he had a key role to play. His ratings soared. For the far-right candidate, it was all the opposite. Her actions were scrutinized. Since she had contracted a loan in a Russian bank and met with Vladimir Putin in 2017, Le Pen's support ratings remained unaffected because what voters really care about is the purchasing power. In recent years, it has eroded for people with low income. Je ferai un panier de produits de première nécessité sur lequel j'abaisserai la TVA à 0%. More than measures on fuel and soap, Macron drew a line in the sand to show he and Le Pen are fundamentally different. C'est le combat du progrès contre le repli. Le combat du patriotisme et de l'Europe. 
contre les nationalistes. An attack on Le Pen and also Eric Zemmour, the campaign surprise contender who poached some of Le Pen's key allies, even her niece. But Le Pen also benefited from Zemmour because his explosive comments made her seem almost mainstream. That was over after the first round of voting, when only Macron and Le Pen remained in the race. Most candidates urged people to vote for Macron to block Le Pen. But some had a more nuanced approach, still opposed to the far right. Il ne faut pas donner une seule voix, Madame Le Pen. But stopping short of backing Macron, when accused of presenting a threat, Le Pen tried to deflect the attack on her rival. Le danger Emmanuel Macron, lui, il est bien réel. La disparition des libertés, une France fracturée euh, comme euh, comme jamais, euh, à mépris et un dédain à l'égard euh, des Français. But no matter her attempts to appear moderate, at least one proposal placed her very far to the right, the ban of the veil in public places. Je cherche à imposer, au fur et à mesure du temps, des gens qui ont une vision non. radicale de ah C'est pas vrai. C'est pas. Macron tried to tap into Mélenchon's young electorate by injecting green pledges into his program. La politique que je mènerai dans les cinq ans à venir sera donc écologique ou ne sera pas. This is how the battle over climate concerned voters ended in the debate. Vous êtes climato-sceptique. En aucun cas, euh, mais vous, vous êtes un peu climato-hypocrite. Throughout the campaign, the French tried to alert the candidates on their struggles, hoping to be heard at last. You're watching France 24. This is our continuing coverage of the French presidential election. Emmanuel Macron has been re-elected, France's youngest ever president, making history by becoming the first to be re-elected in the Fifth Republic with a majority in Parliament. He brought in over 58% of the vote, beating his far-right candidate Marine Le Pen for the second time in a row. So... So what were the main issues that pushed people to head to or stay away from the polls? We're going to be talking about that this hour with me on the set, France 24's elections commentator, Angela Diffley. We also have our international affairs uh, commentator, Doug Herbert. Welcome, Evening. Doug. With us as well, the business editor, Kate Moody, and our Europe editor, Catherine Nicholson. So happy to have all of you on the set. Well, Emmanuel Macron's victory party tonight is at the foot of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Here's more of what he had to say earlier. Je sais aussi Many people tonight voted for me not to support my ideals, but to block the far right. And I want to thank them tonight. I want to tell them that I understand the duty that comes with that vote for the coming years. I have been entrusted with their sense of duty, their feelings for the Republic, and for the differences that have been expressed over the last week. Emmanuel Macron also saying tonight that the next five years are not going to be easy. And to talk a bit more about his speech, let's bring in France 24's Claire Pacalan. Claire, what struck you the most from what Macron had to say earlier? Actually, what struck me the most, Jenny, was how short the speech was. We were expecting it to be a victory speech, but not too victorious. But really, it was the length of the speech. He was really trying to strike a conciliatory tone and try not to sound too victorious. He thanked those who voted for him, but he also said he knows that many of them didn't vote for him because they liked his policies, but because they wanted to keep the far right out. He said he had a thought for those who didn't vote at all today because neither candidate represented them. And he also said he was thinking about Marine Le Pen's voters and he really wants them to give him a chance over the next five years. But as you can see around me, Jeannie, the party is very much over here at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. The lights are coming down. 
The cameras and the stage and the chairs are all being packed up. Emmanuel Macron supporters have gone home now. I spoke to a few as they were heading off and they said they told me they thought it was a good speech, that he got the right tone that he was thanking those who voted for him, looking ahead and trying to unify people around him. Of course, he's looking more immediately also to the parliamentary elections in June. Thanks for that, Claire. Uh, you say the party is starting to wrap up. I know our Delano D'Souza, though, is still in the crowd or what is left of the crowd there at the Champ de Mars. And Delano, I believe you still have a Macron fan with you right now. That's right. The party is uh, really ending. The lights have uh, come off uh, behind me. A lot of the people who were here and on the stage taking selfies a little earlier have gone. Uh, we have one person, actually, who is an American student studying in Paris who has all the, the Macron T-shirt, the Europe flag and everything. Uh, his name is Nate. How are you feeling today? Feeling happy. I think it's a move for democracy and the French Republic today. So you live in Paris? I'm living in Paris right now. Right. And why did you come out? Why did you feel the need to listen to what Emmanuel Macron had to say tonight? Well, I felt the need to come out because, well, I lived under Trump for four years. So I know what populism and nationalism is. I know that it threatens democracy. I almost experienced the death of my own democracy. So I'll support anybody that wants to maintain the liberal world order, liberal values. And uh, like I said, or I'd say Le Pen has a, a, a policy. Her policies are clearly, clearly anti-constitutional and threaten the French Republic and the liberal world, world order. So. Like I said, I'll support anybody that wants to maintain democracy. You were telling me a little earlier that a lot of your friends here in Paris voted for the far left's Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Do you think Emmanuel Macron's speech tonight uh, has sort of comforted them that he, he will tilt to the left? Well, I think in terms of ecology, yes. So in terms of the environment, of uh, acting on climate change, yes. Uh, I mean, I think he's proved himself to be socially liberal. So really it comes down to ecology. And I think he made a point to, to mention that tonight. So hopefully it persuades them. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, there you heard it from uh, one of the last uh, people standing here at uh, what was uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, party headquarters here at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Emmanuel Macron clearly looking uh, to those parliamentary elections uh, which will be held in June uh, to see uh, his speech tonight was one where he really did try and reach across uh, to everyone, everyone here in France, those who voted for the far right, those who voted for the far left, as well as those who voted for him. Uh, so clearly Emmanuel Macron trying to, to say uh, he's going to be president uh, for the, the, the whole country and is no longer a candidate uh, for an election. Thanks for that, Delano. Delano Souza there reporting from the Champ de Mars. Well, this election does seem to have been marked uh, and marking the end of France's traditional parties, uh, the Republicans on the right, the Socialists on the left, both of their candidates got historically low scores in the first round, not even hitting the 5% mark to get part of their campaign costs reimbursed. Deepthik Laurent has a closer look now at the collapse of France's main parties. Well, Jeannie, uh, this French presidential election has certainly redrawn the political landscape in France. It's something we're going to have a look at now. Have a look at this. Gone are the traditional right-wing and left-wing parties. These are the three major parties in France now. There's Emmanuel Macron's centrist party. There's the far right uh, party led by Marine Le Pen, of course, and the far left party led by Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Now, what's clear is that Emmanuel Macron has his work cut out for him. And if he really wants to govern efficiently, well, he won't be able to do that without a majority in parliament. And so that's, that's something that's looking like an uphill battle, at least for the moment, for France's major political parties. And it's where this man comes in, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's the, he's the one who came third in this presidential election. And when you look at the people who are voting for him, this is where it gets really interesting. Have a look at this. When it comes to age, well, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's voters tend to be younger. Certainly, he attracts a big crowd of young voters, but he does attract a fair chunk of the 50 to 70 age range when it comes to education. 43% of people who support uh, um, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon are college graduates. And when it comes to income, well, bearing in mind that 2,000 euros is, as a monthly income is roughly the median monthly income here in France, well, he attracts a lot of low and mid-income mid earners, but he also attracts almost 40% of mid to top income earners. So that's really important when you look at things like um, how these Mélenchon voters voted in uh, this election, why they chose Emmanuel Macron. Look at this. 91% of them say 
they voted for Emmanuel Macron to block Marine Le Pen. So this was really not a vote of conviction, and it's something that he's certainly hoping to bank on. He's looking forward now to those parliamentary elections. He's already called on his supporters uh, to help elect him Prime Minister, because indeed, if Emmanuel Macron's party doesn't get a majority in those parliamentary elections in June, well, he could face a situation where he has to share power with a prime minister of another party. And indeed, our polling partners at Ipsos put the question to 4,000 French voters, what do they want? And 56% of them said they would like to see the situation where Emmanuel Macron's party loses that parliamentary election and is forced to share power with uh, another party. And of that 56%, 84% of them were Mélenchon voters, Jeannie. Tip G, thank you for that. Well, this was Marine Le Pen's third run for the presidency. The 53-year-old leader of the far right was hoping to become France's first woman president, but she lost again to Emmanuel Macron after their initial face-to-face -face in 2017. Speaking earlier tonight, Le Pen said her score was still a victory for the national rally and that her focus now is on the upcoming parliamentary election in June. The national rally will strive to unite all those people from whatever their background, those who wish to rally together to stand up against Emmanuel Macron, those who wish to have candidates in their local communities, be they in France or in our overseas territories. I call on you to come out in your numbers and vote for them. Vote for the national rally. France 24's Florence Villeneuve is at Marine Le Pen's headquarters. Uh, Marine Le Pen didn't say she was giving up politics exactly, did she, Flo, even though that's what had been rumored if she had I lost? Flo, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, Jeannie. Sorry, I got... I got... <laughs> Yes, indeed. Marine Le Pen uh, did say uh, that she was going to continue fighting for the French people in her concession speech. Uh, now, just what that means is unclear. Going into this election, as you said, she was saying it was going to be her final run. This is her third presidential election. Now, it's uncertain. It does seem like she's going to stick around to fight for her party, perhaps, uh, first of all, in the legislative elections, of course, that are coming up in June. Uh, we spoke to one of her aides earlier uh, who said that uh, for all of those who are burying uh, Marine Le Pen right now and thinking that she's just going to go and take care of her cats because she is very a big fan of cats, it must be said, they don't know her. She's going to stick around and fight. This isn't the last you've heard of Marine Le Pen. You can see, perhaps, uh, behind me, the party is uh, wrapping up. Sorry, that's why I got a little distracted. They've been turning on and off the lights. They just uh, uh, moved the uh, podium. They're uh, folding up the flags. But up until just recently, they were still serving drinks. And you might be able to see behind me, there's still quite a lot of Marine Le Pen supporters here. So you've got to hand it to them. They uh, weren't uh, sore losers tonight. They were definitely, uh, uh, at first, they were long faces. But now they have their eyes set on the parliamentary election. And indeed, we spoke to many of the supporters who said, look, this is a better result than, uh, than five years ago. This is progress. We're here to stay. Uh, and in that, indeed, that is one thing that a lot of people are saying about Marine Le Pen, is that she transformed her party from a fringe party into a mainstream party. So it's game over for now. But what's interesting is, in many ways, Marine Le Pen managed to transform her to feet tonight into a victory for the future. Thanks for that. Uh, now, as we were saying uh, earlier, the far right has definitely been on the rise here in France. We saw it in the first round uh, with uh, Eric Zemmour, who you'll remember is that TV pundit who kind of came out of nowhere, a Trump-like figure, and ended up taking about 7 percent in the first round of the vote. He called for his supporters to vote for Marine Le Pen. Let's hear what he had to say earlier after the results came out. Let's build as soon as possible the first coalition of patriots on the right, with elected representatives of Reconquest, of the National Rally, of Début la France, and Les Républicains, who don't wish to align with Emmanuel Macron, so we have a chance to dominate the next parliament. Angela Diffley, what is next for the far right? Is he right? Do they have a chance to dominate the French parliament? Well, he, it, the right will reconfigure and some of uh, the mainstream Republican Party will head towards Emmanuel Macron's party. Some of them will head towards Eric Zemmour's party. It's interesting on the far right in France that there are two big constituencies, really. Marine Le Pen's voters tended to be more low-income, 
nationalist, protectionist uh, voters. Eric Zemmour's were more highly educated. He's much more liberally economic. And so uh, it, what it remains to be seen is, is how all of that will reconfigure on the right. Zemmour himself proved unpopular with the French. He's not a natural politician. He came across as too brutal, too uncompromising. But a rising star in his party is Marine Le Pen's niece, uh, Marion Maréchal, who actually she in some ways brought up. She shared the upbringing of uh, Marion Maréchal with her sister. And so it's a fascinating relationship. The niece has now crossed over to Zemmour's side. There is no love lost between the two parties on the right at all. Marine Le Pen feels very bitter about the way she was betrayed by some of them. So it's, it's hard to see how all of that's going to work out. But she is a rising star. It's more socially conservative as well. There's a more far right than Marine Le Pen's, which is more to do with money and a nationalist sentiment. Right. The niece and Zamor are more in favour of things or against things like a marriage and that sort of thing. That's right. Catherine Nicholson, there has been lots of reaction that's been coming in since we've gotten this result of Emmanuel Macron, mm. who's won the presidency for a second time. Tell us a bit more about what people have been saying around Europe. Around Europe, well, uh, as we've heard from uh, our Brussels correspondent Dave Keating earlier and also from our Berlin correspondent Nick Spicer, there are a lot of uh, leaders of EU nations who are breathing an audible sigh of relief doing so on Twitter. Uh, we even in the last few days before this vote had three major European states leaders come together. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany and the Prime Ministers of Spain and of Portugal, uh, Pedro Sanchez and Antonio Costa uh, respectively, coming together writing uh, an op-ed or an open letter published in the very respected French broadsheet Le Monde uh, calling for uh, French voters uh, to vote against the candidate of the extreme right. Now they were Careful not to mention names in this uh, in this op-ed, um, as EU leaders are often careful to be not seen as interfering in domestic politics. But I mean, they really were making it very obvious who they wanted people to vote for. They wanted people in France to vote for Emmanuel Macron. They talked about it as being extremely uh, important for the future of Europe. Uh, and this is what we're seeing reflected in some of the reaction today. You know, we're hearing uh, warm congratulations from all across the bloc. Uh, it, and then also from uh, institutional leaders of EU institutions as well. So Ursula von der Leyen, very quick to congratulate Macron, talking about wanting to move France and Europe forward together. And I think that this all echoes something that Emmanuel Macron has tried to carry through in his campaigning as well. Uh, we know that uh, at the end of the first round of voting, uh, when it was clear that he was going into the second round, he told French voters, this is a vote on France's future and it's a referendum on Europe's future as well. Uh, and, uh, and I think he wasn't wrong because the positions on Europe of Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen were so very different. Doug, what about from outside of Europe, a similar sigh of relief? It's Look, it's all of, of a package here. You can't really dissociate Europe from the outside Europe part. But, the, you know, this audible sigh of, sigh of relief can also be heard, obviously, transatlantic from the U.S. You know, we had been, you know, seeing lots of signals from the White House that they were literally having, uh, you know, uh, night sweats in the middle of the night over the prospect that you would have a far right, right wing populist uh, such as Marine Le Pen uh, elected. And look, France went right up from, from the perspective of much of the outside world, obviously not all of it, because there are, are sympathizers with Le Pen and even uh, those who, who rooted for her, you know, perhaps implicitly, if not explicitly, uh, Vladimir uh, Putin, you know, prime among them. But there was this real sense looking on that uh, France drove up to the cliff edge and just narrowly missed falling off, uh, you know. Think of it. Over the past few years, you've had far-right populism in Europe, right? The EU alone, you know, which is Catherine's beat, obviously, but also goes to the EU. You've had EU nationalism. You've had Brexit. You've had Donald Trump. You've had the immigration crisis. On top of it, you have the war in Ukraine. All of these weren't just challenges to Europe. They gave extra, uh, really a new lease on life to a lot of the populace who had been rising, rising, rising. Uh, and, and this really, it's not that it pulls the plug on them entirely. They're still out there. Uh, they are still very much, uh, you know, uh, looming as a potential electoral threat in a lot of countries. Um, but the fact of the matter is, this, the, that audible sigh of relief is also a sigh of relief that at least perhaps France just bought five more years. At the very least, what we know is that 
Emmanuel Macron is a head of state who has been on record as saying that he believes in maintaining open dialogue with leaders, even those that he might viscerally disagree with, have great differences with. He did it with Trump in the United States. Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron, there's a lot of smiling and handshaking. They don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And Emmanuel Macron, you know, has sometimes rubbed the U.S. the wrong way with his talk of more European sovereignty, uh, drawing away, if not from NATO, at least giving a European defense a little, uh, a little bit more influence. That sometimes rubbed some in Washington the wrong way. But look, bottom line here, bottom line, I'll wrap on this, is that Washington, Washington and, uh, and, and Paris right now know that they'll be at least be on much of the same wavelength for, this, for the next five years. France has bought itself some time. It's not out of the woods. Catherine. And just in terms of uh, those partnerships moving forward, uh, let's not forget that it's only six months since Germany's general election that brought Olaf Scholz into power as Chancellor, along with his Green and Liberal uh, coalition partners. Uh, so both Germany and France now have these pro-European governments, these pro-European leaders in place for the next few few years at least and uh, important to point out as well that the first phone call that Emmanuel Macron got from a foreign leader was from Olaf Scholz, uh, the Chancellor of Germany and this uh, Franco-German couple uh, seems to be, uh, you know, being given a, a new little boost with Emmanuel Macron's uh, re-election. So of course not just reaction from outside France, plenty of reaction from inside the country as well. Let's listen uh, to some voters. I don't understand the people who don't vote. For me, it's an obligation. We must vote against extremes and fascism and all that goes with it. It's not the candidate I would have chosen in the first place, but it's important to fulfill my civic duty anyway and vote. As a woman, you must remember that there were lots of women who protested for the right to vote even in the last century. So that's why I'm voting. There are some people talking about the importance of voting in France. Uh, certainly is important here, but there was a pretty high abstention rate. Again, just to remind everyone, over 28 percent. Well, let's go now to the Le Pen headquarters. Marine Le Pen lost, of course, the election with 41 percent of the vote compared to 58.8 for Emmanuel Macron. Alison, what's happening there now? Is anyone still there? Uh, just barely, Jeannie. Things are really shutting down. You can say they had, uh, they're just shut down the bar. They're wheeling it away. Uh, everything's coming down on the stage. Some people are still here, though. I'm actually here with uh, Laurent Jacobelli, who's a close ally of Marine Le Pen. Um, can you tell us how you feel about tonight's result? Oh, of course, we would, uh, we would have uh, liked to win this uh, election, and we are very sad that uh, President Macron will uh, run the country for five more years, because uh, the former five years were a disaster. But French citizens have told us, you are the first and only uh, strength of opposition to Emmanuel Macron. And we are very proud of that, and we uh, already prepare the next election, uh, because you know that we will have to elect in a few uh, months the French MPs, and uh, the more MPs of the national rally you will get, the more we will be able to fight against the policy of uh, Emmanuel Macron. And believe me, we have to do that. There was another pretty strong opposition candidate, a far left Jean-Luc Mélenchon. So you guys weren't the only ones. Uh, what do you think that the campaign needed to do better? I think that Jean-Luc Mélenchon is not an opponent uh, to Emmanuel Macron because at the end he told to the French uh, uh, voters to vote for Emmanuel Macron. So he is in the same, uh, on the same uh, side uh, of, uh, the politic, uh, of the political life of France. So people know now that they cannot trust him if they want to fight against uh, 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 the new uh, pension, uh, pensioners uh, reform, if they want more security, if they want less uh, immigration in France, they have only one solution to vote for national rally and probably that's the main uh, 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 conclusion we can have uh, tonight after the results of the election. And finally, Mr. Jacobelli, uh, do you believe that Marine Le Pen is the best and only person to continue leading the party going forward? Of course she is, because, as you probably uh, noticed, is the best uh, result we have ever had. Uh, French citizens love Marine Le Pen. When you uh, uh, go uh, to do the campaign with her, they don't say uh, uh, lady or missus, they call her Marine. It's part of the family, of the French family. And believe me, we still have a lot of to do to protect and help the French citizens.
Marco Belli, the close ally of Marine Le Pen. Thank you very much for speaking with us. I can say that a lot of supporters uh, echoed this sentiment. Lots of love for Marine Le Pen here tonight. Many want to continue to see her going forward. Uh, they keep reminding us that this is the best score the party has ever gotten. So even though it is yet another loss for them, it's all just part of the constant climb uh, that's going to, for them, they believe, uh, bring the party to power in five years from now. Okay, Allison, thanks for that. Allison Sargent there from Marine Le Pen's headquarters. Of course, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, where she was quite strong in her campaign, was really trying to get voters by talking about the cost of living, the, the problems of the pocketbook. And, and a big challenge that's facing France at the moment is the rising cost of energy. It's only gotten worse, of course, since Russia invaded Ukraine two months ago. Emmanuel Macron, though, says he's not just looking for energy independence from Russia. His focus is also on the environment. Antonia Kerrigan takes a look. It's June of 2017, and France's newly elected president is out to send a strong message. Donald Trump has just withdrawn the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, and Emmanuel Macron takes on the role of climate leader. We all share the same responsibility. Make our planet great again. Five years later, and many say this is a responsibility he never took seriously. Macron's track record has been disastrous, a half-baked job. When he talks about the climate crisis, he's mocking us, and that's dangerous, as it lets people think the problem is being handled. So what went wrong? In 2018, with one eye on the Paris Agreement, Macron makes his first climate move, a fuel tax hike. The proposal is met with violent backlash, thousands taking to the street and marking the beginning of the Yellow Vest movement. The measure was eventually scrapped, but across the country, pressure is mounting on the government to put climate action first. In 2019, to regain credibility, President Macron launches the so-called Citizens' Convention for the Climate. 150 people chosen at random to create a roadmap towards France's target of a 40% emissions cut by 2030. 149 proposals were submitted, but only 10% make it to Parliament. Activists denouncing the government's lack of ambition. The second biggest polluter in the EU, France has failed to cut emissions in line with its neighbours. And in 2021, a French court convicted the state of failing to address the climate crisis and honour its commitments under the Paris Agreement. A historic ruling and a damning indictment of Macron's climate policy. Yet some analysts defend his climate record, including one former ministerial advisor. The budget invested to combat climate chaos is at approximately the right level to meet our objective of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent by 2030. According to Macron's very own High Council for the Climate, France needs to be cutting emissions at double its current rate. Alarm bells are growing louder, and this time around, Emmanuel Macron may find them harder to ignore. Okay, so what about Macron going forward when it comes to his specific green plan, Kate? Uh, well, Jeannie, this evening we heard from Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and he described uh, Macron's lack of action on the environment as a crime. Uh, and we have really seen Macron trying to reshape his campaign uh, in the last few months, but especially the last few weeks, to try to court those Mélenchon voters for, her, for whom the environment was such an important issue. Uh, he did say uh, on Wednesday in that TV debate that he would make his that he would appoint his prime minister to be in charge of all things environment uh, and the environmental transition. Uh, what he said in the past is that he wants to phase out coal uh, and gas in France. He wants to make France carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, we saw in the last five years a real U-turn for him over the question of nuclear power, which he initially wanted to phase out. Uh, he then stepped back on that just uh, in the last year or so and said that he wanted to build six new nuclear power centers in France. Uh, EDF, the national uh, uh, ener energy uh, giant, actually says that's going to cost around 50 billion euros. So we'll keep an eye on that price. Uh, there could be possibly a as many as 14 nuclear reactors going forward. Um, he said he wants to have 50 offshore wind parks by 2050 as well. Uh, remember, Marine Le Pen had been campaigning, saying that she wanted to take down all wind turbines, so a real difference of opinion there. Uh, Macron has said he wants to have more subsidies for things like renewable energy, for helping households and businesses convert to a more uh, sustainable way of life, helping to make uh, buildings better, uh, better insulated, helping them to install solar panels, helping people buy hydro hybrid or electric cars or even bikes. Um, 
in a, along with all of this, we've also heard him starting to link this environmental transition, this shift to renewable energy, to the idea of becoming more energy independent. Uh, we've heard it a lot more since, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's been a trend uh, across the world, but particularly here in Europe, uh, which imports about a quarter of its oil and 40 percent of its natural gas from Russia. France is less dependent uh, on Russia than the rest of the bloc, but it's been a real a real talking point for Emmanuel Macron in the last few weeks. Again, push it, he says pushing ahead with this renewable energy push is going to help us become more energy independent and give a little tap to Moscow there as well. Right. Of course, all of this is happening as the war in Ukraine was definitely overshadowing this presidential campaign. Uh, Doug, is there any likelihood that Macron's Ukraine policy or its policy on Russia will shift in the weeks and months ahead? Well, it seems that actually uh, the French had been sort of secret, quietly been very much on board trying to get, you know, some weapons and as much support as they can uh, to, to Kiev as possible in the past, you know, days and weeks. It hasn't been made very explicit in public. I think that's going to change. I think there's going to be perhaps a more forceful uh, French response uh, and, and presence sort of in in. in in Ukraine, on Ukraine's side, uh, you know, the U this has been there's been a lot of talk of this as becoming sort of the U.S.'s proxy war. It's been so lopsided in the amount of heavy weaponry and and, and aid that has been provided from the U.S. versus all of Europe, you know, combined. It's been you know billions and billions of dollars from the U.S. and France has had sort of a pipsqueak role by comparison in terms of concrete aid. Look, what's clear is that the war in Ukraine was an albatross around Marine Le Pen's neck because try as she might to convince the voters and started the debate by saying how much she was in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, how her views about Putin had changed, and so on and so forth. No one really bought it. They knew that she was an apologist for and a sympathizer with Vladimir v Putin. Nothing she said would change that perception. The fact of the matter is Emmanuel Macron has uh, devoted a lot of the past few months, not just on the phone with Putin, but also trying to breathe new light and resuscitate NATO, bring together the wall of unity, of support for Ukraine. That was a wall that Marine Le Pen threatened to basically uh, send crumbling down. So that is one thing that perhaps is in safer hands tonight. As far as his policy going forward, don't be surprised if he makes a surprise visit to Kiev in the coming uh, days and weeks. He's been under a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of nagging from uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, to do so. A lot of other leaders have already gone. He might want to do that as one of his early presidential acts as a strong statement of support and put his uh, sort of money where his mouth is, so to speak. Well, France has been America's oldest ally for centuries now. And to see how this election is being seen in the United States, let's bring in our Washington correspondent, Kethavan Gorgiastan. Kethavan. Yes, well, we're still waiting for an official uh, statement or comment from the White House uh, regarding uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, re-election. Uh, I did speak to someone at the White House who said that it should be coming soon, that they were waiting uh, to hear Emmanuel Macron's speech, and they were uh, saying that they would be putting out a statement after uh, the French president had spoken. So uh, we are expecting this to happen any time now, but there is a, a real a sigh of relief here in Washington, especially among the Biden administration, because, of course, despite some disagreements uh, over uh, the past year, uh, Joe Biden has uh, really seen Emmanuel Macron as a key partner in what he's been uh, calling the rebuilding of uh, the NATO alliance, the rebuilding of the Western alliance, the battle between democracies and autocracies. And really, Emmanuel Macron has been one of his uh, go-to partners uh, in uh, the, these efforts, and especially uh, given the context with uh, Russia's uh, war in uh, Ukraine. And he's really uh, leaned on Emmanuel Macron uh, as a sort of his go-to in Europe, but also uh, as his partner in trying to get uh, those uh, Western allies together in sanctions against uh, Russia in support for uh, Ukraine. And so uh, when I spoke to uh, administration members as well as uh, con congressional uh, leadership, on both sides uh, before uh, the uh, second round, they were saying that they were worried about that, about how much Marine Le Pen could be a challenge to this alliance. And so uh, there is a really a sense that uh, this was close. Uh, but that uh, they uh, are now comforted by the, the fact that uh, this partner that they've uh, so closely cooperated with is still going to be there going forward.
this, of course, is despite that big falling out between France and the U.S. last fall over that submarine deal. Would you say Emmanuel Macron and Joe Biden are back on track? Yes, that was a, a pretty a big crisis, uh, but uh, it seems like uh, the the two leaders have uh, moved on from there. And uh, it might have been also, uh, it's seen at least uh, by some here in Washington, D.C., as a sort of wake-up call for the Biden administration regarding uh, Europe as a whole, but France more particularly, and how much they needed to be in closer cooperation. And so uh, we've seen this uh, really uh, happening in front of our eyes with uh, the situation in Ukraine. And maybe if that crisis hadn't happened, there might have uh, not been those uh, very close contacts that they really uh, focused on right after the AUKUS uh, deal, uh, talking between uh, the ambassador here, uh, the ambassador in France, uh, the uh, foreign ministers, the defense ministers. And so there's really uh, been an increase in cooperation in day-to-day -day talks between the French and the Americans uh, really since uh, that uh, crisis, which was a low point between Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron. And uh, really, uh, since the Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine, you've seen uh, the two leaders, but also mostly the two countries, the two administrations, uh, really working closely and putting all of that AUKUS deal crisis in the past. Katha Van Gorgistani, they're reporting for us from Washington. Well, for more on international reaction, let's now go to Deep Tika Laurent. Well, let's start with Liberation France's left-leaning paper. They've already released their front page for Monday morning, and the headline reads, Yes, Emmanuel Macron is re-elected, but thanks to whom? And that really is obviously uh, an allusion to all the people who voted for Emmanuel Macron, not by conviction, but really to block the far right. Uh, let's look at Le Monde now. They're also obviously headlining on Emmanuel Macron's re-election. But what's interesting is here they say the hard bit become the hard the hard part become starts now. That's really the sentiment in the French papers right now. And finally, you have L'Opinion, which is a right-wing paper which calls. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's re-election and a, uh, an exceptional moment for France that's dis that's disillusioned for France that's really disenfranchised. Let's show you now uh, some of the papers around Europe. Uh, the Frankfurter Allgemeine, the German paper, has a really interesting headline uh, in which they basically hail Emmanuel Macron's courage in standing for his convictions and they really say that they hope that uh, the government in Berlin can follow in his footsteps perhaps an allusion uh, to the uh, to how the German government has handled uh, the war in Ukraine now uh, heading over to Le Temps, which is the Swiss paper well uh, they talk uh, also about how this is very much a vote for Europe not just for France that Emmanuel Macron represents uh, a, a pro Europe um, position and uh, they also do mention that he his re-election was certainly aided by his handling of uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, let's uh, show you now El País, which calls his victory a clear victory over Marine Le Pen. Uh, no doubt about it, the Spanish paper says. The Daily Telegraph, the British paper, also headlining on Emmanuel Macron's re-election. Uh, the, the headline is very interesting, but what's interesting is the little sidebar here that says that Marine Le Pen may be defeated but she's celebrating a French election result uh, that took her closer to power than ever. So uh, it's all in the details. Uh, let's cross uh, to the U.S. now where we can show you the New York Times on their front page. Macron is re-elected as French president, defeating uh, Le Pen. Uh, they call the election results bittersweet for Marine Le Pen, once again focusing on her result as well, noting that she added several percentage points to her score in 2017, Jeannie. Dipti, thanks so much for that. This is our continuing coverage of the French presidential election. Emmanuel Macron has been re-elected, bringing in 58% of the vote and beating his far-right opponent, Marine Le Pen, for the second time in a row. Karis Garland has a closer look now at the results. Cheers of celebration erupt at the foot of the Eiffel Tower as Emmanuel Macron is re-elected French president. Macron, president, Macron, president, Macron, president. Supporters waved French and EU flags as early results appeared on a giant television screen. By 10 p.m., projections showed Macron with more than 58% of the vote, making his margin of victory slimmer than when he first beat Marine Le Pen in 2017. 
On a eu un peu peur, là c'est extraordinaire, on est aux anges, vraiment, je suis ravie, je suis très heureuse. The president later took to the stage pledging to unite the country. Je veux remercier l'ensemble des Françaises et des Français qui, au premier puis au deuxième tour, m'ont accordé leur confiance afin de faire advenir notre projet pour une France plus indépendante, une Europe plus forte, et par des investissements et des changements profonds, continuer d'assurer des progrès concrets pour chacun. Meanwhile, the election results were met with boos and whistles from Le Pen supporters. Euh, je suis déçu, je suis très déçu. Et euh, franchement, il euh, y a un écart. Euh, je pensais pas qu'il y aurait eu autant d'écart. Et bah, nous l'a reparti quoi pour ça euh, dans la mouise. Although she conceded defeat, the far-right leader said the numbers represented a brilliant victory and vowed to focus her energy on parliamentary elections in June. Pollsters expect the abstention rate to sit at 28%, the highest since 1969. The figure reflects widespread disillusion with Macron's domestic record. With me on the set to talk about Macron's win, we have France 24's election commentator, Angela Diffley, our international affairs commentator, Doug Herbert, our Africa editor, welcome, Georgia, Georgia Calvin-Smith, and our business editor, Kate Moody, also with us tonight, Deepti Galeran, who is giving us a constant breakdown of the different estimates from voting in France's presidential election. Well. We're going to turn to Angela Diffley now, and I think this is something that might actually interest a lot of our international viewers. We talk a lot about Macron's policies. We talk a lot about the problems surrounding Macron. But I feel like in this election cycle, we've talked a lot more about who he is as a person. Just, just remind us, remind our viewers a little bit of Macron's backstory, if you will. The most obvious bit of his backstory, which I don't think people forget once they've heard it, is, of course, Brigitte Macron, the story of how 15-year-old Emmanuel Macron and his drama teacher fell in love and uh, and now they're married many years later. It's an astonishing story. She's 25 years older than he is. And it is very, very remarkable in any sphere and particularly in politics. Aside from that, he uh, grew up in Amiens in northern France. He went to a Jesuit private Catholic school. Uh, his parents were both doctors. And what is really notable about Emmanuel Macron is that he has hardly ever failed at anything. Uh, and that, I think, marks the way he sees the world. Apart from uh, an exam to get into uh, the École Normale Supérieure, one of the top schools in France, which he failed twice, he has pretty much sailed through. Life is extremely brilliant. He loves literature. He's very, very cultured. And he has, at every step of the way, succeeded. And another notable thing, I think, is that when he won his election in 2017, he had never actually stood for anything before. So he had never canvassed. So he had never knocked on the doors of French people and said, will you vote for me? And there is a sense that he doesn't really know the French people very well. He grew up, went to Paris, had a glittering career as a banker. Then he was an economy minister. When we talked about him in 27 as an outsider, he wasn't an outsider in the sense that Donald Trump was an outsider, a business person. Emmanuel Macron had been inside the system. He had been an economy minister. And he had never really stood in an election, which makes it all the more remarkable that he won. But I also think that perhaps he doesn't really know the French people. Once you become president, you're never going to get to know the French people because people don't speak to you in the same way. And I think that perhaps that is where this image of this rather aloof person has come from. He also said when he started off his uh, five-year presidency, uh, I will be a Jupiterian president, mm -hmm. meaning I will not get involved in the day-to-day -day stuff. I will stand above everything and make big decisions. That's changed. All of that's changed. He's learned from his mistakes. He's learned especially from the Gilets Jaunes crisis, which really rocked him. That was outside metropolitan Paris, people saying, you don't get us. Angela, thanks for that. Okay, we're going to step away from France for a moment to see how this election was being watched in Africa with France 24 Hanan Fajani, who joins me from Abidjan. Hanan, what's the feeling like there in Ivory Coast? Are people reacting? 
Well, um, yeah, we've been speak speaking for the last few uh, hours with uh, various, uh, you know, Ivorians, but also French people here, and we've heard quite a few, you know, reactions, mixed reactions, to say the least. Some people have uh, just bluntly told us, I want to say older Ivorians, that uh, they were not concerned at all about what's happening in France and that, uh, you know, the outcome of this election does not concern them or has uh, an impact on them. On the other hand, younger Ivorians seemed a little bit more concerned, a little bit more engaged in, in this outcome. Some of them have told us that, uh, well, they were simply relieved that the French uh, electorate, the French voters, decided to sort of block uh, Marine Le Pen, far-right candidate Marine Le Pen, from, you know, getting into office because they were really worried that France would turn inwards and just close off to the rest of the world and that that would, you know, have a sort of a, an impact on them, especially when it comes to immigration uh, issues. Now, when it comes to, uh, to French uh, residents here, some of them, you know, told us that they weren't, ne weren't necessarily uh, celebrating anything uh, tonight. They were relieved, of course, but not uh, necessarily uh, celebrating uh, this uh, result, uh, as uh, some of them don't necessarily see themselves uh, represented by uh, Emmanuel Macron and would have wished for, uh, you know, a different uh, candidate to make it. Uh, but all in all, there, were, there is a sense that, um, you know, not everybody uh, believes that this is uh, something that impacts, uh, you know, Ivorians, but also uh, French uh, people here in Ivory Coast. The ones who are not uh, in France because, you know, their day-to-day day -day life uh, is quite different. Now, when it comes to turnout, I, I would just like to add that uh, it's quite a low compared to the first round. Uh, today, the, the, the voters turnout hovered around 31.4% uh, compared to 34% uh, two weeks ago. France recently began to draw down its forces in the Sahel region, uh, pulling out of Mali altogether. What would you say are the biggest challenges going to be for Macron coming up in the region? Well, there, there are quite a few challenges that uh, await him. Uh, if you look at the way that, you know, relations between France and the West African region, but in particular uh, Sahel uh, nations uh, have, uh, you know, sort of deteriorated in the last few months. And I'm speaking uh, specifically of the Malian case, Mali, which, you know, has been marred with uh, political turmoil and, you know, this growing uh, terrorism uh, threats, uh, which uh, a lot of uh, Malians see as sort of the result of an inefficient uh, uh, battle battle front from, uh, you know, the French troops, the Bakan mission, which have been uh, involved in the country for the last decade. So there's the sense of a growing, you know, anti-French uh, sentiment uh, in, the, in, in Mali and in the region. Of course, it doesn't necessarily represent the, the opinion of, of the whole population, but uh, uh, experts are saying that, uh, you know, France is sort of losing its grip and, and influence uh, over the region. So that, of course, will uh, be a challenge for Emmanuel Macron uh, in the next few months, especially as the Bakan mission has been, uh, you know, asked by the military junta in Mali to, to simply leave uh, the country, and they've accepted to do so. Of course, that will happen uh, gradually. And now the next step will also be to just figure out how to, uh, you know, deploy uh, the French troops in uh, Niger, that is a neighboring country that's accepted to uh, host, you know, the Tapcuba, sort of European uh, partnership uh, mission uh, against uh, uh, terrorism. For that, and on for Johnny, they're reporting for us from Abidjan. Well, our Africa editor, Georgia Calvin-Smith, is with me on the set as well. Georgia, how much was actually said about Africa during the campaign? I think we could get a sense of, uh, of it from what Hanan was saying. Um, in the campaign itself, not a lot. Um, in terms of the attention from Africa towards France, there wasn't that much of an interest. In fact, looking at some of the coverage from media on the continent, there were actually some very kind of blatant statements saying, you know, either way, it really won't change things very much. Even with Le Pen's um, uh, far right stance, their perception is that relations between Africa and France haven't actually advanced that much under Macron, despite um, his his efforts. And whatever happens in France basically is very unlikely to affect um, deeply uh, the relationships between Africa and the country. However, um, that doesn't mean that the French diaspora in France weren't watching the campaigns of both 
candidates very, very closely, because it was more through the prism of some of the very kind of domestic issues that I think that the, that the specific concerns of the French, the African diaspora in France would be, um, would be treated, which is, you know, immigration, um, Le Pen's uh, focus on, on uh, nationals first, trying to um, clamp down, clamp down on um, asylum, the, the asylum process, making it more difficult to apply for nationality, um, even going so far as, as wanting uh, to make conditions for, you know, Algerian officials who wanted to buy property in France tied to the country's willingness to take back uh, nationals who may be in the country and may be unwanted for whatever reason. Um, and uh, even though we saw, so over the weekend, um, Macron may have left it a bit late in the day, but tried to reach out to some of the communities that host a particularly large uh, diaspora community. So he went to Saint-Denis, which is a department to the northeast of Paris over the weekend. And, um, you know, there he tried to kind of get a bit of face-to-face -face time with a lot of the African, um, African heritage communities there. Now, it's one of the poorest communities in the country. Um, it had one of the highest abstention rates in the first round. It doesn't look like things were much better in the second round. And the concerns of people there are very much the same as throughout the country, which is, you know, uh, security, well, not security as, as such, but like jobs, money, um, health. Uh, but there is also um, a certain feeling of disenfranchisement, which is why, you know, that, that feeds into that, that high abstention rate. Mm -hmm. And there was even a call from about 14 uh, mayors from Saint-Denis that was published in the Huffington Post after the first round with that high abstention rate, begging them to please go out and, uh, and vote. Because whatever your situation is, whatever the feeling that you might have that Macron hasn't delivered for you, Le Pen would be worse. And, and just before I, I, I wrap up, there was one thing that really struck me that was said by, uh, by the owner of a boxing ring there, which was that he had face-to-face -face time with Macron, and he, Macron was like, what can I do? And he said, um, you have to make the people of this department feel that the Republic cares about them. And that really does strike towards this feeling of this, this question of identity, which is particularly felt by African uh, heritage French voters. Mm. Doug, what about going forward? What are going to be the main foreign policy priorities for Macron now? Yeah, well, just picking up on the Africa theme, I mean, one of the big themes uh, in the Sahel region was obviously uh, France having to draw down its forces uh, in Mali. And, you know, a lot of his critics really piled into uh, Macron for this. You know, I, I, Andrew was talking about the fact that he's been, you know, only successes in his life. You know, his critics would say, well, this was a, a major Unsuccess. This was a failure of the of the, the fact Just that he could successes up until the present. Yeah, no, absolutely, no, 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 no. I agree. I, she's spot on everything she says. But in this particular uh, moment, critics said, you know, he failed in Mali. You know, the French forces were there. It became sort of like, you know, the U.S. and Iraq and Afghanistan and America and Vietnam, and they ended up having to pull out in disgrace, which really is a very small part, as a partial window into that story. Um, so I think going ahead. I think uh, the scales have fallen from his eyes a lot of respect in the relationship with Africa. I think he has been trying to be up, very for, upfront and, and honest in the relations, trying to pull away from that sort of historical traditional model called France-Afrique, you know, the incestuous relationship, if you will, between French leadership and the African continent and sort of almost a co colonial era type relationship. I think he's going to continue to try to push through with that, but with fewer illusions about the nature of a lot of the leaders in place in that region. I think he's very disappointed. I think George would probably agree with this. Yeah. Very very disappointed in the leadership in a lot of those countries, especially especially Mali, where we saw two coups in, in the space of a year. Um, and he basically was like, you know, I want to do business. I want I want to deal with you on an equal basis. I don't want this to be a clone. But, you know, I can only deal with you if we sort of embrace or meet halfway on our values here. Georgia, how do you see France's relationship with Africa moving forward well, with this result? I, I think that, you know, talking about that disappointment, I think it goes both ways. Because, um, you know, picking up on what Angela was saying about, you know, his the very way that he presents himself, there is unfortunately, an echo of this really long um, perception of a, of a French arrogance in terms of its, its relationship with Africa that is embodied in the way that Macron deals with the continent. So maybe it's from naivety, maybe it's from idealism. However, um, it does 
uh, create friction. Now, in, uh, I think it was 2021... Yes, it, I think it was in 20... Last year, um, there was a, uh, a, a sudden impromptu calling of the leaders of the G5 summit, G5 summit, I'm sorry, G5 Sahel, to pick themselves up and head over to Po, yeah. like a mountain village <laughs> in <West> France, <laughs> to like, yeah. you know, to, to talk about um, talk about security in their region. And, uh, you know, there were comments from those leaders saying that Macron's attitude caused some problems because there's this very kind of proprietorial, like, you know, I'm here to help you. And so when I call, you must come. And then that feeds into another feeling of hypocrisy, because even though France has invested a lot in trying to um, help the Sahel kind of tackle uh, the, the fight against jihadism, um, the very military strategy itself, I think Hanan alluded to it, <clears throat> has caused some problems. It's very kind of uh, tone deaf to local politics. It's very tone deaf to local allegiances. Um, and, it, and even the reliance of leaders upon France has led in to their own, um, uh, to frustrations their own people have against them. So IBK, uh, the former Malian leader, uh, part of what led to the coup against him was a bunch of demonstrations informed by the fact that people are like you're relying on France and like you're not doing enough for for us ourselves and and so this then also we look at you know the, there's been a, 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 a unconstitutional handover of power in Chad um, after the death of the Chadian leader. And then you compare the relation, the, the response of France to uh, the Malian coup and what happened in Chad, and there is a real hypocrisy there, a sense of hip hypocrisy, in that Chad's got the backing, even though the handover was, was unconstitutional, yet France has really drawn a line in the sand in terms of, of Mali, you know, say, taking its time over what comes next. I could just pick up on that. I think in fairness... Very briefly. Okay. Mali did ask France yes, to intervene. The, but the uh, relationship under was Hollande, disintegrating. That, yes, I think should be pointed out. Yeah, true. And it's actually a very unpopular war in France. People were delighted when Macron decided to draw down. Mm -hmm. People thought, why are soldiers losing their, losing their lives far away in Mali? We don't get this war. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit more complicated. But from the perspective now. of the, the perception of France's attitude towards the continent, that is one of the issues that comes up mm. as, as being a representation of, of kind of like double standards. The facts may not necessarily, you know, uphold that, but perception. What, what we're talking about is the perception of the potential of a, of a two-way, open, balanced relationship between Macron and the continent. And unfortunately, you know, Macron, like, you know, has said that he wants to change and he is changing, but he has those hurdles to overcome. Georgia, thank you so much for that. Uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, winning the election. A lot of challenges ahead. Uh, unfortunately for Marine Le Pen, it's the end of the road, at least for this run for the presidency. It was her third time trying to get the Elysee presidential palace. It was not meant to be. Despite that loss, she still brought in close to 10 percent more votes than she did in her last run five years ago. She now says the fight is far from over. I fear this evening that the five-year term now beginning will not stop the contemptuous, brutal practices we saw in the previous term. And Emmanuel Macron will do nothing to repair the fractures which divide our country and make our compatriots suffer. So yes, to avoid these few people monopolizing power, more than ever I will continue my commitment to France and the French people with the energy, perseverance and affection that you know me for. Angela Diffley, I know it's hard to sum up in just a few sentences, but why do you think Marine Le Pen lost? I think that the, the big issue is competency. She doesn't come across as fully competent. It was very obvious in the debate with uh, Emmanuel Macron. He was absolutely in command of all the details, had a full grasp of all the issues. And although she's a lawyer, and although she was much better prepared than in 2017, which was disastrous, she herself comes across as quite hesitant. And you feel somehow you're not quite clear whether you can entrust some of these big issues to her. I think that's what a lot of people said to me, that after the debate, they felt the competence issue was still there. I think that's the main reason that she, she failed to pull it off.
Kate, do you want to add something? And, well, just in that debate, I mean, she, you know, she was campaigning as the person who knew how to deal with the cost of living crisis. And while she may have come off as rather empathetic to the people, to the to the people who were actually dealing with that crisis, when she tried to pull out the numbers, uh, things like the inflation rate and the and the the rate of GDP growth, she really flubbed them. Uh, so just uh, that a very that was a very concrete deal in something that she had made the heart of her campaign. And even some of the things like uh, banning the Islamic veil, which was an extremely controversial proposal, it when she was questioned on it, it turned out to be completely unenforceable, unworkable. Uh, it, she didn't seem to have thought through the details, even on some of her core policies. Mm -hmm. Angela, thank you so much. Uh, Kate Moody, thank you. We're going to let you go home. You've done a lot of work tonight. <laughs> it was wonderful to have you on the set. Georgia Calvin-Smith, thanks to you as well for coming on. Doug, you're going to stay with us a few minutes more. This is our continuing coverage of uh, France 24's election night. With that win, a re-election for Emmanuel Macron. Stay with us. France 24, your economy explained. Liberté, égalité, actualité. France 24 and RFI in partnership with France 2 and France Inter with Ipsos Supra Stereo. far-right candidate Marine Le Pen, making him the only president in recent history to be re-elected with a majority in Parliament. Reaction is coming into Macron's re-election from overseas, uh, from the United States, the German Chancellor, the Prime Minister, among many international leaders to congratulate the French president. The big focus now is on what's being called the third round of the French election. That's the parliamentary vote scheduled for June that could leave the newly re-elected Macron with a prime minister from another political party. Hi everyone, I'm Jeannie Godula. France's youngest ever president has now become the first to be re-elected in 20 years. Emmanuel Macron is also the first in recent French history to be re-elected with a majority in parliament. Macron brought in 58.8% of the vote, beating the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen, 
who got 41.2% of the vote. So what were the main issues that pushed people to head to or stay away from the polls? We're going to be unpacking all of that tonight. Joining me on the set, France 24's elections commentator, Angela Diffley. Also with us, our international affairs commentator, Doug Herbert, our NAR Europe editor, Catherine Nicholson. And we have France 24's Deep Dico Laurent, who will be giving us a breakdown of estimates from tonight's <coughs> voting in France's presidential election. Well, Emmanuel Macron's victory party tonight was at the foot of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Here's more of what he had to say earlier. I want to thank all of the French people, men and women, who at the first and the second round of these presidential elections placed their trust in me so together we can undertake our project to make France more independent, Europe stronger, and through investments and changes continue to implement change that is relevant for everyone by freeing creativity and innovation in our country and making France a great green nation. Claire Pecolin was at that speech at the Champ de Mars Park in central Paris earlier. She told us more about what the feeling was like there. Emmanuel Macron arrived here at the Eiffel Tower to the tune of Ode to Joy, the European anthem. He then gave a short speech to his supporters. He thanked those who had voted for him and he said he knew that some French people had voted for him not because they like his policies but because they wanted to keep out the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. He said he was also thinking about those who didn't vote at all today because they felt that neither candidate represented them and he said he was also thinking about those who voted for Marine Le Pen and he asked them to give him a chance over the next five years. More immediately, though, of course, he'll be thinking about those parliamentary elections in June. The left is regrouping. The far-right party of Marine Le Pen is hoping to get more seats in Parliament. Back in 2017, Emmanuel Macron's party managed to get a majority in the lower house of Parliament. But it's looking tricky this year. He's certainly got his work cut out. Delano D'Souza was also in the crowd at the victory party there in front of the Eiffel Tower. Here's what he had to say. Emmanuel Macron has secured a second term in office. He has become the fourth president in the history of the Fifth Republic to secure a second mandate. In his uh, remarks tonight, Emmanuel Macron was extremely brief. He thanked all, his, all the people who voted for him, as well as all the people uh, who didn't vote for him. He sort of reached out to everyone and said he's going to be the president for all of France, for not just the, for, uh, the people who voted for him, but also for people who voted for the far right, as well as people who voted for the far left. Now, although Emmanuel Macron has won today's election. He will be setting his sights on the parliamentary vote, which is set to take place in June. We expect it to have uh, the parties on the left sort of band together to keep Emmanuel Macron's powers in check uh, for the, for the, in the future uh, for, the, for the country. So it was a brief uh, party here tonight, but uh, a lot of people did uh, show, come out and uh, express the support that Emmanuel Macron had secured that second term in office. People are relieved that uh, the far right's Marine Le Pen has not uh, managed to clinch the presidency for a third time. Delano D'Souza, Angela Diffley, you've been uh, covering the campaign since the beginning. How do you think France's Muslims are likely to react to Macron's victory? Well, they will certainly be relieved that uh, Marine Le Pen was not elected. Of course, everyone is aware that she planned to ban the wearing of the hijab in public places. It's anyone can wear it uh, in public places. No religious garments of any kind, Jewish, Muslim or any other religion are allowed in schools by staff or teachers and in public sector places, but on the streets, in restaurants, in shops, it's not a problem. I think that uh, they will be relieved, but it is a work in progress, I think, uh, Islam sitting comfortably in uh, wider France. And I think Emmanuel Macron, when he started his presidency, very much felt that if the economy could be sorted out and if unemployment could be sorted out then many of the problems in uh, some of the banlieues where there are a lot of Muslim uh, French citizens might sort themselves out. I think he has changed his mind since and one of the things which made him change his mind was in uh, 2019 the beheading of a school teacher in France. Uh, 
after a freedom of speech lesson. I think after that, he thought this is not just about uh, uh, opportunities. It's about making sure that Republican values are firmly held amongst some of the younger people in these suburbs. The tensions are around women's rights and around freedom of speech on the whole. Also, the Muslim community in France is has difficulty with its institutional representation. The body which is meant to represent Muslims in France is very, very divided, often along the lines of Muslims with a Tunisian heritage or a Moroccan heritage or an Algerian heritage, Turkish heritage, and they, there is a lot of disagreement amongst them, and so they don't necessarily serve well the Muslim community in France. And uh, Macron has pretty much decided to bypass them after they failed to agree on a charter of Republican values. So he's using other avenues with uh, uh, civic leaders. Angela, thank you for that. Emmanuel Macron beating Marine Le Pen in her third run for the presidency. The 53-year-old leader of the far right was hoping to become France's first woman president, but she did lose again to Macron after their first face-to-face -face in 2017. Speaking earlier, Le Pen said her score, though, was still a victory for the national rally and that her focus is on the upcoming parliamentary election in June. The national rally will strive to unite all those people from whatever their background, those who wish to rally together to stand up against Emmanuel Macron, those who wish to have candidates in their local communities, be they in France or in our overseas territories. I call on you to come out in your numbers and vote for them. Vote for the national rally. Florence Villeneuve was covering Marine Le Pen's concession speech and all of her campaign for France 24. Let's listen to what she had to say. The party is wrapping up here at the Bois de Boulogne. Lots of long faces for Marine Le Pen supporters. When the result came in at 8 p.m., there were boos when Emmanuel Macron's face came up on the screen announcing that he had won the second round of the presidential election and therefore Marine Le Pen was not going to be the next president of France. But Marine Le Pen was very defiant in her concession speech. She hailed her result as a great victory. And she said the next battle starts today. It is going to be the uh, parliamentary elections, which are going to be held in June. She likened it to the third round of the presidential election and said that she was the real figure of opposition in France and called on anyone who opposes Emmanuel Macron to vote for the national rally in the parliamentary election. So uh, Marine Le Pen, very defiant in in her concession speech, there's been a lot of uncertainty about her political future because going into this election, her third presidential election, she herself said this would be her final run. But in her space, in her in her speech, she vowed to continue fighting for French people. And so what is that going to mean for her for her future? Does that mean she's going to perhaps run again for president? We'll, we'll know, I guess, soon enough. But what's interesting is a lot of people are saying that Marine Le Pen managed to transform her defeat into a victory and also a victory for her party because uh, she has really taken her party from a fringe party to a mainstream party that's here to stay. Uh, so it's a uh, game over for Marine Le Pen, but uh, the battle continues for Marine Le Pen and the Rassemblement National. Another big story tonight was the abstention rate. More and more French people are staying away from the polls with the projected rate from the second round at over 28 percent. That's up two and a half points from the second round in 2017. And that rate is the highest seen in France in a second round since 1969. Well, the election seems to have really marked the end of France's traditional parties as well, the Republicans on the right and the Socialists on the left. Both of their candidates got historically low scores in the first round, not even hitting the 5% mark to get part of their campaign costs reimbursed. Tipti Laurent has a closer look now at the collapse of France's main parties. Well, this presidential election has really changed uh, France's political landscape. Let's have a look now. Gone are these uh, mainstream right-wing and left-wing parties. These are the three major parties in France. You have Emmanuel Macron's centrist party, you have Marine Le Pen's far-right party, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon's 
far left party. Now, what's clear is that Emmanuel Macron, with his 58% uh, or so uh, margin now, will have his work really cut out for him. And he'll be finding it very hard to govern efficiently without a parliamentary majority. And for the moment, all of France's major uh, political parties are facing an uphill battle to get that parliamentary majority in those elections in June. And it's where this man comes in, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's really, uh, he's already focusing his attention on those parliamentary elections. And it's really interesting when you look at the kind of people who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon in the first round. Let's have a look. It's What's interesting is they're all very varied when it comes to age. Sure, he's really popular with the younger crowd, but when it comes to uh, the 50 to 70 age range, he's also quite popular. When it comes to education, he's got 43% uh, of ca uh, college graduates who back Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And when it comes to income, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the median monthly income in France is about 2,000 euros, well, he's got a lot of support with low and mid-income earners, but he's also got almost 40% support with mid to high income earners. So uh, he's got such a varied support base and uh, this is where he's really hoping uh, to make a difference. And what's really interesting is looking ahead to those parliamentary elections, he's already started rallying his supporters saying, help get me voted in as prime minister. Because indeed, if Emmanuel Macron doesn't get a parliamentary majority in those elections in June, he could face the situation where he'll be having to, he'll be forced to share power with the prime minister of another party. And if you look at why Jean-Luc Mélenchon's supporters uh, uh, voted for Emmanuel Macron in the second round, overwhelmingly 91% say they did it to block Marine Le Pen. So this wasn't a vote of con uh, a vote of conviction. And what's interesting is looking ahead to those uh, parliamentary elections, according to our polling partners Ipsos, 56% uh, of people interviewed by Ipsos say they want Emmanuel Macron's party to lose their majority in those parliamentary elections and be forced into this power sharing agreement. And of that figure, 84% of them were indeed Jean-Luc Mélenchon's voters, Jeannie. Deep D, thanks so much for that. Well, Marine Le Pen cast her vote earlier today in the northern French town of Enam Beaumont, the country's former industrial heartland that's now one of many French towns just struggling to survive. Our Ellen Gainsford is in Enam Beaumont, where she was talking to people all day and told us more about their main concerns in the campaign. Well, it's not the result that many people were hoping for here in Enam Beaumont, which is the electoral heartland for the National Rally Party. There were actually cries of anger when we heard the figures read out this evening. And we've been speaking to supporters of Marine Le Pen here, and uh, one nurse told me that she was worried that she would now have to work more to earn less. She said that uh, if she had to retire later, it would be hard for her, as her job is really quite physical. And uh, this is, of course, referencing Emmanuel Macron's plan to reform the pension system. Well, another woman told me that she'd voted for Marine Marine Le Pen, as a, she seemed closer to the people. Well, um, there was a lot of applause here when Marine Le Pen gave her concession speech, and notably at the point when she said that she represented a forgotten France. Well, she may not be heading to the uh, presidential palace, but uh, in one way, it's, this has actually been a win for Marine Le Pen. Uh, during this campaign, she's had to work hard to detoxify her image and to normalize her party by uh, pivoting to cost of living issues. And uh, from the snapshot of people that we've been talking to, it seems that they're now voting a national rally, not just as a protest vote for an anti-establishment party, but because they find the policies themselves appealing. And that in itself is a win for Marine Le Pen, who well, that'll be regrouping as she looks for to the legislative elections. Now, in an unprecedented step this time around, the German chancellor joined up with the Spanish and Portuguese prime ministers to actually ask French voters not to back Marine Le Pen before the vote. Such a, a sign of the close feeling that many European leaders have for Emmanuel Macron. There have been lots of reactions coming from around Europe, including from the Ukrainian president, Catherine. Yeah, that's right. So a little bit earlier on, I went through with you some of the national leaders of Europe. Uh, so, for example, the likes of the Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi, has been congratulating Emmanuel Macron. So, as you said, Olaf Scholz, the leader of uh, Germany, we've had the leaders of Portugal, Romania, many others congratulating uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, now, a non-European Union nation leader, but one who would like his country to be in the European Union, Volodymyr Zelensky. He tweeted this out uh, just a short time ago, about 15 
15 minutes ago, in Ukrainian first and then also in French, talking about Emmanuel Macron as being a true friend of Ukraine. He said, I appreciate his support and I'm convinced that we will advance together towards new common victories. Toward, and then he finishes by saying, towards a strong, united Europe. So this is Volodymyr Zelensky, I think very sincerely, thanking Emmanuel Macron for the support that the French president has shown to his country since the Russian invasion, but also cementing that idea in the con public conscience that Ukraine is a European nation, a, a European Union nation, in fact, in the making. Uh, you know, he's uh, called repeatedly for Ukraine to get some kind of accelerated uh, accession uh, sort of procedure going, the, the path to membership. Uh, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen did... Uh, uh, acknowledge that when she visited Kiev, uh, Ukraine has filled in the first part of this questionnaire, which is sort of step one along the road to this whole process. So Volodymyr Zelensky there, as I said, with his congratulations to Emmanuel Macron, this most pro-European of French presidents, of course, uh, also sort of making a line in the sand there and, and reminding Europe of his own European ambitions. We were saying many world leaders, not just in Europe, are breathing a sigh of relief tonight. Marine Le Pen lost this election, but she did get seven to eight percentage points more than she did five years ago. So, Doug, I guess my question for you is, is where does that leave populism these days? Uh, down, but not out. I think that's, that's the easiest way of summing it up. Look, in, in the sense that, you know, populism has been the flavor of the day for, for, for years right now across Europe. And you've had leaders, you know, not just in the U.S., but in all quarters of, of Europe. And yet when you look, you know, it's, it's become almost cliched to say, you know, in, in the battle between democracy and autocracy, it looks like democracy is right now sort of losing steam. And that has been very true in many respects, where, where in many places in the world where you look. But look, when you actually z you know, hone in on the European map right now. During this campaign, we had three prominent European leaders writing an opinion piece for the Le Mans newspaper, basically urging voters to elect Macron. And all of these, what they shared in common, it was uh, Germany's uh, you know, prime minister, and you also had uh, Portugal, Spain. All of them are left-leaning uh, mm. leaders of their country, left-leaning. You know, these were leftist governments. And, you know, Ger Europe's biggest economy, Germany, <coughs> you forget it to say it <laughs> enough. The Social Democrats, they're leftist. Um, Tonight, a story that we hadn't really even been talking about much, and, you know, we have, I guess, rightly so, been preoccupied with France. But, you know, Slovenia, an EU member, also a NATO member, population 2, 2 million. It's a tiny country, sure. But, you know, there, there was a presidential election, uh, pr sorry, parliamentary elections uh, there today. And it had been billed as going to be a very tight contest between the right-wing, populist, uh, ultra-nationalist, anti-European uh, Prime Minister Yanis Janša. Uh, against uh, an opposition, a liberal sort of opposition candidate who's a staunch advocate of a green transition, very pro-European, tight race they were expecting. You know what the final score was? It was a drubbing for the outgoing prime minister. Uh, his party uh, got 22 percent of the vote uh, versus the, the, the green candidate who no one really expected to, to do this well, got 35 percent. Obviously, it's a parliamentary election. There's still perhaps going to be some, you know, uh, horse trading here going on. But it, ju it, it shows that you can't necessarily count, you know, more leftist leaning, uh, people who champion Europe, who champion green values, they're not, they're not necessarily out right now. That said, Marine Le Pen is waiting in the wings. She's made it clear she's going to remain engaged in French politics. She got 41.8 percent of the vote tonight. That is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, she is still a force on the French political landscape. She's going to be here for years to come. She'll only be 58 when the next elections roll around. Doug, thanks for that. All right. Uh, staying in France, let's go back to Dipti Galland. Dipti's been looking at the numbers, especially at how French people feel about their new president. Dipti, what can you tell us? Well, you know, Ginny, the French do uh, have a reputation for being perennially miserable or pessimistic. And certainly these uh, figures sort of reflect their disillusionment with this French election. Have a look at this. If Emmanuel Macron is, this is according to our uh, polling partners, Ipsos, they asked the question to 4,000 French voters, if Emmanuel Macron is re-elected, how do you feel? And look at their, look at their feelings here. 20% say they were relieved, okay, but 20% say they felt pretty, they couldn't really care less. Another 
twenty uh, percent said they were disappointed by the result, while eighteen percent eighteen percent said they were actually really angry about a Macron re-election. Just four percent said they were actually happy about it. So you really get an idea that sure, the French people uh, helped re-elect Macron, but for many, or at least some, it was rather a begrudging vote, Genie. Tipti, thank you for that. Well, a high abstention rate here in France. This election has really highlighted a, a growing fatigue for many people of France's political system. Angela, how might France overhaul its democracy? Yes, there is a lot of talk that France does need to overhaul its democracy. There are two ideas, really. One is uh, proportional representation. It's interesting to note that in 2017, Marine Le Pen scored much the same vote as the uh, mainstream right, but ended up with only seven MPs compared to their 80 MPs. So it, the, there is a real need in France to address the fact that the political landscape is not always properly represented in Parliament. And successive presidents had said they'll do something about it. I think it might be coming to a head now, and Macron probably will. That's something which we can expect. The other thing is that people are talking a lot more about uh, why France, maybe France should use more referendums. Now, Macron's not very keen on that. Uh, we heard Kate mention he has said perhaps he would do it on retirement because it's such a controversial reform that he wants to introduce. He said maybe, maybe not 65, maybe I, I put it to a referendum, maybe 64. Marine Le Pen was very uh, keen on referendums and there is a place for them they have been used in France and there is an idea that that sort of one issue democracy might encourage more people to vote the problem of course with referendums is that not all questions can be answered in a binary yes no way and also sometimes and it's happened already in France in the past electorates don't answer the question they're given. They answer a question which says, I don't like the current president. Mm. And also, uh, Macron did hold a referendum in a local area about an airport and then decided not to heed it because it was too problematic. So presidents don't always heed them. But there are a couple of ideas because there is a bit of a problem in France with democracy. It needs upgrading. Mm. Well, it started with 12 candidates, it got down to two, and then to one winner. But after one of the most divided campaigns in French history, Emmanuel Macron was re-elected president of France. Our Shirley Sitbon takes a look back now at the highs and lows of the campaign. One started her campaign very early on, the other just before the deadline. After her massive loss in 2017, Marine Le Pen tried to talk to as many people as possible. Il y a des batailles qu'on n'a pas le droit de perdre. Nous allons la gagner. Six months later, Emmanuel Macron launched his own campaign with a mini series. Donc, euh, appelez-moi Monsieur le Candidat, il n'y a aucun problème. The war in Ukraine was one reason Macron jumped into the race so late. As president of the Council of the EU, he had a key role to play. His rating soared. For the far-right candidate, it was all the opposite. Her actions were scrutinized, since she had contracted a loan in a Russian bank and met with Vladimir Putin in 2017. Le Pen's support ratings remained unaffected, because what voters really care about is the purchasing power. In recent years, it has eroded for people with low income. Je ferai un panier de produits de première nécessité sur lequel j'abaisserai la TVA à 0%. More than measures on fuel and soap, Macron drew a line in the sand to show he and Le Pen are fundamentally different. C'est le combat du progrès contre le repli. Le combat du patriotisme et de l'Europe contre les nationalistes. An attack on Le Pen and also Eric Zemmour, the campaign surprise contender who poached some of Le Pen's key allies, even her niece. But Le Pen also benefited from Zemmour, because his explosive comments made her seem almost mainstream. That was over after the first round of voting, when only Macron and Le Pen remained in the race. Most candidates urged people to vote for Macron, to block Le Pen. 
but some had a more nuanced approach, still opposed to the far right. Il ne faut pas donner une seule voix, Madame Le Pen. But stopping short of backing Macron. When accused of presenting a threat, Le Pen trying to deflect the attack on her rival. Le danger Emmanuel Macron, lui, il est bien réel. La disparition des libertés. Une France fracturée euh, comme, euh, comme jamais. Euh, à mépris et un dédain à l'égard euh, des Français. But no matter her attempts to appear moderate, at least one proposal placed her very far to the right. The ban of the veil in public places. Macron tried to tap into Mélenchon's young electorate by injecting green pledges into his program. La politique que je mènerai dans les cinq ans à venir sera donc écologique ou ne sera pas. This is how the battle over climate concerned voters ended in the debate. Vous êtes climato-sceptique. En aucun cas, euh, mais vous, vous êtes un peu climato-hypocrite. Throughout the campaign, the French tried to alert the candidates on their struggles, hoping to be heard at last. Yep, that win for Emmanuel Macron, who comes away with 58% of the vote, beating his far-right challenger, Marine Le Pen, who brought in 41.2% of the vote. You are watching France 24. This is our continuing coverage of the French presidential election. Thanks so much to Catherine, Doug, Angela, and Dipti. Thanks to you for watching. Stay with us.